Happy Dance. Hello everybody and welcome to the surreal game Iceberg. In this video, I play and review over 400 goddamn games. This iceberg contains the most wackiest, bizarre, disturbing, and surreal games ever created. Making this series made me lose quite a lot of brain cells. As most of you might know, this is a series that I finished a few months ago, and to make it easier for you, I made this video taking out the intros, outros, and other boring stuff. Also, uh, just a warning, I started the series about a year ago, so in the first few tiers, my uh, mic quality is quite diarrhea. Also, the first tier has zero gameplay footage. I guess I just uh, sucked at making videos back then. It's all good if you don't want to suffer through that, I understand. So I've left some timestamps in the description for each tier. With that being said, I really hope you enjoy me playing and yapping about a ton of surreal games. First up we have one that most of you probably already know, You May Nikki. Damn, it, it says a lot about the iceberg when the first entry is You May Nikki. If you don't already know, You May Nikki is a Japanese RPG maker game. Uh, yeah, we'll be seeing a lot of these on the list from 2004. What makes this game surreal is that it doesn't really have what you would call traditional gameplay. There's no plot, no dialogue, no combat, and no objectives. In the game, you play as Madosuki, which means windowed in Japanese. Throughout the game, you experience what appears to be her dreams. The game gets pretty dark at times, with references to anxiety, violence, and identity. The cryptic nature of these dreams has led the fandom of Yume Nikki to study every aspect of the game and develop their own theories. These theories get very deep and are honestly quite interesting. If you have the time, I recommend playing it, and if not, go look at some theories for the game. It's, uh, it's quite the rabbit hole. Next up, we have WarioWare. WarioWare is a banger of a series and is definitely a favorite of mine. While not too obscure or anything, I can definitely see how WarioWare can be seen as surreal. WarioWare, sometimes known as WarioWare Inc., is a series of video games starring Wario and his friends. Unlike the Wario Land games, which are platformers like the main Mario series, WarioWare is a series of minigame compilations. WarioWare is unique, however, in that the minigames are very short, most only lasting several seconds. These micro games make up the basis of the series and are strung together in quick succession with different control schemes, encouraging the frantic action by the player. WarioWare has also been known for incorporating a gimmick in each game, mostly taking advantage of the latest Nintendo hardware. I've only played two WarioWare games, being the one for the Game Boy Advance and the most recent one for the Switch, and I gotta say, they're pretty solid games. Omori. Omori is a famous indie game by the studio Omocat. Promise not to crucify me for this, but I haven't actually played Omori before. From what I've seen online though, it seems to have quite a large fan base. From what I can tell, Omori is a JRPG inspired by the previously mentioned Yume Nikki and Earthbound. As you'll see on this iceberg, quite a lot of games listed are inspired by Earthbound, which I'll be talking about later in this tier. In Omori, the player controls a hikikomori named Sunny and his dream world alter ego, Omori. They explore both the real world and a surreal dream world to overcome their fears and secrets. How they interact depends on the choice is made by the player, resulting in one of several endings. The game's turn-based battle system includes unconventional status effects based on the character's emotions, prominently featuring concepts such as anxiety, depression, and trauma. The game has psychological horror elements. Like Yume Nikki, the thing that makes Omori surreal is the exploration of the player's dreams, Harvester. This game is one of the first games I've ever played. Now that I think about it, the fact that I played this when I was like 10 years old explains quite a lot. Harvestar is a point and click adventure game from 1996 where you play as Steve Mason, an 18 year old boy that wakes up in the town of Harvest in 1953 with no memory of who he is. This game is whack, like seriously whack. Definitely one of the most disturbing games I've played. For example, there's a, there's a certain scene involving capital punishment in an elementary school and um, there's one scene with with that baby. While disturbing, the game has really good writing, with each character you meet spitting goofy comments at you. The whole idea of the game, or at least what I take from it, is that it's meant to be sort of a self-parody 
making fun of gratuitous violence in video games during the 90s. And oh boy, does this game have gratuitous violence. What makes this game surreal is, well, everything. Not a single character you meet in this game is sane, and the end completely screws with your mind, which I'm not gonna spoil. Just play the game for yourself, it's... It's a blast. Desert Bus. Desert Bus, or as I like to call it, the best game ever created, is a game where you drive a bus on a road in a desert. That's... That's it. Despite how boring the gameplay is, the backstory of the game is pretty interesting. So, you know Penn and Teller, right? If you were born after the 2000s, maybe not. Penn and Teller are, I guess what you would call a magician slash comedy duo. They're mostly known for the TV show, in which magicians would perform tricks on stage and attempt to fool Penn and Teller. Anyway, in the mid 90s, they planned to release a game for the Sega CD called Penn and Teller's Smoke and Mirrors. The game revolved around these mini games that were designed for people to fool their friends. While well, the game was unreleased, a copy of it was passed around the internet back in 2005 and gained quite a lot of attention, mostly because of the game Desert Bus. Desert Bus is definitely the most notorious mini-game in the collection. The objective of the game is to drive a bus from Tucson, Arizona all the way to Las Vegas, Nevada in real time at a maximum speed of 45 miles. The feat requires 8 hours of continuous gameplay in real time to complete. Um, I tried playing this game, but after 20 minutes of playing I could feel my brain cells dying, so I, I, I decided to put it down. While this game has a unique gimmick, it's just that. A gimmick. Earthbound. Um, it's Earthbound. You probably know what it is. Earthbound is one of, if not, the most known surreal game. Despite its age, Earthbound has inspired the creation of countless games such as Undertale and even the previously mentioned Omori. What makes Earthbound so revolutionary is that it was one of the first RPGs to not take itself so seriously, and the fact that it was the first Japanese RPG that was made with American kids in mind. Earthbound can be best described as quirky, I guess. It plays like a classic JRPG for the SNES, but with a unique combat system. What makes this game so surreal is the plot. Here's a here's a synopsis. Earthbound chronicles the adventure of Ness, a 13-year-old boy who journeys around the world using his PK or Psy to collect eight melodies in order to save the future from an alien of pure evil, intending to sentence all of reality to the horror of eternal darkness. Yeah, definitely definitely a bit surreal. Besides the main plot, what makes the game so good is its side plots. I could talk about the whack stuff that happens in this game for hours, but I'll let my friend, the angry video game nerd, summon up for you. You never know what this game's gonna throw at you. All of a sudden, you're fighting a bunch of police officers. Police officers are trying to beat up a child. Then you're fighting a bunch of clansmen who worship the color blue. Holy shit, I'm so overwhelmed trying to explain everything that happens here. The question is, what doesn't happen? Undertale. Speaking of Earthbound, next up we have Undertale. You most likely already know what Undertale is. It's one of the most popular games ever made. Undertale is created by the mad lad himself, Toby Fox, in 2015. The player meets various monsters during the journey back to the surface, although some monsters might engage the player in a fight. The combat system involves the player navigating through mini bullet hell attacks by the opponent. They can opt to pacify or subdue monsters in order to spare them instead of killing them. The choices affect the game game, with dialogue, characters, and the story changing based on the outcomes. Just like Earthbound, the thing that makes Undertale so surreal is the plot along with all the wacky characters you meet throughout the game. The Silent Hill series. The Silent Hill games are classic horror games that still influence the horror genre to this day. As a side note, Silent Hill 2 is one of my favorite games of all time, as you can probably tell by the music choice in some of my videos. The first three Silent Hill games are some of the best horror experiences you can get. I definitely see why they make this iceberg, as the setting of the games, along with the music, really gives off a surreal and eerie kind of vibe. It makes the games feel like a fever dream. I'm not gonna go into the Silent Hill wall in this video, because I could talk about it for hours, but I'll give a brief explanation in case you haven't played them. The first Silent Hill games follows Harry Mason as he searches for his missing adopted daughter in the town of Silent Hill. The second game, my favorite one, you guide the character James Sunderland around the town as it goes into more depth of the town's backstory. In Silent Hill 3, you play as Heather as she returns to the town to do some stuff. I, I don't know, I haven't played the third one. I'm not gonna mention the other games as they're not 
that good in my opinion. But I will mention PT. PT, standing for Playable Teaser, was a demo for the next installment in the franchise Silent Hills. However, shortly after, Konami announced that they were cancelling Silent Hills and took the demo off the PlayStation Store. The only way you can play it now is to buy a console with it already downloaded. And unless you're Bill Gates, um, you can forget ever playing it. Xenoclash. Xenoclash is the only game on this first tier that I've never heard of. Xenoclash is a first person fighting video game with elements of a first person shooter that was released on Steam in 2009. Players assume the role of Gat and progress through the world of Xenozoic visiting various locations in a linear sequence. Looking at the gameplay of this game, I can definitely see why it's described as surreal. I mean, just look at this. While researching the game, I I saw that apparently it was in development since the 1990s, taking about 20 years to make. That's... that's pretty impressive. The game's combat system is quite unique, as it plays like a normal fighting game, kinda like Tekken or Street Fighter, except for the fact that you play in first person. I'm not ragging on the game or anything, but watching gameplay kinda reminds me of those god-awful ads that you see for mobile games. Jazz Punk. Oof. I completely forgot this game existed. While I've never played Jazz Punk, I vividly remember watching Jacksepticeye play it back when I was a kid. Jazz Punk is a single player first person adventure game, focusing on exploration and comedy over puzzle solving. Each mission has one central objective, but the player is free to explore the game world at their own pace, which is populated with a large number of interactive NPCs each with their own action or gag. Mini games including Mini Golf, a Frogger clone, and a version of Duck Hunt in which the player pelts cardboard dust with slices of bread from a toaster. What makes this game surreal is, well, the setting and the way the NPCs interact with you. Something about it all just feels kinda off. LSD Dream Emulator. LSD Dream Emulator is the definition of surreal, as you can probably tell by its name. Before I talk about the game itself, I gotta talk about the maker. Osamu Sato. Sato started out his career in photography, but later branched out to computer arts in the 90s. After experimenting with CD-ROM technology, he wanted to use the PlayStation as a means of creating music and art, even though he rejected the idea of video games. From there, he got the idea of creating an imaginary world with the same irrationally and easily forgettable nature as dreams. He did not give the game any objectives because, according to him, they are not essential in video games because even natural human existence cannot be reduced to simple objectives. For inspiration, Sato pulled ideas from a dream diary written by Hiroko Nishikawa, a game designer at Asimic Ace Entertainment who had been writing in the diary for about a decade. This game is great, and I highly recommend it as an experience everyone should have if you're interested in this stuff. While finding a copy of the game is almost impossible due to its slow distribution, you can always do the unthinkable and emulate it if you really want to. Katamari Damacy. Katamari Damacy has got to be my all-time favorite game franchise. Whenever I have a bad day, just Loading up Katamari Damacy reroll on Steam instantly cures my depression. Kinda strange how most of my favorite games are on this iceberg. Yikes. What makes the Katamari Damacy games so surreal is its typical Japanese goofy humor that can be seen in other games I've mentioned, such as WarioWare. The game's plot details a prince on the mission to rebuild the stars, constellations, and moon, which were inadvertently destroyed by his father, the king of all cosmos. This is achieved by rolling a magical, highly adhesive ball called a katamari around various locations, collecting increasingly larger objects, ranging from thumbtacks to human beings to mountains, until the ball has grown large enough to become a star. Katamari Damacy's story, settings, and characters are highly stylish and surreal, often both celebrating and satirizing facets of Japan culture. Popular RPG horror games. This entry is quite broad and refers to what I think is the largely oversaturated genre of RPG maker horror games. Yume Nikki, which was the first entry on the iceberg, is one of these. These games are genuinely more of the same, but here are some notable ones. Mad Father, Ao Oni, Crooked Man, 
Purgatory, and Dice Psycho, just to name a few. Puppet Combo Games. This entry refers to the games created by the indie studio, Puppet Combo Games. I'm gonna link their itch.io site in the description as I've played most of their games and I gotta say, they're freaking amazing. They make PS2 style horror games that are inspired by 80s era, VHS horror movies, and as you can see from the aesthetic I use in my videos, these games are right up my alley. The word surreal doesn't even begin to describe these games and I highly recommend you check them out. Definitely Definitely start by playing The Glass Staircase, as it's a homage to survival horror games like the previously mentioned Silent Hill, Post Void. The best word I can use to describe this game is fun. Post Void is described as a hypnotic scramble of early first person shooter design that values speed above all else. The game has a messy yet pleasing art style that makes the visuals feel very surreal and dreamlike. It plays like a roguelike dungeon crawler combined with a fast paced FPS. It kinda plays like Doom but on heroin. American McKee's Alice. <sighs> This game gave me nightmares as a kid. The game is a spin of Alice in Wonderland by this guy named American McGee. This game is quite disturbing to say the least. Its setting and tone really adds to the surrealness of the game. As if Alice in Wonderland wasn't surreal enough, you just had to make it worse. The game was quite successful with a sequel coming out for it 11 years later in 2011. Hong Kong 97. Oh boy, Hong Kong 97 or as I like to call it, the Mona Lisa of video games, is an unlicensed shoot 'em up developed by Happy Soft. It was designed by the Japanese game journalist, Perlun Kurosawa, who claims the game is a satire of the video game industry, and was apparently made in two days. Let me just read the plot for the game off Wikipedia, and you'll see why this game is on the iceberg. The game takes place in China, 1997, during the handover of Hong Kong from the United Kingdom. Facing an increased crime rate due to the immigration from mainland China, the Hong Kong government hires Chin, a super powerful relative of Bruce Lee, to kill the entire population of China. At the same time, the deceased Tong Xiaoping is resurrected by a secret project conducted by the Chinese government as an ultimate weapon. After defeating Tong Xiaoping, the game is repeated indefinitely until Chen dies. The game sold very well, with a whopping 30 copies being sold. Since the video by AVGN reviewing the game gained quite a cult following due to its lackluster quality. Deadly Premonition Deadly Premonition is an open world survival horror game released in 2010. Set in the fictional rural American town of Greenvale, Washington, the story follows FBI Special Agent Francis York Morgan as he investigates the murder of an 18 year old woman which bears similarities to a series of murders across the country. The game was released with mixed reviews and was compared to a subpar Silent Hill. Personally, I don't mind it, but replaying it, it hasn't really aged too well. What makes the game surreal is its combat sequences that take place in the other world. You periodically visit two supernatural rooms, the white room and the red room. The white room represents a normal subconscious, while the red room represents one influenced by evil. It's honestly not too bad and is definitely underrated and forgotten about when compared to similar survival horror games. Pony Island. Pony Island is another banger of a game from 2016 that you may have heard of from the hundreds of let's plays that were made of the game. The game is not about ponies. The gimmick of Pony Island is that it lures the player in by appearing to be a retro arcade game about ponies, but as you progress, the game turns dark and it turns out you're trapped in an arcade machine created by the devil himself. This bait and switch gimmick of the game made for some perfect YouTube content back in the day and has since been forgotten about. Stanley Parable If you don't know what the Stanley Parable is, which I don't know how you couldn't, the Stanley Parable is a Half-Life 2 mod that was later released onto Steam as a standalone game in 2013. In the game, the player guides a silent protagonist named Stanley alongside narration by British actor Kevin Brighting. As the story progresses, the player is confronted with diverging pathways. The player may contradict the narrator's directions, which if disobeyed, will then be incorporated into the story. Depending on the choices made, the player will encounter different endings before the game resets to the beginning. The setting of the game is what gives it the surreal feeling, with it taking place in an empty office building. The tone of the game can be compared to those liminal space photos that you always see. 
The Binding of Isaac. The Binding of Isaac is probably the best roguelike I've ever played. At first, I was like, why is this on the iceberg? But I guess I can see how it can be seen as surreal to some people. Especially the biblical elements might come off as bizarre to some people, but personally, I don't really see it as surreal. The Binding of Isaac is a roguelike video game designed by the independent developers Edmund McMillan and Florian Himzel, released in 2011. The game's title and plot are inspired by the biblical story of the Binding of Isaac. In the game, Isaac's mother receives a message from God demanding the life of her son as proof of her faith, and Isaac, fearing for his life, flees into a monster-filled basement of their home, where he must fight to survive. Players control Isaac, or one of seven other unlockable characters, through a procedurally generated dungeon in a roguelike manner, defeating monsters in real-time combat while collecting items and power-ups to defeat bosses, and eventually Isaac's mother. The game has since been remade with Isaac Rebirth in 2014, and will always remain as one of, if not the, best indie game. Pikmin. What's this doing on here? Pikmin is a real-time strategy and puzzle game series created by Shigeru Miyamoto and published by Nintendo. The game focuses on directing a horde of plant-like creatures called Pikmin, in in order to collect items by destroying obstacles, avoiding hazards, and fighting fauna that are hazardous to both the player and Pikmin. The Pikmin series features five main entries, as well as a spin-off. I guess I can see how Pikmin can be seen as surreal, but uh, I don't know. I guess I'm just used to the weirdness of most Nintendo games. Speaking of weird Nintendo games, Tomodachi Life. Damn, I have some good memories with this game. Tomodachi Life is a social simulation video game created by Nintendo for the 3DS in 2013. The game takes advantage of the Mii character creator that was available on the 3DS, allowing the player to import their own characters and take care of them in a way not too dissimilar from The Sims. What makes this game surreal is the Miis. Uh, just look at these things. The most notable thing for me in Tomodachi Life is the ability to change your muse voice. Just, just listen to these guys. Nobby Nobby Boy. Nobby Nobby Boy is a video game for the PlayStation 3 and iOS, developed by Kaita Takahashi and published by Namco Bandai. In the game, the player controls the character Nobby Boy, who can stretch his body. One of the meanings of Nobby is stretch in Japanese. Nobby Nobby also means carefree in Japanese, so the game's title is a play in words with both of the meanings. The visuals of the game are very similar to Katamari Damacy, the game I was talking about before. Which, I mean, it was made by the same studio, so that makes sense. While, in my opinion, not as good as Katamari, it's still a decent game. The game is, uh, definitely surreal, to say the least. Deltarune. Deltarune is the second game released by Toby Fox, and is quite similar to Undertale, which I mentioned before. The game is also inspired by games like Earthbound, and has the same surreal aspects as Undertale. While it's not technically a sequel to Undertale, they're kind of one in the same, being really similar, and I mean, they both have stands. Deltarune is honestly a pretty good game, with two out of the five chapters being released. The game, while not that surreal, definitely has its bizarre moments. Golden Lion. While I haven't played Golden Lion, I've seen gameplay of it, and I gotta say, this game is quite disturbing. I'm not sure, but something about the meat and the gratuitous amount of grizzliness just sends chills down my spine. Golden Lion is described as a procedural dark comedy horror game with roguelike elements and an eerie atmosphere. Looking at screen caps of the game, you can see why it's described as surreal. While disturbing, I kinda like the cell shaded art style. It's pretty cool looking. The Lisa series. Ah oh boy, this, this makes me tear up just thinking about it. The Lisa series is quite the depressing set of games. While I haven't played the first game, Lisa the First. I have played the second game, Lisa the Painful. I know this isn't very Giga Chad Sigma male of me, but it's the only game that has actually made me cry. The first game, Lisa the First, is somewhat similar to Yume Nikki, 
where you explore the mind of Lisa Armstrong as she tries to cope with the abuse of her father, Marty. Because of the game's subject matter, the game is a bit depressing, as you might imagine. Its sequel, Weeks to the Painful, follows Lisa's brother, Brad, in a post-apocalyptic world called Olaf. Brad ends up adopting a daughter and raises it with his buddies until one day she is kidnapped. This game is less like the first and is more RPG-like, with a combat system not too different from Earthbound. Despite the depressing ending, the combat is really solid and the comedic writing is near perfect, and it's all wrapped together with a perfect atmospheric soundtrack. I won't spoil the ending here, but if you want to know more about it, let me know because I would love to make a video analysing it. Facade. Facade is yet another classic game that I remember seeing Let's Players play back in the day. Facade is an artificial intelligence based interactive story from 2005. In Facade, you are invited over for cocktails at your friend's apartment along with your friend, his wife is also there, and their relationship is less than stellar. What makes this game so well known is the fact that you can say anything you want to the couple with the use of your keyboard. Think of AI Dungeon, except it's not text based and you can actually experience the result of what you say. As you can see from the gameplay, this game is uh, quite surreal with a slightly off cell shaded art style. The thing about Facade that creeps me out is the way that the couple just constantly stares at you. It's very uncanny. Superliminal. This game is a is a mind trip, dude. Superliminal is a surreal puzzle game made by Pillow Castle Games in 2019. The game, played from a first person perspective, incorporates gameplay elements around optical illusions and false perspective. Notably, certain objects when picked up can be moved towards or away from the player or when placed back down, scale to size as the player had viewed them, enabling the player to solve puzzles to complete the game. Playing this game just makes you feel like you're either lucid dreaming or tripping balls. Franbo. Damn, I, I find this game more disturbing than I do surreal. Franbo is a creepy adventure game that tells the story of Fran, a young girl struggling with a mental disorder and an unfair destiny. Set in 1944, the game tells the story of Fran, a 10 year old girl struggling with mental illness after witnessing the murder of her parents. She is then found alone in the woods and admitted to Oswald Asylum, separating Fran from her black cat and only friend, Mr. Midnight. Again, while I haven't played Franbo, it's one of those horror games that Let's Players used to play back in the day, which is where it got most of its popularity. Antichamber. The last surreal game in tier 1 we've got is Antichamber. Antichamber is an Australian a first person puzzle platform game from 2013. In Antichamber, you wander from level to level, making your way through a dreamlike Euclidean space. The game often takes advantage of those impossible objects that you see and your brain just can't make sense of. The game has a real trippy dreamlike soundtrack that honestly kind of slaps. Essentially, the game's a mind trip from start to finish. Very interesting RPG Maker game from 2003. To be honest, um, while I played this game, I kind of found it hard to understand what was going on. You play as a kid named Philip, who sort of looks like a crying nutsack. As you go on an adventure to find the legendary city of forms with your best pal, Leg Horse. The game, while it's more funny than anything, is quite disturbing at times, with a lot of the things in the game being centered around blood. Like, there's just blood everywhere. The combat is your standard RPG maker stuff, but I do have to say that the game's soundtrack is pretty solid. The wacky shenanigans of this game are quite surreal, I guess you could say. Juice Galaxy. Oh boy, where do I even begin to talk about this game? After playing this game for a few hours, I've come to the conclusion that this is so far the best game on the iceberg. I doubt anything else will be able to top it, but we'll see, I guess. In Juice Galaxy, you play as a guy made of juice in a galaxy made of juice in which you roam around said galaxy and defeat weird blob enemies made of juice to gain juice particles and level up your juice abilities. If I say juice one more time, I will have a brain aneurysm. This game is 
really, really, really fun. And I could I could just fly around the Juice Galaxy hitting guys with a baseball bat for days straight. The ambient soundtrack combined with its surreal and desolate setting is what lands it this far down on the iceberg. I really recommend you play it. It's completely free on itch.io and is definitely worth your time. Cruelty Squad. If someone was to ask me, what do you mean by a surreal game? I would tell them to play Cruelty Squad. Calling this game surreal is an understatement. As you can see by the gameplay, this game is quite the fever dream. Just looking at Cruelty Squad can make you feel sick, but it passes most essential immersive sim tests with bright, nauseating colours. Cruelty Squad is what you would get if you remade Deus Ex, but you were overdosing on magic mushrooms during the process. In Cruelty Squad, you play as a depressed assassin for hire in the bad future, killing on behalf of the Cruelty Squad, a depraved subsidiary company tasked with performing wet works for its host conglomerate. The structure of the game is pretty similar to Hitman. You pick some guns and some tools, then explore a massive level, avoiding or killing guards, finding efficient routes and vantages for a clean, quick kill. Don't start a riot in the comments, please, but I'm, I'm not too fond of this game, to be honest. There's plenty of games that are very similar to Cruelty Squad, with the same surreal art style, but Cruelty Squad just overdoes it to the point where the gameplay is sacrificed to make the game more aesthetic. Like, the, the texturing in some of the levels is just messy, and I know that's what the game is trying to be, but that doesn't change the fact that a lot of areas in the game are just painful to look at. Megami Tensei 1987 Shin Megami Tensei is a 1987 game developed by Atlas for the Famicom. The story sees Japanese high school students Akami Nakajima, Yumiko Shirasagi combat the forces of Lucifer, unleashed by a demon summoning program created by Nakajima. The gameplay features first-person dungeon crawling and turn-based battles or negotiation with demons and a journey through a hostile labyrinth as Nakajima featuring real-time combat. This game has quite the amazing soundtrack and the combat was very unique at the time, allowing you to capture enemies and use them in battle. It basically did what Pokemon did, but 10 years earlier. What makes this game surreal is the dreamlike nature of the levels that you explore, along with the bizarre biblical elements that really feel quite trippy at times. The game has quite a lot of sequels, with Shin Megami Tensei 5 coming out last year. The Neverhood. The Neverhood is a 1996 point and click adventure game developed by The Neverhood Inc. and published by DreamWorks Interactive for Microsoft Windows. The game follows the adventure of a claymation character named Clayman as he discovers his origins and his purpose in a world made entirely of clay. When the game was originally released, it was unique in that all of its animation was done entirely by a claymation, including all of the sets, rather than two or three dimensional computer graphics like many other games at the time. It's a pity I can't find a copy of this game because I, I really want to play it. The art style just looks so cool. Because of the surreal nature of most claymation art, you can probably see why it makes this iceberg. I'm Scared. I'm Scared is an indie horror game created by Ivan Zenotti from 2012 that was later released on Steam in 2016. This game features an unnamed protagonist in a room unable to escape due to the door needing a heart to open it. Upon the players investigating, they find a little key under the table. This key can be used to open the wardrobe, revealing blood to be inside it. This reveals a hidden entrance to the bottom left of the room. This game deceives the player quite a lot, in which the player has to change files in a folder that the game creates on the user's desktop in order to progress. Because of the fourth wall breaking, there's quite a lot of rumours surrounding it saying that the game has viruses in it. This fourth wall breaking, along with the vague and cryptic nature of the plot, makes it such a surreal experience. Walking Simulators slash Dreamwalkers this is another entry on the iceberg that is like a category of games. Walking simulators are a minimalist genre of games that lack many of the traditional aspects of gameplay, such as a goal, win and lose conditions, or combat. Instead, they focus on discovery and story through walking, exploration, and interaction with non-hazardous items in the environment. They sometimes feature puzzles, but these are infrequent or non-existent altogether and are never a key aspect of gameplay. 
enemies or some other threat may be present, but death is rarely a risk to the player. Instead, some other form of punishment, loss, or setback may be implemented. As you'll see later on, uh, there's quite a lot of walking simulators on this iceberg. Sit and Spin Adventure 1 and 2. These two games are really interesting. I guess you could say. If stuff like this is only in the second tier, I'm, I'm terrified to see what's towards the bottom. The sit and spin adventure games are point and click adventure games that are made with art from other games and the internet. In the game, you play as a sit and spin, and you roam around and interact with wacky stuff, going from wacky location to wacky locations. The developer describes the game as two video games designed and programmed using art and music from the internet and other games. Originally intended as a proof of concept for a short adventure game, the first sit and spin adventure's development quickly transformed into an experiment in found imagery collage and non sequitur exploration. It was developed over the course of three months, as you can probably tell. The sequel built upon the themes seen in the first game, while also adding in new styles of gameplay and a greater number of locations and quests to complete Worlds.com. Worlds.com is an online virtual reality based chat program introduced in April 1995 by the company Worlds Inc. and is currently still online as of the time of this video. A Worlds.com user is allowed to choose from a gallery of existing three-dimensional avatars to be their representation in the virtual world. The gallery is presented presented in a fashion similar to that of a first person shooter, except without the hands and weapon. Once an avatar was chosen, the user was placed in a central hub of a virtual space station. The user would see representations of other online users in this station. This game is uh, quite bizarre and honestly kinda eerie. The game has garnered a bunch of attention due to its uh, questionable users on the game. Apparently the game is filled with real world cults and is used for these questionable individuals to communicate. I recommend watching Nexpo's video where he goes in more depth on these cults in the game and it's it's quite disturbing. Toilet in Wonderland. Oh boy. Toilet in Wonderland is an adventure game where a constipated girl named Mira explores a toilet filled wonderland inhabited with many wacky characters. You wander around this wonderland collecting laxatives to lower your constipation level and collect toilets from different areas of the game. This game is bizarre as you can probably tell from the gameplay and it is, it's, it's quite fun though. I managed to beat it in like three hours but during that time I had I had a lot of fun. I was really surprised that I haven't heard of this game till now. It's, it, it is apparently popular in the RPG maker community but I haven't heard of it before. I recommend playing it, it's it's really good. Oh, just a warning, it can get uh, disturbing at some times. Yuta Hono Tatari. Yuta Hono Tatari is an RPG maker game that kinda got lost under the radar and has never been translated to my knowledge. I played it for a bit and I had no idea what was happening as my Japanese is a bit rusty. In the game, you play as a girl and explore what seems to be an abandoned haunted house. This game is known for its jump scares that really catch you off guard. Other than that, there's not too much to the game, it's it's just another spooky Japanese RPG maker game. Soda Drinker Pro Soda Drinker Pro is the world's most advanced soda drinking simulator. The player uses the keyboard controls to walk around the soda drinking simulator, while the mouse is used to look around the simulation. The left mouse button places the soda into the player's mouth, while the right mouse button sips the soda. The soda has to be at the player's mouth for the soda to be sipped. There is a soda meter in the upper left hand corner of the game that measures the amount of soda left in the player's cup. Once the player has successfully completed drinking the soda, they can move to the next simulation. Throughout the environments, there are bonus sodas which can be collected. While this game has quite a lot of negative reviews with a 30 out of 100 score on Metacritic, I think this game is a banger. This game is quite, quite the trip. Uh, just just watch the game's trailer.
Revenge of the Sunfish. This is one of the games I was talking about earlier, where I said I just had to stop playing, otherwise I would, I would have had a stroke. Revenge of the Sunfish is a collection of games created by Jacob W. Bookzinki in 2007. The game has been heavily played by many YouTubers, but due to the fact that this game is a joke and nothing else, hardly anyone has uh, criticized it. Everything was done using the game factory program, and the graphics were made entirely in Microsoft Paint. The game itself, however, was not fully completed because the hard drive the game was on during the creation crashed and needed to be repaired. So the current state of the game is a fraction of what was originally planned. According to the creator, the basic idea is that every level is supposed to be a different game, playable on its own. Games with very diverse gameplay are hard to find, so he always wanted to create a game like that. It's not that good. When I when I played it, I almost had a stroke. Like after after ten minutes of playing, I could literally feel my brain vibrating and asking me to stop. Just just look at this. Everhood. I don't know why it's this far down, because I mean it's pretty popular. This game is really, really special to me. The first time I played it, I just I just fell in love with it. Everhood definitely has the best soundtrack out of any game, hands down. The game is described as an unconventional adventure RPG that takes place in an inexpressible world filled with amusing musical battles and strange delightful encounters. Personally, I would describe it as Undertale, but except for bullet hell combat, it's, it's a rhythm game. Everhood has a similar story to many you'll hear. A passion project brought to fruition after years of hard work. Its inspiration in Undertale is very clear, but that never holds it back as standing out as its own thing. Although it shares similarities with Undertale, Everhood is much more bizarre and surreal. I highly recommend playing it. It's definitely one of the best indie games I've ever played. Hypnospace Outlaw Hypnospace Outlaw is a simulation game developed by Tendershoot in 2019. Set in an alternate history 1999, the game takes place inside a parody of the early internet and its culture that users visit in their sleep called Hypnospace. The player assumes the role of an enforcer for the fictional company Merchantsoft, creator of Hypnospace, and seeks to police illegal content, copyright violations, viruses, and cyberbullying by users on the service. In the process, the player engages in detective work and puzzle solving. This game takes advantage of the late 90s internet aesthetic to offer a more surreal and exaggerated experience. Middens Middens is an RPG maker game by indie developer My Former Selves from 2013, playing as a figure known only as the Nomad, who flees his home dimension when his beloved culture dies via assimilation. You find yourself in an area called the Rift. The Rift is essentially the scrapyard of the universes, where all the dimension or parts of dimensions that were unwanted or broken are sent to rot. A world of anarchy, every being in the Rift is an immigrant who fled their home dimension, taking a chunk of it with them. From the synopsis and the gameplay, you can see how this game is surreal in every sense of the word. You May Nikki Fan Games. This entry refers to the large amount of fan games created for You May Nikki. You May Nikki is that RPG maker game that was the first entry on the iceberg back in tier one. Most fan games use the setting and plot of You May Nikki to expand on its ideas shown in the game and create homages to You May Nikki with RPG Maker. Some notable You May Nikki fan Fan games include Dot Flow, You May Tuki, Flesh Child, Me, and Device. Paranham Haru. Paranham Haru is yet another Japanese RPG Maker horror game from 1998. I did not until researching this game that the RPG Maker engine has been around since 92. The plot of Paranham Haru is the following. Professor Tsuchida is a leading expert on archaeology, goes on an unauthorized expedition into the unknown levels of the Great Pyramid of Giza, 
with his assistant, Koji Kuroi. They soon realize that the underground ruins are full of death traps when the excavator they hired is decapitated by a thin metal wire. Professor Tsuchida, unwilling to back down, goes outside the pyramid to lure a Japanese tour group nearby to act as his human shield. Inside the pyramid, one by one, the members of the entourage become subject to Khufu's punishment for their faults. But the professor insists on heading deeper into the complex, despite knowing the fatal dangers of the environment. The game is similar to other RPGs in that it involves exploration and random enemy encounters, but it focuses not on combat, but rather puzzle solving to save party members from punishment. The game's setting, along with the highly graphic nature of the game, is what makes it so surreal. Off. Off is a French RPG maker game from 2008 that was kinda hard to find information about, but I did, however, find a download link to it. Off is a pretty standard RPG maker game where you play as the batter, a man in a baseball uniform that is on a sacred mission to purify the world. You make your way through four separate zones, killing these enemies called spectres along the way. As you progress, you'll find out that these zones are tied to the Guardian's life energy, and that killing the Guardians will completely wipe out life in all the zones, which is revealed to be your player's true objective. This game has a really interesting plot and atmosphere, and for an RPG Maker game, the writing is pretty solid. After sitting through RPG Maker game after RPG Maker game, it's nice to have a game that's not just a joke game and is actually decent. Yuppie Psycho. Yuppie Psycho places you in the shoes of Brian Paxtonak, a young man with no future in a dystopian 1990s society. Upon receiving a mysterious letter offering a job at the headquarters of the megalithic corporation, Centricor, Brian discovers a deep, dark, complex web of lies and horror. His job? Kill the witch causing the corruption in the company. On his first day of the job, Brian will meet all kinds of odd characters, escape from terrible creatures, and unravel the hidden secrets of Sindracorp's dark past. Yuppie Psycho has a retro aesthetic from the golden age of the 90s, featuring anime-inspired cutscenes to immerse the player in an atypical horror story, loosely following the same basic gameplay template of a variety of classic 16-bit RPGs. Yuppie Psycho unites a myriad of different genres, including survival horror, graphic adventure, and puzzle solving. The overall game design also takes notes from titles such as Silent Hill and Deadly Premonition, two games that I also mentioned back in Tier 1. Burn Band. Although it's more of an experience than it is a game, Burn Band is pretty great. In Burn Band, you'll explore an alien cyberpunk city filled to the brim with hidden areas and a bunch of detail. It's actually pretty impressive how big the city is, considering it's a free-to-play game from Game Jolt. This game is immersive as frick, and there's something about the sound design that is just so atmospheric and relaxing. I highly recommend you give Burn Ban a go. It's it's pretty awesome. Sonic Dreams Collection. Oh god, it, it took me years to forget about this game, and now it's back. Sonic Dreams Collection is a 2015 art game developed by Arcane Kids. It's an unofficial game based on Sega's Sonic the Hedgehog franchise that compiles four mini-games presented as unfinished Sonic games, but the game as a whole later reveals itself to be a psychological horror game, satirizing the modern Sonic fandom. They include the character creator, Make My Sonic, the massively multiplayer online role-playing game Eggman Origin, the adventure game Sonic Movie Maker, and the virtual reality game My Roommate Sonic. They are described in-game as having been developed by a non-existent Sega studio for the Dreamcast in the late 1990s. The most surreal part of the Dream Collection is definitely the My Roommate Sonic game. My Roommate Sonic is a virtual reality VR game presented from a first-person view. The player sits on a couch next to Sonic with Eggman encouraging the player by text message to pursue a romantic interest in him. If the player completes all these tasks, Sonic and the player prepare to kiss, only for Sonic's pupils to converge into a black hole that sucks the player's character and their phone in. The player then watches their character running through a distorted green hill zone and slowly morphing into a realistic headless version of Sonic. This game, uh used to be quite traumatizing back in the day. Seaman. Seaman, not to be confused with Seaman, is a virtual pet video game for the Sega Dreamcast. It's one of the few Dreamcast games that take advantage of the microphone attachment. The game developed a cult following for its dark humor, bizarre aesthetics, and innovative gameplay. 
Seaman was released multiple times, including a limited edition version titled Christmas Seaman that was released in Japan in 1999, alongside a limited edition Red Dreamcast and a PlayStation 2 version in 2001 titled Seaman Kinden no Pet, Gaze Hakushi no Jiken Shima, the first edition of the game that came with a microphone. A PC version for Microsoft Windows was also planned, with the Seaman being able to interact with the user's applications. Kind of like Bonzi Buddy. No release date was specified and it was later cancelled. A sequel called Seaman 2 was released in Japan for the PlayStation 2 in 2007. I haven't played Seaman because it's pretty hard to find a copy of the game for a decent price. The Battle Cats. <sighs> I used to be so addicted to this game. The Battle Cats is a free-to-play tower defense game developed by the Ponos Corporation for iOS and Android. The Battle Cats is a tower defense game where the player selects a team of in-game unlockable cats with different stat amounts to defeat enemies in order to protect their base called Cat Base. The gameplay involves sending a wide roster of cats out into a 2D battlefield to defend the Cat Base. While Battle Cats is a lot more well known than the other games on this tier, it's definitely very very surreal. I mean, you can play as Hatsune Miku for God's sake. Hylix. Damn, why why are all my favorite games on this iceberg? Hylix is a banger of a game, described as a recreational program with light RPG elements that was released in 2015 by Mason Lindroth. What makes this game so great? for me at least, is the well-made claymation graphics that are used throughout the game. The player character is Wayne, a humanoid being with yellow skin and crescent-shaped horns. Most of the game's NPCs speak using random text generation in a manner described as a deliberately misleading red herring, albeit consistent with the setting with the player's goals being represented through environmental design instead. The world and characters are alluded to be post-human in nature, and the goal of the game is to defeat the King of the Moon, whose name is Gibby. Alex plays like a traditional JRPG, despite its surreal setting. Hit points are replaced with flesh, while magic points are replaced with will. Battles are shown from a first-person perspective, with the character's hands being shown performing attacks. Wayne loses all of his flesh when defeated, but does not die, rather warping to an afterlife, from which they can travel back to a previous area. Battle items are also unusual, such as being able to attack with a frozen burrito. I also just have to mention the soundtrack, my god does it have some bangers on it. No Delivery. No Delivery is a procedurally generated CRPG pizzeria simulator where you are the newest in a long line of employees for a local decrepit pizza parlor. Despite the rumors, shady history, and missing person cases, you sign up for the night shift because it pays slightly more than all the kids' birthday parties should. The game roguelikes a new random character for you to play and go around this pizza parlor and do errands. As you wander around the map, there are wrong turn locations that you can fall into. These are like dungeons, and they all have their own theme to them. For example, you might end up in a ball pit themed area, with monsters coming out of the depths of the ball pit. While it's not too surreal, it's a pretty cool roguelike centered around delivering pizza. Mega Man Sprite Game Released on Halloween of 2012, in this RPG game, Mega Man and his brother Zero get into some trouble with some spooky ghost. The game is your average RPG maker game, except that it's an adaptation of the Mega Man Sprite comic. The Mega Man Sprite comic is an old webcomic that was made from crudely drawn Mega Man sprites, originally created by Samantha Gilson as a one-off parody of crappy sprite comics. The uniqueness of the Mega Man Sprite comics resulted in a surprisingly long-lived webcomic with a small but devoted fanbase, Johnny Series. The Johnny Series is a long list of games made by Mr. Krubus. As of May 2008, there have been 21 Johnny games. Because of the large number of Johnny games, two fan games have been made by CLY5M. The link on the iceberg brought me to this wiki page about the Johnny series, but I wasn't able to find a download or any gameplay anywhere, but it's apparently described by the Iceberg creator to have not so good graphics or gameplay. I did, however, manage to find this screenshot and uh, their description was pretty accurate. 
Total Distortion Total Distortion is a 1995 full motion adventure game for Mac and Windows developed by Pop Rocket. The gameplay has the player as a music video entrepreneur in the distortion dimension, a place where they can fight guitar warriors in guitar battles. The goal of the game is to get fame points, make money, and film successful music videos. The game was also known for its sense of humor. For example, the famous game over screen featured the enemy singing a song called you are dead. One of the most distinctive feature of this game was the sleep mode. When the player went to sleep, a dream appeared which consisted of a mini game. If the player failed the dream sequence, it would result in a nightmare which decreased mental energy, an important stat in the game. Yeah, um, early 90s full motion graphics really did make this game surreal. Gregory Horror Show Gregory Horror Show, known in Japan as Gregory Horror Show Soul Collector, is a mystery survival horror game based on the CGI anime series of the same name. The game was published by Capcom in 2003 for the PS2 and was released everywhere except America. Yeah, if if you've watched the Gregory Horror Show anime then you can understand why this game is surreal. Suits, a business RPG. Suits, a business RPG is a hand-drawn black and white RPG maker game created by Technomancy Studios in 2016. It's a deliberately weird take on the JRPG. It's heavily inspired by the previously mentioned Earthbound series and its juxtaposition of realistic elements and surreal humor. The game seems to be, at least in my opinion, a criticism of corporate America and the negatives of capitalism. Broken Reality. Broken Reality is a 3D exploration game developed by Dynamic Media Triad from 2018 on Steam. It revolves around this online chat room from the year 2045 called Natem. As a new user, you are encouraged by the helpful one, Chan, to collect likes by clicking on ads, shopping, and helping out other users to become as popular as possible. Natum provides a variety of servers with vibrantly different retro aesthetics, influenced by both vaporwave and 90s pop culture, into a dizzyingly nostalgic and melancholy blend. All is not well in Natum, and early on you are asked by those in the know to help plumb its secrets. These bizarre areas you explore are what make this game surreal. I really love this game because, as you can tell by my videos, I really like the vaporwave aesthetic and yeah, this game uh, ticks all my boxes. Stray Cat Crossing Stray Cat Crossing is yet another surreal RPG maker horror game from 2015 about a girl who wanders into a house looking to retrieve her favourite scarf and is met instead with a host of bizarre monsters and the saddening secrets of the family within. Stray Cat Crossing also draws upon stories such as Alice in Wonderland, Spirited Away, Pan's Labyrinth, and The Nightmare Before Christmas. Yeah, from, from this you could probably see why this game is surreal. Jinjiva. God, this game is so good. Jinjiva is an RPG maker game created by the same developer that made Middens, a game that I covered in the last video. Set in the same surreal dystopian setting as Middens, you play as Jinjiva, a young woman with an old-fashioned clock winding key for her head, who is essentially an enslaved automation factory worker. The story begins with the Holy Mother Most High requesting your presence. When you speak to her, she accuses you of slacking off on your work and has you thrown in prison. However, in your prison cell, you meet with a a sentient disembodied mouth referred to as the chatter teeth he uh, helps you escape prison now on the run from the evil corporate executives you must make your way through a bizarre corrupted world filled with danger in a quest to regain both your freedom and your humanity this game reminds me a lot of abe's odyssey with like the themes of corporate slave labor and they're both kind of in the same setting but um yeah this game is very surreal ENA Dream Barbecue. Dream Barbecue is an upcoming episode and interactive video game in the ENA series. It's considered to be the beginning of a new season of the series. If you don't already know, ENA is a Peruvian animated series present on YouTube and Newgrounds created by Joel Guriel. The series uses a mix of 2D and 3D animation and takes inspiration from many pieces of media and worldwide culture. The series takes place in a strange, almost post-apocalyptic world inhabited by bizarre characters and creatures. The overall tone of the series uses surreal and comedic elements. While it's not out yet, from what I can tell, it's just like the animated series, so um, yeah, the game will be quite surreal. Perfect Vermin Perfect Vermin is an indie horror game by Maceo Bob Moi from 2020. The gameplay is pretty simple. You have a sledgehammer to destroy any objects that look out of place in an office building while being timed. A news reporter pops up to tell you that there is no time to 
ways, and that there are more vermin hiding on the other floors. But as you destroy more objects, the reporter starts to become deformed. At the end of the game, you are in a doctor's office, and it's revealed that your player has cancer. With this uh, sudden ending, combined with the themes of smoking throughout the game, the game makes me feel like uh, it's about destroying cancer cells in a body. Like, you, you make your way through a normal office, destroying objects that are out of place, and once you destroy them, they explode into like a bloody mess. It's a bit of a stretch, but uh, I don't know, this is the only theory that I could make for this game. Plug and Play. Plug and Play is an interactive animation drawn by Michael Frey in 2015. In the game, you play through different scenarios involving plugs and people with plugs as heads. The game seems to be about love and technology or something. The game was pretty popular back in the day with YouTubers such as Markiplier reacting to the surreal aspects of the game. I'm uh, not too sure why this one is so far down. Remediation, a dream emulator demo. Being heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator, a game I mentioned back in Tier 1, this game is an exploration through spaces, some inspired by real dreams, or with the ambition of creating a sense of yearning and loneliness. These feelings can only be remediated by embracing dreams from a simpler state of mind. While this isn't a horror game, there are some pretty creepy visuals that might be unsettling for younger players. Like the LSD Dream Emulator, this game is less of a game and more of a surreal experience. 21 The World 21 The World is a surreal exploration game based on the developer's dream journal that he kept for years. Like the previous one, this game is also heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator. In the game, you start in the game dev's bedroom and go deeper and deeper into a dream rabbit hole by interacting with different objects. It was really cool to play and see how many different dreams I could discover. Tamashi. Inspired by obscure Japanese games from the 90s and late 80s, Tamashi is a unique puzzle platformer from 2019, set in a distorted world of striking horror and unsettling imagery. The game pulls inspiration from Lovecraft stories such as Cthulhu, so, so you can guess why this game might be surreal. Tamashi is uh, quite disturbing, and if you play it, uh, a lot of it will stick with you for a while. Despite the pretty solid art direction, this game is still not that good of a platformer. It definitely puts its visuals before its gameplay. Emstain. Emstain is another one of those bizarre PS1 style horror games. In Emstain, you play as a guy that's applying for a job at a financial company in the big city. After meeting the owner, Emstain, Apparently the M doesn't stand for anything. You find out that he is part of a satanic cult and you are his next sacrifice. The game's twist is uh, pretty good and the sound design and visuals are very pleasing. While it's pretty short, it's still a really good game and you should definitely check it out. It's it's about 20 minutes long, I think. Insomnio. Insomnio was uh, quite the interesting experience. It's what I think is another dream emulator, or at least that's what it feels like. In Insomnio, you play through five different dreamlike sequences in the style of a PS1 horror game. We're going to be seeing a lot of these PS1-like horror games in the next couple of tiers, so uh, be prepared. The game left me feeling really confused, but I was also pretty satisfied with the visuals and the liminal space feeling of the levels. Throughout the experience, I was really expecting to be jump scared, but uh, thankfully that didn't happen un until the last level, at least. Overall, it's a uh, pretty surreal uh, Go play it if you wanna, it's it's very short, but it's it's pretty sweet. Neko Yume. Neke Yume is another dream emulator that's also inspired by the LSD dream emulator that's in the style of a PS1 horror game. Again. You explore a cat-filled dream with a night and day cycle and dozens of randomized events. Even if you explore an area once, there is no guarantee that it will be the same upon your return. The soundtrack is so freaking good, man. The game is really fun and there's something about the music and the atmosphere of some of the areas that's just so satisfying. Or should I say, cat. It's fine. You Left Me. You Left Me is a dark, funny, surreal game about loneliness and loss, where you wake up in a mysterious world and have until night time to escape. It's pretty good, and you can tell a lot of care and effort was put into making it. The story, the music, and the art is, is all pretty solid. I don't want to spoil much, because I, I recommend you definitely play it. It's um, 
quite the sick experience. True Loop. True Loop is an adventure simulation game developed by Punchline and released in 2002 in Japan for the PlayStation 2 and then later in North America in 2007 as a GameStop exclusive. In True Loop, you play as a young man who has just moved to a new town and next door to the girl of his dreams. Although she wants nothing to do with him due to his family's poor economic status, he decides to write her a heartfelt letter. When the letter is stolen, it is up to the protagonist to travel around the village and retrieve all of its pieces. The gameplay of Chulet revolves around improving the player's reputation with all the citizens in order to access all the parts of the town. To do this, the player must impress each member of the community and then kiss them. It's, uh, I think it's mostly the art of the game that makes it surreal. And, uh, also, th those, those lips. Cosmo D's Games. Cosmo D is a game developer that makes surreal, musically driven narrative adventure games. Some of his games include Off Peak, The Norwood Suite, and Tales from Off Peak City. He makes his own music for these games, and, uh, I gotta say, their, their soundtracks are quite nutty. At first glance, they look like, uh, those lazily made Unity games, but after playing some of them, I gotta say, they're... They're pretty solid. OK Normal. OK Normal is a short, experimental third-person horror experience inspired by early 3D console games of the 90s. In the game, you journey through a dark, disjointed, dreamlike dimension with your cloud companion. While the game is really immersive and the atmosphere is very well put together, the, the controls are not the best, especially the, the jumping. But I guess that's a, that's a part of what makes it an early 3D 90s game. Sludge Life. Sludge Life is described as a first person, open world, vandalism centric stroll through a polluted island full of cranky idiots and a vibe so thick you can taste it. You roam a tiny island stuck on a sludge covered planet as an upcoming tagger, Ghost, set on staking their claim amongst the graffiti elite. You traverse the corporately branded landscape, chat up other taggers, and discover secrets and idiots along the way. The game is uh, pretty well known considering it was picked up and published by Devolver Digital, but it's still quite the surreal experience. The art design is just beautiful to say the least and the, the music is uh, pretty, pretty, pretty top tier. Monument Valley. Why, why is this so far down? Monument Valley is an indie puzzle game developed and published by Us Two Games in 2014. You've probably heard of it if you have an iPhone because it's heavily advertised, well, for me at least, on the iOS app store. In Monument Valley, you play as Ida, journeying through mazes of optical illusions and impossible objects, which are referred to as sacred geometry in-game, as she journeys to be forgiven for something. The game is presented in an isometric view and the player interacts with the environment to find hidden passages as Ida progresses to the map's exit. The game is really relaxing and I, I wouldn't really call it surreal, it's uh, it's more minimalist than anything. Super Mario 64 build 3313. B3313 or build 3313, also called Super Mario 64 Internal Plexus, is a ROM hack of Super Mario 64 developed by Chris Brutal Aggression and his dev team. It's, well, at least I think, it's the largest Super Mario 64 hack to date, especially regarding the number of accessible areas, but also the star count and various other aspects. It's currently still in development, with the latest public release being version 0.7. The plot of the game is largely up to interpretation, although it appears that the Mario Brothers are stuck in the aforementioned internal plexus. They're frantically looking for a way out, while being haunted by an evil entity, presumably the personalization AI, as it takes the form of eerie liminal spaces, sinister NPC messages, and other phenomena. Additionally, Bowser has stolen the princess again, although this might just be another manifestation of whatever the brothers are trying to escape. The game uh, plays off that whole uh, uh, Super Mario 64 iceberg meme, where like the, the last tier was like, every copy of Mario was um, personalized, and um, the castle is like, uh, an internal plexus, which is like a brain thing, I don't know. Apparently the the... The main villain is the personalization AI, which uh, is up to interpretation. Despite being a ROM hack, this game is definitely large enough to be considered its own thing. Strange Land. This game is uh, pretty, pretty nutty. Strange Land is a surreal point-and-click adventure game from 2021. The game takes place in this surreal, carnival-inspired place that is floating in an unknown void. <laughs> I, I guess you could say the game takes place in a 
in a strange land. The setting of the game manages to be quite disturbing at times, but also very interesting. What I like about the game is that while it shows a large amount of stuff, like body mutilation and other various things. The narrative behind these disturbing depictions stop it from feeling gratuitous. The game is pretty fun to play but uh, kind of dragged out a bit too long, so if you if you have the time to spare, definitely check it out, it's, it's on Steam. Etherain Games. This entry refers to the indie game dev Etherain. Etherain, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, is an Estonian game dev primarily known for her Hello Charlotte games. Their games are quite similar to Omori in their surrealness, a, a game I mentioned back in tier 1, and have quite solid writing from what I hear. I've heard them be described as the Evangelion of uh, RPG Maker games, which which sounds about right. Who's Lila? Who's Lila? I don't, I don't know, who, who is Lila? Who's Lila is a point and click adventure game from 2021, where instead of choosing dialogue options, you control the character's face manually. This game surprisingly isn't very well known, and I enjoyed it quite a lot. It got uh, quite disturbing at times, but the visuals along with the main gameplay mechanic definitely made it uh, surreal to experience. Anodine. Anodine is an action-adventure video game developed by Analgesic Productions from 2013. Anodine is a pretty cool game, and uh, is what the result would be if Link's Awakening and Yume Nikki had a baby. Anodine is played by exploring a dream world of the game's protagonist, Young. The gameplay involves the use of two primary items, a broom and shoes for jumping. I really enjoyed the mix of action-packed gameplay with the immersive, surreal atmosphere that was heavily supported by the game's soundtrack. Damn, does this game soundtrack slap. Bad Mojo. Bad Mojo, often described as the Roach game, is an adventure video game created by Pulse Entertainment in 1996. This uh, this tier is a bit wacky. We have like recently made indie games and also games from the from the 90s. In Bad Mojo, you play as Roger Sams, an etymologist planning to embezzle money from a research grant to escape his sordid life above an abandoned bar. The storyline in Bad Mojo is loosely based off a novel from 1915 called The Metamorphosis. Something about the visuals of this game really creeps me out. Like, a lot of sections in the game are just very hard to look at. Death Flush. I, I, I love this game so much. Death Flush is another PS1-style horror game made by the same dev that made M Stain. This game is really great, and it's pretty short, but uh, before I give a rundown on it, I, I definitely recommend you play it. Oh. I'll put a link in the description. In Death Flush, you play as Ronnie, a guy that witnessed the murder of his grandpa while he was taking a whiz by some sort of serial killer. While watching TV with your girlfriend, you get a sudden urge to take a piss, as one does. But Ronnie is hesitant. You see, he has a phobia of pissing alone, due to seeing his grandpa get murdered while pissing. After violently splurging out a fat stream into the toilet, the bathroom door locks and you can't get out. Eventually, your granddad's killer kidnaps you from the toilet bowl. You then take control of Ronnie's girlfriend and you make your way through a demonic hellscape to rescue your boyfriend. After a very climatic boss battle, you make your escape. Back at Ronnie's apartment, the killer comes out of the toilet once more, but the moment he leaves the bathroom, he evaporates. This game, like M Stain, is an absolute banger and I, I really hope the guy that made it continues to make more games like this. Lost in Vivo. You've probably heard of this game as it was pretty popular on YouTube at one point, but uh, in case you haven't, I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about it. Lost in Vivo is a 2018 horror game that is centered around claustrophobia, the fear of tight and small places. During a storm, your service dog is forced down a broken sewer drain. You find the nearest sewer entrance and make a run after it. Along the way, you meet others that are also stricken by abnormal or psychological fear. The game is very well made, and it definitely gives a great representation of what it's like to be claustrophobic. Siphonopolis. This um game is quite hard to explain, but I'm gonna try anyway. Siphonopolis is a great example of the kind of games that we're gonna be seeing going deeper down the iceberg. Siphonopolis can be called a point-and-click game, but it's a uh, rather odd one. There's some puzzles in the game, but they definitely aren't the main focus. Most of your time in the game is spent swimming through surreal landscapes, fighting bizarre creatures in bullet hell combat, and running away from the ones you can't shoot. Its visuals are, um, 
a bit a bit surreal. The game looks like what I think a stroke victim would see. The game kind of looks like that thing where you close your eyes and you rub them and you see like the light fade in and out and it's all trippy looking. I don't know that might that might just be me. Starting off in tier 3 we have Mario the Music Box. Mario the Music Box, also known as Mario the Music Box Classic, is a free fan-made RPG horror game created by Team Ari. The game gets most of its inspiration from other classic RPG mega games such as Mad Father and Corpse Party. While the game features Mario, it's um not your usual Nintendo game. Despite having Mario as a playable character, the game doesn't actually take place in the Mushroom Kingdom, but in an abandoned mansion. After hearing some rumors about people disappearing from a mansion, Mario decides to investigate it. After entering the house, you find this music box playing by itself. After grabbing it out of curiosity, the front door of the house disappears and Mario gets trapped in the mansion. The whole point of the game is to get out of the mansion while learning a bit more about the people that used to live there before they went missing. This game is literally just Corpse Party, but with Mario for some reason. Yeah, having Mario in a RPG maker horror game definitely feels a bit surreal. The game is well known for its death scenes that are quite abundant and feature very graphic art. While it's pretty spooky and a bit surreal, I'm not too sure why it's down this far. Crypt Worlds, oof, I've been waiting to talk about this one. This game is amazing. Definitely my new favourite game from the iceberg. Cryptworlds is an adventure game by the developer Lilith Zone. We'll be uh, seeing a lot of her games on this iceberg. In Cryptworlds, you go on a quest to save the world. Sounds pretty simple, right? Well, it isn't. When you first get into the game, you're given the goal. Find the five goddess relics and bring them back to the unicorn goddess so that you can defeat Dendigar, who is otherwise going to destroy the world in 50 days. Epic. The art in the game is really pretty. It uses grainy JPEG images that are placed onto objects and characters, and it has that classic nostalgic adventure game feel. The game's not too long and is really great, and it's also free, so you should definitely play it. Just a warning though, do not piss on the archaeologist. Everything is going to be okay. This game's pretty cool, but holy f does it hurt my eyes. This game, or should I say, experience, is a collection of mini games that revolve around the theme of coping and survival. It kind of reminds me of Revenge of the Sunfish, that game I covered a few videos back. The developer describes the game as a desktop labyrinth of poetry, strange fever dream games, and broken digital spaces. It's a collection of life experiences that are largely a commentary on struggle, survival, and coping with the aftermath of surviving bad things. On the surface, it comes off as a dark comedy, and humor is a prevalent theme, but as you interact, the theme starts to unravel and facilitate what I hope to be a deeper discussion about these topics. Le Fantabulous Game and Other Egg Likes. This entry refers to the category of surreal games called egg likes. I think like the, the best way to describe this genre is like walking simulators, not as good. The term egg-like refers to a game genre that features games that are egg-like. That's it. Most people recall the fantastic game as the first egg-like game, but in actuality, according to the egg-like wiki, LSD Dream Emulator was the first egg-like. The fantastic game is probably the most well-known egg-like and was the first game that perfectly fitted the description of an egg-like. The game mentioned on the iceberg is Le Fantabulous, another well-known egg-like that is also known as The Quest for Sausage. The game isn't anything special, just a standard Unity walking simulator, but yeah, it is quite surreal. Bat Castle. Bat Castle is yet another RPG Maker game where you play as this guy Maybe he's the bat, and you walk around a castle. Maybe bat castle? I played a bit of it, and it's really not that good. I don't know if it was intentional or not, but when you walk around, your character's sprite mirrors itself. Back in the day, I used to mess around with Unity a lot, and um, I'm pretty sure that that like takes one line of code to fix. The sound design is not bad, and the music is pretty interesting. I literally couldn't get past the first enemy in the game. This purple ghost guy. Looking online I was told to drink the ghost potion before fighting him, but for some reason my guy couldn't even open the potion to drink it, so I wasn't really able to experience everything that the bat castle had to offer. Goblet Grotto. I swear that 90% of the games on this iceberg have been played on stream by Vice Horse Vinny. Like, when searching any game on this iceberg on Google, the first suggestion would be a Twitch stream of Vinny playing the said game. I don't know, maybe the creator of the iceberg just really lacks vine sauce. 
Goblet Grotto takes Crypto World's place as being the best game on this iceberg so far. This game is a masterpiece. I have no idea why I haven't played this before. I like to think that if I was going to make a game, it could be as good as this. In Goblet Grotto, you play as a frog knight guy that explores the grotto in search for goblets. While the concept is pretty simple, the game has tons of content. There's heaps of hidden areas, people to interact with, different enemies. The game is just overall really great. For some reason while playing, the, these symbols kept popping up at the top of my screen and ear raping me. I'm not too sure what that was all about. Also, the frog guy is pretty cool. He uh, he makes noises every time you do stuff. Kill, 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 kill. Funny Pizza Land. Funny Pizza Land is uh, quite the disturbing game. Playing this shit has kept me up at night, and I, I really wish I didn't learn about this game. Funny Pizza Land is described as a playable painting, and I gotta say, who the fuck paints like this? When you wanted to make a playable painting, what f***ing painting were you trying to make paintable? Actually, no, I don't think I want to know that. <laughs> Look at this shit. Yeah, that's, that's surreal. Do I really need to say more? The game's not bad, and I can say the effort was put into it, unlike a lot of these entries. The game was a bit of a bitch to run, but I can't really blame it because it is from 2002. Also, there is a second Funny Pizza Land game, and it doesn't look like the inside of a homeless man's butthole. The art style is actually pretty decent. Magic Dweedoo's games. Magic Dweedoo has quite the large list of surreal games, and looking on his website, I'm getting very intrigued to play each one just to punish myself. Of course, I'm not gonna do that though, because I do have my limits. I like how Brainworms, the iceberg creator, just described this entry as absurd games. I feel that fits perfectly. The one game of his that I did play was called The True Western Romance. I mean, just look at that thumbnail, how could I not play it? I was also tempted to play this game named Pube, but it didn't look worthy enough. After five minutes of playing The True Western Romance, my life had changed. I had never experienced such a gut-wrenching story. The way I play games from now on will forever be changed. Now you better go wrong before I get Johnny Longwood onto your ass to tear you apart into parts from head to toe, got it? Go on, scram! What are you saying? Talk louder, kid! What? I really gotta revisit this guy's games. They look amazing and I could honestly make a whole video about this rabbit hole. This is one of those entries I talked about back in tier 1 where I said just searching the name of an entry can take you into a rabbit hole and like show you a bunch of surreal games that you never knew existed. Like the game I played said it only had 800 plays, which uh, damn I feel like, I feel like a pioneer. Blomko's games. God, this tier is just packed with bangers, isn't it? Blomko is another guy that makes surreal games, and they're honestly on par with the ones I just mentioned. Going onto Blomko's itch.io page, we're greeted with the description, Hello, here are a few games. I will make more games. Thank you for being here. Aww. The two games of his that I did play were Herm's Odyssey, because of the thumbnail, and Burger World, because I'm a morbidly obese 40 year old that loves burgers. In Herm's Odyssey, we become Herm, and go on an odyssey something that i have always wanted to do cool that's that's one thing off my bucket list move aside goblet grotto because i just found the new best surreal game i gotta warn you before i go further because the story of herm's odyssey is it's very emotional after the death of your blob buddy herm decides to avenge his mate and visit a great wizard i cannot believe this how could i have been so foolish I must visit a great wizard and avenge his death. Herm makes his way to his spaceship after leaving the ch chunch? What the fuck is that? Also, what what is that? After we get to the spaceship, Herm presses the big button to begin his journey. While we're traveling at warp speed, we're able to eat, drink, and sleep. After taking a power nap, we get to the first destination, McDonald's. Sorry, I, I meant to say the intergalactic embassy of burgers. After going inside, oh shit, it's the guy from Smiling Friends, we see a massive lion. So while we wait for it to die down a bit, we go take a piss. Going in the bathroom, we see, oh f that that's not a urinal. Yes, Herm, this is impossible. How do I piss in this room? After going back in the lion, some guy's burger decides to combust, blowing away all of the customers. Cool, no more line. After urting a burger, 
we go back to our ship and go to the next destination. After opening the ship's hatch, we see um, Bart Simpson buff skeleton in Adidas shorts smoking a cigarette. You know, just your normal Wednesday afternoon. Apparently he's here to kill Herm, but <laughs> did you actually think that would work? Herm absolutely obliterates evil man into space and goes back to his ship to continue his odyssey. Going to our next destination, we reach a asteroid belt? Uh oh. After dodging some asteroids in a bullet hell sequence, Herm eventually crashes his ship into a giant rock hurtling towards him. After what looks like a drunk driving accident, we wake up in space prison. Only the guards are literal blobs and can't do anything about us escaping. Walking up to some other inmates, we see a green guy that says, he can't leave, no arms. After hijacking this humanoid spaceship, Herm continues his odyssey, until, oh, a black hole. After getting sucked into the black hole, we end up in the tube dimension. Everything's cool though, because this is where Herm was trying to go. In the tube dimension, we find that wizard that Herm was looking for. After killing Herm with lightning, he flies to heaven, being reunited with his dead friend. God, this game is so epic! The other Blomco game I played was Burger World. It's Burger Day, so we better be ready to make some burgs. We gotta feed every customer, and then we'll be free. We gotta make sure we make each burg the way they want. Yada yada yada, it's, it's, it's Papa's Burgerio, but in space. Yup, cool, I think I got it. Alright, so we get the option to gather some ingredients before we serve the burgs. Each ingredient you gather is like its own little mini game, and they're pretty fun. Alright, so this grey tumor wants 1 cheese, 3 blood, 6 meat, and 7 egg. Oh, cool. I've already forgotten what he wants, so just have to get what I give him. Oh, he, he didn't like it. Alright, uh, what does the next guy want? 1 cheese, 6 blood, 7 meat, 7 egg. Alright, I think I can remember that. Alright, cool. Here we go. Alright, that, that's, that's enough of Burger World. The Museum of Everything Goes. The Museum of Everything Goes is an obscure edutainment CD-ROM project from 95 that was mostly forgotten about. The game is pretty interesting, to say the least. You play through a first-person perspective walking around a museum, clicking on different paintings and statues to enter these pretty surreal but basic mini-games. I didn't get too far into it because, you know, I would prefer not to have a brain aneurysm. Don't go in there. Look what happened to me. Cool, I guess I'm going in then. Actually, never mind. Do I have to? Alright, what what happens if I click this painting? Ah, cool, a, a gardening simulator. Alright, what, what else is there? Um, alright, that's, that's cool, I guess. What, what else? What do you want? What do you want? What, what, what do you want? To, to stop playing this game? Go Home. Go Home is a third person horror game from 2009. It's set in a residential area in early 2000s Japan. You play as a little girl with a blurred face named Mosaiko Suzuki, who's been separated from her parents and is trying to get home. Unfortunately for her, death is merely seconds away at any given moment, as strange monsters pop out of every nook and cranny and seemingly every turn leads to danger. You know, it's just your normal day in Ohio. Ohio. While it can be somewhat comedic at times, the game is definitely disturbing more than anything. I got the description of the game from a wiki page because while playing it, I had absolutely no idea what was happening. It's pretty interesting. Apparently the game was made by a Japanese VTuber called Idimatu Ichimatsu. Milk inside a bag of milk inside a bag of milk. Alright, so apart from Hilux 2 coming up, this is the last game on the iceberg that I've played prior to making this video. As we get deeper, I'll be experiencing all of these games for the first time, so forgive me if my descriptions aren't very good. This game is pretty well known, and I'm not too sure why it's down here with all this other stuff, but oh well. I got this game a bit after it came out, because the art style looked really cool, and well, it only cost a dollar, so. For its price, I was shocked at how good it is. The game focuses around a girl with mental illness. Whether it's schizophrenia, anxiety, depression, or all of the above. The way the game tells its story is really unique, and it's able to make you feel like her mental illness is your own. This game kinda hit a bit close to home. It really outlines how hard it can be to complete simple tasks. 
without overthinking them and getting things done. <clears throat> kind of like my YouTube channel. I won't spoil anything because I definitely recommend you play it. It literally costs a dollar on Steam. Insert coin maze. <sighs> I spent way too long trying to beat this game. Insert coin is a maze game where you control a cube in a maze. Yep, that's it. There's wrong turns you can take and obstacles that will end your game and force you to refresh the page if you want to keep playing. For some reason, after beating a level, I was able to glitch my way out of the maze. Maybe that had something to do with beating the game? I don't know, I wasn't able to beat it. I couldn't really find a guide for it either, so I kind of just gave up. You are my home. This game is a bit disturbing, to say the least. The game's plot revolves around a game cartridge that you find at your front door. You put it in your game console, cause why wouldn't you? And you're greeted by an anime girl. After some pretty personal questions, some very creepy mini games, and some one-to-one -one discussion, the anime girl asks you if you're home. After saying yes, she asks you to go outside your house and look for her. Because I have an IQ of 10, I did so. After clicking on the prompt confirming I did in fact look for her, she says that, that that's the first time I've looked for her, which I mean, is correct, yes, and that she has nothing else to show me. The game has a bunch of connotations towards like stalking people and entering their home. It's a bit hard to explain, but I really like the interpretation of the story by many a badass hero. But it looks like this is a actual physical entity. This is not like, oh, it's a ghost possessing a cartridge. I'm going to assume, here's how, how the plot works. We have a stalker. The stalker is stalking a baby. This stuff type of stuff has happened in real life before. This is a real thing that's happened to people. Stalking a baby is obsessed with them. It's gonna abduct them. It's been coming in their house. Has been like doing all sorts of weird stuff throughout their life. You get video footage that they've recorded over the years and somehow they've squeezed it into a game cartridge. Uh, that's one hell of a cartridge. And they've chronicled all the way from when you were a baby up till you're a little kid. I'm assuming you're now an adult or a teenager, or at least someone older and more independent. And they've dropped this thing off to you as a way of like revealing the crime, but in like a loving way, like, like look at all the things, look how dedicated I am to you. Shao Mythos. The Shao Mythos, I hope that's how you say it. Also known as the John Defoe Tetraology or the Tribly Tetraology, are a series of horror-themed freeware adventure games by Ben Yati Kroshaw. First released in 2003, the first game follows a gentleman thief named Trilby as he tries to burgle an old country manor, only to end up trapped inside with a bunch of other people and a lurking homicidal being. The following games jump around in space and time, though Trilby does show up again. But they all end having some link to the secret of Defoe Manor. The four games are in order of creation. Five Days a Stranger, Seven Days a Skeptic, Trilby's Notes, and Six Days a Sacrifice. These games are alright, I guess. I played a bit of the first one and it wasn't really my thing to be honest, but they are definitely surreal. Space Kids. I'm so sad I couldn't find a way to play this. Space Kids is an MS-DOS game from 1994. It's a collection of mini-games and plays somewhat similar to WarioWare but without the time limit. Depending on the actions taken in-game, the player can discover multiple branching paths leading to different endings. For example, in one early mini-game, the main characters slide their way down the spaceship's runway and can either land safely at the bottom or fall off, landing in a bag carried by a pirate. Just by looking at this game's art style, you can probably guess why it's on this iceberg. Just look at this mood and guy. 50 Short Games 50 Short Games is a collection of 50 short games made by the Catamites, the people or person, I don't know, that made Goblet Grotto and Space Funeral and a bunch of other games on this iceberg. I can't believe I spent money on this game. Thanks for your help, Patreons, for letting me afford this, this game. 50 Short Games is just what it sounds like. A collection of 50 short and sweet hand-drawn games. Honestly, most of them aren't bad, even though a few of them are unplayable. The person that makes these games are definitely creative. I guess you could say. Cookies. This is our first entry on the iceberg that has a content warning, so yeah, we're finally getting into those games. The content warning by the creator of the iceberg is for drugs, gore, NSFW stuff, and imagery of, um, you know, those, those guys that used to worship that one guy that looked like Charlie Chaplin, and they had that symbol of like the, the Buddhist symbol on like a red flag, and like they fought in World War II and stuff. This game is crazy good. I don't know why I haven't heard of it. Cookies follows five different short stories, presented in the form of a VHS-styled PS1 game. 
playing Cookies, it's really clear that it takes a bunch of inspiration from classic horror titles, such as Candyman and Twin Peaks. The game covers everything from gang violence to drug abuse and all that nice stuff. It has a bunch of satanic cult imagery, and it's done pretty well. I definitely recommend Cookies. I mean, it literally costs nothing to play. Just um, don't don't forget about that content warning. Pennsylvania slash Gigglebone Gang Games. The Gigglebone Gang Games are a series of edutainment CD-ROM games from the mid 90s. The first game in the series was the Gigglebone Gang Pennsylvania. These games are just your standard edutainment games from the 90s, except for one thing: surrealism. These games are just plain weird. I have no idea how someone playing this as a kid was meant to learn anything from it. If anything, it just makes my head hurt. Damn, I've, I've been saying that a lot lately, haven't I? And this is only tier 3. Serial Experiments Lane Serial Experiments Lane is a game made for the PS1 back in 98, based on the anime from the same name. If you've seen the anime, you can probably tell why this game is on the iceberg. The game is super weird. While I haven't seen the anime, I briefly know what it's about. From what I hear, the game is an adaptation and it takes place in its own canon from the anime. The game's pretty unique. It's presented in a way that kind of feels similar to analog horror. Like, you, you constantly flash images and showing different footage and, and stuff to piece the story together. It looks pretty interesting, but I, I might watch the series before I play it. My Toza. My Toza is a fun little game. I think the name is a play on words of mitosis because life, biology, and uh, evolution and stuff. I don't know, I, I dropped out of biology class after the first year. In my toes though, you're confronted with a seed in a dark room. Oh my god, no way. You're able to transform the seed into different things by choosing two different options. From there, you make more choices, trying not to get sent back to the start, and you end up with some, uh, surreal imagery, I guess you could call it. I didn't beat the game because, well, I'm a dumbass. The game has a really cool Adobe Flash player style that's pretty nostalgic. Brings me back to the Newgrounds days. I mean, apparently it's from 2011 and was ported onto Steam just recently, so yeah. If you want to play it, go do it. It's it's free. Endroll. Endroll is an RPG maker horror game from 2016 that was made by the developer Segwa. This game got to me a bit after I realized what it was about and made it a bit hard to get through. If you haven't played Enroll, I definitely recommend you do so because I'm about to spoil most of the plot and the game is definitely best played by going in blind. So yeah, that's my one warning. In Enroll, you play as a 14 year old named Russell as he goes on a journey of self-discovery in the world of his dreams. By playing through his dreams, you eventually find out that Russell murdered both of his parents and a zookeeper, resulting in him being sent to rehabilitation. We find out that he was originally given the death penalty for his crimes, but instead he was used as a test subject for a drug called Happy Dream. The purpose of this drug is to reform criminals and make them feel guilt for their actions by reliving their crimes in a sort of dream sequence. When you play as Russell, it becomes clear that the boy is emotionless and isn't capable of feeling guilt and remorse for his actions, let alone even understanding what the feelings of guilt and remorse are. Russell only has seven days to complete the task that he was challenged with, and if he succeeds, he'll be spared the death penalty and walk out of jail a free boy. Of course, if he fails, he'll die. Not that he really cares one way or another. It's all the same to him, life or death, it's miserable either way. And Roll kinda comes across as a bait and switch, kinda in a similar fashion to games such as Doki Doki Literature Club. If you go into this game blind, you might think it's just another upbeat RPG maker game, but as you make your way through the story, it becomes clear what the plot is actually about. Four Winds Fantasy Four Winds Fantasy is an indie game from 2001 that was first released on Xbox Live. Looking at this game, it's hard to tell whether it's just a shit post or is actually a genuine masterpiece, but once you play it, it's easy to get past the MS Paint graphics and appreciate the game for what it is. Amazing. To be 100% honest, I had no clue what was happening in this game when I played it, but despite the confusion, I still enjoyed the time I put into it. Definitely the best aspect of the game is the music. I mean, just listen to it, it's life-changing to say the least. Despite how epic this game was, I think it made me develop a migraine. I'm not even kidding, I'm, I'm not trying to be quirky and funny, this game literally made my brain feel unhealthy. I feel like this game put my brain cell count into the negatives. 
Strange Telephone. This game is so cool. Strange Telephone is a game from 2016 that was originally a mobile game but was later added to Steam with more content. While a lot of games on this iceberg could be described as inspired by Yume Nikki, the game from Tier 1, I feel like the inspiration for this game is quite apparent. It's definitely inspired by Yume Nikki. The game revolves around a telephone. A strange telephone. You're able to enter any number up to six digits into the telephone, which will give you a set of rooms you can explore within a set time limit. After you run out of time, the game ends and you're sent back to the start of the game with any items that you found along the way. While it may look like one, Strange Telephone isn't much of a walking simulator and more of a puzzle game. To progress through the game, you're encouraged to put in numbers that you find into your telephone to be transported to new areas. In these new areas, you can find items that you can use to open up even more areas to find even more items. The game has more than enough areas to explore that it kinda makes you feel like this game is procedurally generated even though it's not. The game doesn't really have much of a story, but it doesn't really need one. The one goal that the game gives you is to open this giant locked door that sits in the hub room. Once you're eventually able to open it, you'll see one of the 11 endings the game has to offer. Overall, it's a really neat little indie game. The developer of the game has another game coming out called Super Meteor, and it's kind of in the same sort of art style. I'm really looking forward to seeing what other games this developer is going to make. Of the Killer series, these games rock, man. This entry on the iceberg refers to the game series created by Garment District. All the games in the series are named Blank of the Killer, so that's why it's called the Of the Killer series. In these games, you play as a journalist or detective, I couldn't really tell, named BB, as she explores the bizarre and surreal world she lives in while documenting the oddities that she stumbles across for her magazine. These games kind of play like a mix between a walking simulator and a visual novel. The game has a really good atmosphere that somewhat reminds me of those liminal space photos. The art style of these games is also really neat. It uses MS Paint drawings in a 3D space and it's just so cool and unique looking. While it's kind of bizarre and confusing at times, all these games are really well written and have a pretty good sense of humor. For example, in the game called Drool of the killer, you go on a mysterious bus that takes you to a water park named Tammy. Turns out the water park is haunted, and the name of the water park comes from the owner Tammy that drowned to death. While you explore the water park, you get haunted by the ghost of Tammy that constantly tries to drown you. At the end of the game, you walk into a janitor closet, and the main character BB realizes that the pool she has been swimming in the whole time wasn't chlorinated, so she gets mad over the fact that she could have gotten chlamydia or a brain disease from the pool, and she goes sicko mode and kills the water ghost. Yeah, these these games are pretty cool. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden. I don't know why this is so far down. Barkley Shut Up and Jam Gaiden is the unofficial sequel to the 1993 Barkley Shut Up and Jam, a basketball game for the Genesis. Unlike its official predecessor, 2008's Barkley Gaiden is in the form of a JRPG. The game follows basketball player Charles Barkley in the year 2041 in a post-apocalyptic Neo New York. Charles Barkley accidentally performs a powerful chaos dunk at the basketball basketball game, inadvertently killing most of the people in attendance, you know, as one does. As a result, basketball is outlawed, and many basketball players are hunted down and killed. In 2053, another chaos dunk is performed in Manhattan, killing millions. Barkley is blamed for the chaos dunk, and is hunted down by the b-ball removal department, led by the one and only Michael Jordan. From there on, the plot just gets more insane. This game's pretty well known compared to other entries on the tier, so I'm pretty Pretty shocked it's this far down. Puss. Puss is another pretty well known game that's really far down for some reason. Puss is a psychedelic horror puzzle game developed and published by Team Coil in 2018. Puss follows a small orange cat as it travels through various puzzles in 10 levels. If the player accidentally touches the edges of the map, the screen will glitch. If it glitches for too long, the cat will lose one life and will have to restart. This game is essentially just the maze game but with a vaporwave aesthetic. Dead of the Brain. Dead of the Brain is a horror-based point-and-click game created back in 1992. It's a shame I couldn't get this game to run, because it, it does look really cool and I was pretty pumped to play it, but after I downloaded it, I realized that you had to have an emulator to play it, and uh, I couldn't really get that to work. This game was made for the PC-98, a Japanese home computer manufactured back in the late 90s. These computers actually had quite a lot of exclusive games that could only be played on the PC-98 or on an emulator. Looking on the iceberg, there's actually a few other games for the PC-98 
Fantasy 98, so um, I don't know how I'm going to play them. Anyway, uh, enough about old computers. Dead of the Brain follows a guy named Cole, that after doing some experiments with a guy named Dr. Hamilton, they accidentally use that green liquid stuff from the reanimator and begin a zombie outbreak on their city. That's the best description of the game I could get from watching gameplay videos on YouTube. Kitty Horror Show Games This entry on the iceberg refers to the surreal games created by the indie developer Kitty Horror Show. Their games are pretty cool and unique and I definitely recommend checking out their itch.io page. She's most known for her Haunted City series. It's a set of games that contain a collection of these little short games. They're all pretty unique and different from each other, and they're, they're pretty cool. Like a lot of the other entries on this iceberg, her games are a lot more spooky than they are surreal. Alice is Dead Alice is Dead is a Newgrounds game from 2009, developed by the Newgrounds users Impending Riot and Hytosis. If you were around back in the 2012 days of YouTube, there's a good chance you'd probably heard of this game. Alice is Dead is a point-and-click horror game based off the Alice in Wonderland property. Considering how Alice is in the free domain, there's a few entries on this iceberg that are based off it, with American McGee's Alice back in Tier 1 being one of them. Alice is Dead is a spooky spin on the original story in which you wake up in a hole and see that Alice is dead. The point of the game is to figure out who you are and how you got there and how to escape. Due to the game's popularity, mainly from Let's Players on YouTube, several additions were made to the game, expanding on its lore. This series has some pretty deep lore. The creators have actually announced that they're remaking the trilogy in HD on Steam, and if their remake is successful, they'll be able to create an entirely new game that continues the story. It would be pretty cool if it got made. It was pretty nostalgic coming back to this game, and I'm, I'm glad to see that the creators never forgot about it. Tongue of the Fat Man Tongue of the Fat Man, also known as Mondu's Fight Palace, is a 1989 fighting game developed by Activision for the Genesis, Commodore 64, and MS-DOS. This game is fucking insane, I mean just look at this guy. The game's pretty unique compared to other fighting games, not just graphic wise, but also gameplay wise. Unlike other fighting games, Tongue of the Fat Man has a currency system where you can bet on fights in the game and earn money to spend on items that you can take into battle. This game is honestly really solid and underrated, but due to its bizarre nature, many game journalists put the game's art before the gameplay and give it a bad rating. When Tongue of the Fat Man was released, it was pretty well received but in recent years, it's come under a bunch of criticism. According to PC Gamer, Tongue of the Fat Man is ranked as one of the worst games of all time, which when comparing it to other games on this iceberg, that is pretty far from the truth. Hylix 2, baby! I know I say this a lot, but this game is one of, if not the best game I have ever played. This game is such a hidden gem. It's, it's so shocking to me that a lot of people I talk to haven't even heard of it. I really want to make a video about the Hylix games because they're really special to me and I could talk about them for hours but for now I'll just give you a quick description so this video isn't three hours long. I feel like the Hilux games are the perfect examples in proving that video games are art. Much like the first game, Hilux 2 uses a beautiful mix of claymation and 3D scanning to make one of the best art styles I have ever seen in a game. The graphics in this game are a lot more three-dimensional than the first game, with the game allowing you to traverse in a more non-linear space with platforms and the like. Not only does this game look and play great, but it sounds great too. The music for this game feels like it could have come from a 90s indie rock band, but in a, in a good way. Every track in this game is a certified banger. Just like the first game, Hylix 2 plays like a JRPG, but the combat and gameplay is a lot more in-depth than your usual RPG maker game. The story in Hylix isn't really the main focus, and while it has one, it's just used as a means of allowing you to explore the game's surreal world and meet new characters. I could keep going on about this game, but I honestly think it's best if you experience it for yourself. Just go play it. Red Tape Red Tape is yet another PS1-styled horror game developed by Polaris Studios in 2021. The game is more funny than it is surreal. The game's plot revolves around you making your way through a corporate office in Hell, named Hell Inc., while getting signatures and approval to make your way to the next level of Hell to meet the devil. I wasn't paying much attention at the beginning, and I thought I was, like, getting these documents signed so I could get approval to enter Hell, because, like, maybe I died or something. 
but the ending is not what I expected. After getting the devil's son to sign your document, it turns out you're the representative of an oil company and have come to meet the devil to buy hell so you can mine its oil reserves. After the devil's son signs the contract without looking, Mega Oil Co buys hell and demolishes all of the buildings so that they can mine the oil, which ends up putting all of the demons working at Hell Inc out of a job. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't really... I wasn't really expecting that. Life Tastes Like Cardboard Life Tastes Like Cardboard is a pretty unique walking simulator, developed by Demenza in 2019. This game is so much better than it looks. Going onto the game Steam page, I was really put off by the lackluster description and the shoddy looking screenshots, but once I loaded up the game and became immersed in the story, I could not stop playing. In Life Tastes Like Cardboard, you play as a guy named John as he copes with self-pity and the boredom of everyday life. You control John as he has a lucid dream, reliving events from his past while he makes his way through a surreal dream space. This game is really relatable and if you're watching this video, you could probably relate to it too. Just the repetitiveness of each day, going to school, coming home and playing games, going to sleep, waking up to go to school and just repeating the same task every day. Just like for the main character in the game. Lucid dreaming and just dreaming in general is a nice way to get away from life. If you think you can relate to this, I definitely recommend checking it out. A Date in the Park. A Date in the Park is a Brazilian FMV point and click adventure game from 2014, developed by Cloak and Dagger Games. In A Date in the Park, you go on a date in a park. You play as a British guy named Lou, living in Brazil when he meets a lady at a bar who wants to go on a date in the park. After wandering around the park for a bit, adopting an injured duckling and thinking you've been stood up, you go to the meeting spot of the date and find a box sitting on the bench. The box is from your date and she wants to play a game to see if you can find her. After answering a bunch of her riddles, you stumble across another one of her boxes. After opening the box, you find a, a, a severed head. Yeah, it, it turns out your date is a serial killer. After after going back to the entrance of the park, you find the body belonging to the head in the box. Understandably, the police have been called and have just arrived. A policeman shouts demands at Lou, but considering he can't speak Portuguese, he just willingly puts his hands up. After the baby duckling from earlier bites him, he reaches his hand into his jacket and gets shot by the policeman. Oh, sh oh shit, look, look behind you, dude. Damn, I guess that was, um, a date. A Date in the Park, Tetrageddon. Tetrageddon, also called Tetrageddon Games, is more of a website than it is a game. Going onto the game's itch.io page and downloading the game brings you to tetrageddon.com. This website is quite the rabbit hole, to say the least. By clicking on different things, you get sent to more web pages where you can click on even more things and go to even more web pages to click on even more stuff. The game, or should I say website, kept trying to download audio files to my computer over and over again, which was a bit of annoying. The game is uh, it's quite interesting, just don't visit it if you have epilepsy. No. That's probably not a good idea. This is Infinity. This is Infinity is a really abstract game from 2009, created for the Ludum Dare 16. I didn't know before researching this that the Ludum Dare was that old. If you don't know what the Ludum Dare is, it's basically a game jam that lets anyone participate. According to the creator, This is Infinity is about exploring rules, graphics, goals, behavior, and interaction. In the creator's bio on cactusquid.com, he says a lot of the games on his site are just small experiments dressed up as games, and uh, yeah, this is definitely one of them. I played it for about 5 minutes or so, and had to stop to prevent myself from having a stroke. There seems to be a lot of games on this iceberg that are aiming to give me an epileptic attack. Ivan Zanotti's Games This entry on the iceberg refers to the games created by Ivan Zanotti on Game Jolt. One of his games was mentioned on this iceberg already, called I'm Scared. It was on Tier 2, I think. Most of the games he makes are quite similar to I'm scared in the sense that they're very surreal and a, a bit spooky. Ivan's pretty well known in the community as he's very open to answering questions and, and talking to fans about the games he makes. He's a pretty cool dude and you should definitely check out his game job page if you like surreal games and you like shitting yourself. Suits Absolute Power Suits Absolute Power is the sequel to the game back in tier 2. Suits 
a business RPG. Like the first game, it's a turn-based RPG with a unique hand-drawn style. Also like the first game, this title definitely needs a lot more attention driven to it. When researching the game before I played it, I was honestly shocked to see the lack of people that have covered it. Every second of this game is more memorable than the last. After beating Absolute Power, I'm pretty surprised that this game isn't more popular. This game is the perfect example of what a sequel should be. It expands on the first game on such an extreme level. The story is way more compelling and in depth than the first and the writing is insanely good also the music is so good it's worth buying the game just to listen to it suits is by far one of my favorite indie game series and it really deserves a lot more recognition i'm not gonna talk about the plot or anything just go go play it play it please happy world Happy World is a surreal adventure game from 2018 created by JMass. In Happy World, you play as this blue disc thing and you roll around, restoring happiness to people that are infested with negative energy. The game's art and music is really neat, kind of reminding me of Katamari Damacy somewhat. After a bit, the game starts to get not so happy and gets a bit spooky, and the sudden tone shift is pretty well done. After playing the games on the iceberg, I'm kinda getting sick of games that look like they're super fun and upbeat and happy, and then after I play the game for like 10 minutes I realise that it's a horror game and I end up shitting myself. You know, it'd, it'd be nice to play a happy game for once. Happy game. Oh god. <laughs> Finally. Finally a happy game I can play to get my mind off of these pieces of nightmare fuel. God fucking damn it, fucking hate this iceberg. Can I please just get a break? Jesus Christ. Happy Game is a horror adventure game developed by Amanita Design in 2021. The plot follows a little kid as he falls asleep to a horrific nightmare. The objective of the game is to make your way through these nightmares by completing these pretty unique puzzles as a means of making the boy happy again. The game has some pretty cool art and each puzzle in the game is super unique and satisfying to complete. Just don't know why it's so far down though, it's it's pretty well known. Trio the Punch. Trio the Punch is an arcade game created by Data East back in 1990 and was then re-released in 2007 as a part of a collection of arcade games for the PS2. Trio the Punch plays like a beat-em-up where you're able to choose from three playable characters, hence the name Trio the Punch. While the game looks like a pretty standard beat-em-up where you scroll from left to right beating up a bunch of guys, this game is pretty unique. The company Data East did the thing back in the late 80s and 90s where they would go through a bunch of their old games and parody them. This game does not take itself seriously at all, which is honestly a breath of fresh air when you play a arcade beat em up. Gabal Screen Gabor Screen is a 1996 PS1 game created by the music label Antino's Records. Yep, this is a PS1 game created by a Japanese record label on the surreal game iceberg. I didn't think I'd ever have to say that sentence. While looking at the gameplay of this game, you wouldn't be mistaken if you thought it was LSD Dream Emulator. These games share some striking similarities, but then again, I guess every surreal PS1 game kind of looks like this. The game is hosted by and I didn't know this before researching. Tetsuya Komuro. If you're into Japanese pop or Japanese music in general, it's pretty likely that you've at least heard of this guy. He used to be a pretty successful songwriter and music producer back in the day, and is widely regarded to be one of the most influential figures in pop throughout the 1990s. I, I can't believe he, 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 hosted, he hosted the game. Anyway. Gabor Screen is a surreal adventure game hosted by Tetsuya Komuro in which the player can travel around different places using a flying shoe and in each place they go they can interact with objects and people to gain all the CDs of that place. After you collect a set of CDs, the correlating song will be able to be played back in the hub area. It's honestly a pretty cool game and I'm quite shocked I've never heard of it. The tomatoes are okay. The Tomatoes Are Okay is a horror game created by Dan Sanderson in 2017. I couldn't really tell what was happening in the game because of this obnoxious VHS filter, but I'll do my best to describe it. You start out on a farm and go check if your tomatoes are okay. After getting a trophy and getting a pig, we walk into the store and get sent into the back rooms. After clicking a bunch of buttons and dimension hopping, we end up being chased by a stick figure thing. After getting jump scared a bunch by the stick figure thing, the game ends. Um, cool. Next game, Murder Dog. 
4. This game is so epic. It's another entry on the iceberg made by my favorite surreal game developer, the Catamites. Oh my god, they, they get, their games are just so epic. I'm gonna be using some footage from YouTube from this guy, because when, when I tried to play it, it looked like this for some reason. Murder Dog 4 follows the trial of the century. The trial of the murder dog. Murder Dog is on the trial for crimes against humanity. He murdered some people or something. I, I don't know. I, I wasn't able to play it. The Astonishing Captain Skull. This is another game made by the Catamites. So yeah, it's also pretty epic. I, I love their game so much. They, they just make a bunch of claymation animations and they, they put them into a venture game studio and make a game out of them. It's, it's so cool. This is the second game in the Captain Skull series. The first one didn't make the iceberg, unfortunately. The game follows Captain Skull and his friend Quimby, or something, as they go to a space bunker to investigate a murder by a ghost. If the gameplay you're seeing now looks cool, go play it, but if not, that's okay. While the choppiness in these games can be charming, it's obviously not for everyone. Mouth Sweet Mouth Sweet is an RPG Maker game developed by Love Games in 2016. This is one of the better RPG Maker games I've played. Both the cool graphics and unique battle system make it hard to tell that this game was even made an RPG Maker. In Mouth Sweet, you play as Hass, a new hire to the company CC and C. The bulk of the game focuses around you completing mundane tasks around the office while shooting invisible ghost men in the hallways. The message of this game hits pretty hard and it's one that I think a lot of people can relate to. The game perfectly encapsulates what it's like to work in a toxic environment and be abused by the higher ups in the office. Like, it's it's kind of scary how accurate this game is, you know, beside the shooting and invisible people in the hallways with revolver and all the head exploding stuff. Swallow the Sea. Swallow the Sea is a pretty cool game made by It's Tatalia in 2020. In Swallow the Sea, you play as this little fish egg embryo thing on the ocean floor and your goal is to eat other egg things so that you can get bigger and reach the next area. It plays a lot like that game Tasty Planet. If, if you've played it then you'll know exactly what I mean. After getting to a certain size, the embryo breaks out of this egg and the screen goes black. Afterwards we see a conveyor belt littered with dead fish and stuff. Turns out the whole time you were inside of a dead sea creature on the conveyor belt in some fish factory you weren't in the ocean. The ending's kinda sad, right? as soon as this little orange guy gets out of his egg, he gets squashed by a hydraulic press. Rekinder. Rekinder is a remake of the 2003 RPG Maker game, Kinder, made by Horofuki Yoko Chow. The game isn't anything special, it's just your average Japanese spooky shock RPG Maker game. Despite it being a remake, it still looks like it was made with clip art from Microsoft PowerPoint, and the translation is not quite there. Don't get me wrong, it's definitely not the worst RPG Maker game I've played, but it's definitely up there. In Rekinder, you play as a third grader named Shinuki that's just returned to his hometown after staying at his grandma's house. But the town is not the same as it was when he left. It's now a ruined town of death. Ooh. Skin Crawlers. Skin Crawlers is a horror game made in 2020 by Leaky Fingers for the Haunted Hunting Jam, a game jam where developers would make a horror game based around the theme of hunting. In Skin Crawlers, you play as a TV spider thing in an endless web covered void. The goal is to collect five different TV channel signals by hunting down other TVs with signals. While there's not much to it, it's still a fun little game that was made in a month for a game jam. It's pretty fun and interesting. There's so many questions, like why is this man on the TV yelling? Why why is my TV spitting out webs? And why why does it have spider legs? We may never know. No Love. No Love is an RPG made by Wallace Lovecraft in 2019. For some reason, when I bought the game on itch.io, I got it for 3 bucks, but when I checked it a few days later, it increased to 17 bucks. I don't know, maybe, maybe it was on sale or something, probably. I, I don't really pay attention to that stuff. 
No Love is described as a hard sci-fi fantasy hand-drawn RPG with a unique original story that's mainly about the characters and it delves into topics regarding the human condition. Like a lot of RPGs on this iceberg, the best aspect of it is the story. This game is super interesting and the stories hooked me in and I couldn't stop playing it. The game consists of you exploring different areas, having a boss fight and watching a cutscene and then re repeating that. The characters in the game are written pretty well and it made sitting through all of the dialogue pretty fun. Also the art style is just really cool looking, go, go, go check it out, it's a good game, go, go play it. Atoll, The Last Ghost Atoll The Last Ghost is a short horror game made by Nikolay Shaludev for the 2021 Brackies Game Jam. This game is so more than I could have expected. While it's not long, it's still really good for what, what the game has to offer. Atoll is a point and click game where you make your way through a few areas, picking up ghosts to join your team and discovering items. While exploring, you have to fight these evil spirits that get in your way. Once you clear out this abandoned lab place, you make your way to a destroyed city. It turns out that the world is overrun by evil spirits, and only you know how to stop them. You have the option of either continuing to fight the spirits, or sacrificing all the ghosts in your team to close the portal to the ghost world. Apparently, the game has six different endings but that's just the one I got. I don't know what it is about this game but I, I really like it. Bowler. Bowler is a game about a guy with a hat and other stuff too. The guy that made this game was definitely partaking in black tar heroin when he made it. In Bowler you play as this little green guy in a bowler hat. You're in this like fighting tournament or something where you gotta blow your opponent off the stage before they do. After blowing four different opponents, no, not, not, not like that, you end up talking to this top hat guy who sends you to a place called the warp. And uh, yeah, uh, I don't, I don't like it. But, but it's all cool though, because this guy is gonna tell us how to leave. Ah oh boy, Paradigm. Paradigm is a surreal adventure game created by Jacob Janurka in 2017. I think I remember watching PewDiePie play this back in the day, and I thought this game was pretty cool. In Paradigm, you play as a mutant named Paradigm, as you explore around a surreal post-apocalyptic Eastern European country. Paradigm is being cyberbullied by this genetically engineered sloth with a Donald Trump wig, and our goal is to stop the guy. That's uh pretty much the plot. I love the music in the game, it's it's really atmospheric and I, I don't know what it is but it kind of gives me a weird feeling. The game's pretty epic, I mean you can say hello to every interactable object in the game, so very, very cool. Remember Places? Remember Places is a horror game from a 2020 game jam made by Bruce Butcher. In Remember Places, you are locked inside a room with a sign telling you not to leave with the only thing you can interact with being a computer. The only thing that's keeping your mind sane while being trapped is an AI inside your computer. The game is really cool for only being made in 4 days, and was honestly really interesting. A pretty cool concept. Crazy boss. I like how the creator of the iceberg says in the entry's description that this thing is the bare minimum of being a game, and after looking at some gameplay I completely agree with them. Crazy boss is an unlicensed in quotation marks game launched in 2004 for the Sega Genesis by Tom Cripps. In Crazy Boss, you can do things such as move forward, move backwards, and also, get this, honk the horn. If that's not in-depth gameplay, then I don't know what is. Why is this on the iceberg? It's not even a game. Get, get this shit out of here. Necro Passaria. Necro Passaria is a creepy point-and-click flash game series where you play as a guy named Johnny Boy and you explore the dark world of Necro Passaria. I played part one and it was quite confusing. I had to refuel my generator so I could watch TV. Also, my generator was a giant head. This game's art is pretty cool, I guess, but other than that, the, the game isn't anything too special. I'm so thankful thankful for the ruffle emulator. If it wasn't for the preservation of all of these flash games, a large portion of games on this iceberg would be playable. So um, yeah. Also, <laughs> cock. Karim Bowler. 
Carambola is another point and click game made by Holy Pangolian in 2017. To be honest, I had no idea what was happening in this game, but I guess that's sort of my fault for having brain damage. Despite my confusion, this game is really great and I, I loved every second of it. The art is just mwah. The puzzles in this game are satisfying and are actually really challenging. I got stuck a bunch on some, but once I completed them it was just so satisfying. Lost. Lost is an RPG maker horror game made by Cest Redata in 2018. The game's plot is the following. After wandering aimlessly in a seemingly empty world, a young man finds a key laying abandoned on a path, as well as an arrangement of structures, all requiring a specific key to access them. Despite what's all there to explore and interact with, the keys are the main gateway to progress, and the flowers are optional prizes. I didn't play this game for long, but the, the atmosphere was really on point and the, the music was just oh, it really tickled that itch in my brain. Small Talk. Small Talk is an interactive exploration game made by Pale Room on itch.io. I couldn't find a download link for the game and when I go on the itch.io page it says it was published in 2017 but somehow is still in development. After clicking the sign me up button I was brought to a error 404 page. After looking at the screenshots and the trailer I, I gotta say this game looks pretty epic. The art and the animation just looks so great and I'm, I'm really pumped for when it comes out. The Sea Will Claim Everything The Sea Will Claim Everything is a point-and-click adventure game developed by Jonas Kriatis in 2016. Um, this game is okay, I guess. I just don't really think the art style is for me. It, it kind of hurts my eyes. The plot of the game is pretty complex for what it is. It revolves around a portal or something being opened to this world, and um, it's called the Underhome, and people are trying to save it or something. I don't According to the creator, the game is inspired by the Greek government debt crisis, so um... There's that. Vangers. This game is so good. Vangers is a game developed by KD Lab in 1998. Vangers is a mind altering sandbox game that can be described as a racing role playing adventure game with a very complicated storyline. The best way to explain this game is um, think of think of Mad Max, but with bug human hybrid people. The amount of lore and world building this game has to offer completely blew my mind. You could literally play this game for hundreds of hours and still have to go back and replay it to understand some stuff. Also the music and the atmosphere is just amazing. It reminds me a little bit of Hylix. Also the, the game's on Steam now so uh, yeah go go play it. Meat Shift. Meat Shift is a short horror game made by the Rat King Collective in 2020. Meat Shift is a narrative game that takes place in the grimy halls of a slaughterhouse and meat packaging facility. You play through a guy's first shift in the slaughterhouse. You start off cutting open pigs and grinding meat but but after a while things start to get a bit weird. After you try and unclog the meat grinder, your hands get stuck and you lose some of your fingers. Apparently that is against protocol for some reason, I'm not too sure why. And the manager lady is now hunting us down. After she puts us underneath the slaughterhouse, uh, the ending shows your character jumping into a meat grinder while a clone of yourself lines up behind you, showing that the game takes place in a never ending loop. I think maybe the game is like a critique of the meat industry or something, I'm, I'm not sure. The ending kind of confused me. It's, it's a pretty cool game though. Samaros 1. This entry refers to the first game in the Samaros series, a set of puzzle point and click adventure games created in Adobe Flash by Amanita Design. The first game, Samaros 1, was released in 2003, and two more sequels have since been made. This game is really weird looking, and it, it kind of gave me the heebie-jeebies. There's something about the old Flash games that use real life photos as models. They just really creep me out for some reason. I, I don't know, it's probably just me. In Samaros, you play as a gnome that spots a planet moving towards his home planet. The gnome goes to the planet, and after exploring and seeing a bunch of surreal stuff, he finds the engine room and changes the planet's course so it narrowly misses his home planet. While I guess some people might like this sort of game, I kind of just hate this art style with a passion, and it really just creeps me out. It's more, it's more uncanny than it is surreal. Nightmare, 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 nightmare. Nightmare is a surreal first person shooter created by the Strangest IO in 2020. Nightmare is a dystopian FPS.
Yes, where you take control of a machine angel to incinerate hordes of synthetic demons. At first glance, Nightmare might just look like Doom, but with graphics that were made by a homeless man on black tie heroin, but after playing it, it's definitely more than that. I'm sorry if I keep using the word black tie heroin in these videos, I must have like an addiction or something. A an addiction to saying the word, not, not an addiction to black tie heroin. I gotta stop saying that word or I'll get a strike on my channel. Anyway, Nightmare does what Cruelty Squad from Tier 2 tried to do. Be a good game. No, I'm just, I'm just kidding. It, it wasn't that bad. Nightmare is essentially Quake Pro Tournament with roguelike elements and surreal 90s Japan inspired graphics. The game absolutely rocks and is one of the better games I've played on this tier. I I'm really glad I checked it out. The Tender Cut. This game, I think, refers to the game by No on Game Jolt. When I clicked on the link on the iceberg, it linked me to a unbought domain. So I'm gonna go out on a limb here and say that this is the game that the iceberg creator was referring to. This is another game I remember from the YouTube Let's Player days, so when I saw the name on the iceberg, I instantly recognized it. This game really got to me, and I'll tell you why. I'm really desensitized to a lot of stuff, like extreme gore and things like that, so a lot of these games on the iceberg have been a breeze to play, cause, well, nothing can faze me anymore. However, I'm not able, nor will I ever be able to do with anything that has to do with eyes. And uh, this game is known for a certain scene where a certain someone's eye is uh, cut open. Yeah, this, this game really fucked me up. I had to stop playing it or I literally would have had a brain aneurysm. I got the ending with the eye and I stopped right there. I didn't really want to continue. David Lynch Teaches Typing. David Lynch Teaches Typing is a 2018 typing game made by Rhino Stew. In the game, the famous filmmaker David Lynch teaches typing. That's that's about it. Number 12. My nuts. Why are they so goddamn itchy? Nah, I'm, I'm, I'm joshing you, man. This, this game is spooky. It's a pretty standard typing simulator until David Lynch tells you to put your left pinky on, on the bug nest next to your keyboard, and then the game glitches and plays a minute long video of disturbing imagery. It's a it's a great game in my opinion. Time is solid here. This game is really sick. So you know those weird looking images you see on Twitter that are made by AI? <laughs> they, they sure are terrifying, right? Now, um, make a game out of art made by an AI. Je Jesus fucking Christ. This game is super neat. I, I just love the concept of wandering around an art gallery and interacting with weird looking AI people. Also the soundtrack, it's it's amazing. Just beautiful. Mwah. 10 out of 10. Milk outside a bag of milk outside a bag of milk. Milk outside a bag of milk outside a bag of milk is the sequel to the game mentioned earlier in the tier called Milk Inside a Bag of Milk Inside a Bag of Milk. I want to fucking kill myself. While the first game was really short and just showed the story of a very mentally ill girl struggling to buy some milk, the second game goes a lot more in depth into her character and is a lot longer. This game is such a good example of how to do a sequel to a game that doesn't have much content. The graphics are so much more detailed, the story is so much more in depth, and the writing along with the music are just perfect. I might have had a little bit of bias because I did play this game before I played the first one and I, I really enjoyed this one a lot more. This game has over 8,000 positive reviews on Steam for a reason. This game is really good. The game has a really accurate portrayal of mental illness and trauma and how it can affect someone's everyday life. The realism in this game kind of makes me question the developer of the game. Like either he's a psychiatrist or something or he's gone through some serious shit because the depiction of mental illness in this game is spot on. Even more so than the first game. Also, the, the game made me cry a little bit, so um, yeah, bo bonus points for that. Hypnagogia Boundless Dreams. Hypnagogia Boundless Dreams is a PS1 starred walking simulator developed by Soda Raptor in 2021. Hypnagogia is a solo developed exploration game that takes players on a journey through a series of mystifying dream sequences, each with their own unique theme and visual style. This game is super cool. While it's a lot like the other exploration games, on this iceberg, this one just hits different. The atmosphere and the music is just on point, and this game makes exploring areas feel less like a chore, and more like something you want to do, unlike a lot of other walking simulators I've covered so far. The main thing that sets this game apart from other walking simulators definitely has to be the well done puzzles. They're, they're just so satisfying.
satisfying. Also, all of the hidden secrets and surprises you find in the game are just, they're great. In Boundless Dreams, you're not just walking around aimlessly through a surreal and bizarre world. You have well thought out objectives and take advantage of different playstyles and gimmicks. It's overall one of the better walking simulators I've played. How Fish is Made in a, in a factory, you, you fucking idiot. How Fish is Made is a short horror game published by Castriga in January of 2022. In How Fish is Made, you play as a sardine that has been swallowed by a giant mechanical fleshy creature inhabited by other sardines. At the beginning of the game, you meet a fish that tells you you gotta make a decision between going up or going down. It's the decision that everyone that enters needs to make. Throughout the game, we see a large variety of fish. Some are confused on what direction to choose, and some are very confident in their choice, and some are just trying to escape the situation, or just learn more about it. Once at the end of the game, you have the choice of either going down and becoming a sandwich to be eaten, or by going up and becoming a part of this giant fleshy mass for the rest of eternity. I feel like the message the game is trying to get across is the message of sticking to what you think is right and deciding things for yourself. Although I, I could be wrong about that, the game and its two endings are pretty, pretty cryptic. Buzzkill. This entry refers to the three-part series of visual novel hybrid games created by Permafried Games on itch.io. I played the first game in this series and um, I got, I got no, I got no words. I have absolutely no idea what the game is about. I think it's a it's about a fly that runs a bar and uh, people come into the bar and they commit not alive on themselves and the, the fly guy is actually dreaming the whole time or something. I don't know, this 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 game is this game is arse. It's diarrhea doo doo. The white chamber. The White Chamber is a science fiction adventure game created by Studio Trophies in 2005. In The White Chamber, you play as a girl that awakens in a coffin in a dark room with no memory of how she got there. After opening the room's windows, the girl realizes that she's in space. The gameplay revolves around the player going room to room solving puzzles to find out what happened to the crew of the space station. The game has some really solid puzzles and the writing and the, the way the game's twists are shown, they're very well done and they're pretty surprising. It's a really great game and is definitely one of the better point and click horror games on the iceberg. Pen Pals. Pen Pals is a surreal adventure game made by Maroon Raccoon back in 2013. Pen Pals is a game where you have to find your mum while being accompanied by your abusive friend called Pal. In the start, you're really bored, so you go talk to your dad, but he's busy watching Static on the TV. You and your friend Pal go on an epic journey to pick your drunk mum up from a nightclub and bring her home. There was something pretty sad about this game, probably both the story combined with the, the music, it made me feel some things. The game is pretty short, only taking about 10 minutes, but despite its abrupt ending, it's still pretty good. All of our friends are dead. All of Our Friends Are Dead is a classic indie horror platformer made by Amon26 in 2014. The game is a really disturbing run and gun platformer that kind of feels like what it would be to play Metroid after you take 50 Benadryls. Trust me, I, 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 know, I know from experience. This game has some of the most unsettling imagery and music in any game on this iceberg so far, and um, that that really says a lot. Like, this game, this game really does not make any sense. Maybe I'm just dumb, and I don't get the meaning behind a lot of the games on the iceberg, but this game, man, I, what the fuck is happening? They Speak From The Abyss They Speak From The Abyss is a psychological horror dungeon crawler created by Nikki Cowper. The link on the iceberg led me to the game's itch.io page, but for some reason it's either been taken down or made private by the creator. Apparently the game is set to release on Steam pretty soon, so maybe that was the reason behind its disappearance. Also, there's a Kickstarter for the game that has made $26,000 from its original $20,000 goal, which is a pretty, pretty good sign. The Steam page does have a demo available, so I presume the original upload of the game on HIO was just the demo. After playing through the demo, uh, I gotta say this, this game is really cool. It's essentially a dungeon crawler that plays a lot like the Shin Megami Tensei games for the SNES. The music is just so off-putting, yet 
calming and the characters you meet and the areas you explore are really disturbing. I, I, I can't wait to see the full game. I really hope it does well. Game Dog. Game Dog is a mobile game created by definitely the most prominent developer in the iceberg so far, the Catamites. Game Dog is a mini game collection based on the fictional handheld game console called the Game Dog. The console features dating sims, RPGs, sport games, all games that everyone is familiar with. Except, something is wrong with these games. Some of the games in the collection are just playable enough that you can imagine them being a real game played by real people. Other games are, I guess you could say, surreal. Rat Chaos Rat Chaos is a 2012 browser game created by the developer Winter Lake. The game is a choose your own adventure type experience where the game gives you a picture of your surroundings with a prompt and you get to pick between different options in order to get the best ending. The game is pretty cool for a browser game and I was surprised with the number of endings you can get. I honestly couldn't have asked for a better game. Rat Chaos is a masterpiece that should be remembered throughout the ages. They grew lungs and Drowned. They Grew Lungs and Drowned is a first person horror game made by Supposedly Spooky in May of 2022. It's a bit hard to understand what this game is about, but despite my confusion, it was still pretty interesting. In They Grew Lungs and Drowned, you explore this hospital in a desert place underwater, walking into a bunch of uh, quirky people. There's no real objective in the game, you just walk around talking to people and moving to the next area. The game is pretty spooky at times and the art style is really cool, but honestly when compared to other walking simulators on this list, it's kinda just eh. Don't get me wrong, it's not a bad game or anything, it's just a bit forgettable. Saya no Uta Saya no Uta is a psychological horror game made by Nitroplus in 2003. Holy shit, this game is gory. After playing all the games on this iceberg, I thought I'd get used to all the gratuitous gore but I guess I'm not. This game is a pretty standard Japanese visual novel game where you play as a medical student whose life is ruined once he and his parents are involved in a car accident. With his five senses becoming distorted from the crash, he perceives his environment and people as hideous lumps of flesh and intestines. Spoken words sound like grunts and screeches. Regular meals taste and smell awful, and his sense of touch is also impaired. After going to the hospital following a fall into deep depression, he meets a pretty girl named Saya that turns out to be a horrific monster whose appearance drives people mad. With this premise, you can probably see why this game is so surreal and disturbing. The game has some pretty good writing, but overall the story is pretty unique and interesting. Definitely the most disturbing visual novel I've played so far. I'm hoping, I'm hoping that doesn't change. Acho Anarchy H.O. Anarchy is a 1995 shoot-em-up developed by NCS for the PC Engine CD. The game's title translates to Super Big Brother of Love. The game's plot takes place three years after the defeat of Emperor Bote, and the universe is now at peace. However, Bote's wife, Empress Body Conscious, has already planned her revenge. She revives Bote's builder army and kidnaps the hero Idaten, threatening the galaxy once again. Adon and Samson, with the help of Ben 10, take it upon themselves to save the galaxy and rescue their friend. With that description of the plot and the gameplay you're seeing on screen right now, you can probably tell why it's on the iceberg. Unfortunately, due to the game only being available for the PC engine, and the fact that emulation is illegal in Australia, and I don't have $500 to fork out on a PC engine, I'm not able to play the game. I don't know if I should feel relieved about that or not. Captain Blood series. This entry refers to the French game series from 1986, titled Captain Blood. The first game was released on the Atari ST and then the rest of the series eventually came to home computers. The series follows a 1980s game developer that while testing one of his new projects for the first time, gets warped inside the spaceship of the game he had designed. The story follows the game developer traveling around the universe, killing clones of himself that were made in a hyperspace accident. Despite the first game being a really solid title and having pretty unique gameplay for its time, the Captain Blood series never really gained the recognition it deserved and remains a pretty unknown cult classic. 
Roly Poly Games. This entry on the list refers to the partially lost edutainment games created by Roly Poly Games in 1997. The two games that they made were Roly Poly's Nan Karobi Yalki and Roly Poly's World Tour. According to the Lost Media Wiki, the reason these games are only partially lost is because copies of both games are confirmed to exist but are very hard to come by. Whenever listing for the games become available on Japanese retail sites, they instantly sell and have not yet been made available to the general public. I know for a fact that there are some download links in places of the internet, but from what I can tell, the game is unplayable, even when run in a virtual machine. It's so sad we may never be able to experience Roly Poly. Just look how epic this looks. Mondo Medicals Mondo Medicals is an indie puzzle game developed by Jonathan Soderstrom in 2007. In the opening of the game, a character greets the protagonist who is stated to have applied to participate in researching the cure for cancer. The gameplay involves the player completing puzzle solving challenges to get to the next room. Doing so often involves deliberately disobeying instructions and thinking outside of the box. The endings are also pretty cool but still very confusing. Apparently this is how you cure cancer. I guess. Damn, that's crazy. The Dream of Yourself The Dream of Yourself is a spooky walking simulator created by Big ETI in 2021. In The Dream of Yourself, you adventure inside a huge tunnel that's kind of fleshy and gross and kind of looks like the inside of a person. The walls often flash yellow and red, but get brighter and brighter. The only real goal of the game is to keep moving forward and trying to find new passageways so as to not stop your journey. While the game doesn't really have combat or anything, you do eventually meet these giant eyes that move through the tunnels and will restart your game if you come into contact with them. It's a really cool game and after after playing it, it's pretty obvious that the game is much deeper than it looks. However, I'm definitely not smart enough to figure out what its meaning is. Architect Saga. This entry refers to the game series created by Yes Very Much. The two games in the series are these experimental walking simulators that are meant to give the player a taste of what it's like to live in the fictional Architect's city. While I didn't get to the second one, after playing the first game in the series, I was really surprised at how good it is. The world building and atmosphere just feels so detailed, and it's clear that these games were made with a lot of love. With plans for a third game, I definitely recommend checking out these games. They're not very well known and definitely deserve more attention. Endocopia. Endocopia is a really cool horror point and click adventure game developed by Andy Wan and is set to release in the near future. While the game isn't out yet, there is a demo available on the itch.io page that I played. The game has quite a lot of followers with its kickstarter raising over 50,000 big ones with a goal of only 20. After playing the demo, I gotta say, this game is phenomenal. I honestly think that when this game gets released, it's going to be the next big thing. Sort of like how Undertale was. I mean, it's got the music, the humor, the story, the art, the combat. This game is so good. This game is really unique, and it combines my favorite aspects of all of my favorite genres. I can 100% say that this game is going to be massive when it comes out, and when it does, I'm totally here for it. If this kind of game looks good to you, go play the demo. And if it impresses you like it did to me, go support their Kickstarter. This game is going to be huge. We are now at the fourth tier. As you might guess, the entries in the rest of these tiers are very obscure and wacky, and they get a bit disturbing at times. This is the only warning I'll be making. Some of the games are quite messed up. Madden Genesis is a game made by Blomko, a developer we saw back in tier 3. This guy makes some really good games. I mean, every single one is a banger. Like the masterpiece that is Embunkalaf Lumbulus or Thanksgiving Feast. I am very thankful. Just like his other games, Madden Genesis is perfect. The goal of the game is to train your hardest in order to win the big game that's coming up. You partake in some classic football exercises, such as pump iron, pass football, run, fish, and drink Gatornade. After making our way through some extensive training, we are finally ready for the big game. After putting our training to the test, we end up fighting the goalkeeper, and uh, yeah, he 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 breaks our leg. But it's all right. There's a there's a halftime music performance. After snapping our leg back into place, removing our concussions, and having a childhood flashback, we are ready to take on the goalkeeper. 
once again. This time we go supersonic and completely beat the out of him till he dies. And then we win the big game. But it turns out our coach is actually our dad and he bet money on us to die and now he hates us. What? This game is uh, very illogical indeed. The Illogical Journey of the Zambonis is a game jolt game made by the developer Noib. The game follows the very depressing tale of the Zambonis as they're forced to leave their land and take the dangerous journey into a utopia named Zamboniville. I had to google this but apparently a Zamboni is one of those things you see on ice hockey fields. I never knew what these things were called but I, I was not expecting them to be called a Zamboni. This game is uh, very, very depressing and gets surprisingly philosophical. As you progress on the Zamboni's journey, countless innocent Zamboni lives are lost for no reason other than chance. Once you finally reach Zamboniville, it turns out that it's overrun by humans, the people that originally made the Zambonis leave the utopia in the first place. After arriving, the two surviving Zambonis are killed at gunpoint by the humans. Yikes. I think, I think, I think I need a minute. Super Mario Death Row is a game that I was not expecting to see in this iceberg, to be quite honest. The game revolves around a, a fictional Nintendo Direct in which Nintendo plans to livestream Mario's execution. Honestly, I could see this really happening. You get taken from your cell and are taken to Princess Peach. On the way, you can admire some of the lovely paintings that are on display in the castle, such as Mario at E3 2020. And of course, uh, the, the iconic Super Mario OSHA violation. Before we get uh, murdered, Peach tells us to go into the courtyard and say our goodbyes to our brother Luigi. Luigi offers to take Mario away and save him, but Mario says he's prepared to face death and with dignity. Also, Donkey Kong is is here. <laughs> what? After saying his goodbyes, Mario makes his way to the execution, and uh, yeah, Shigeru Miyamoto is, is there. After an insane and wacky crazy battle with his father, he gives up fighting and accepts his death. But then Wario pulls out a Glock and shoots Shigeru Miyamoto, ending the Mario universe. Then the game ends. What an epic game, honestly. It, it, it's so good. Eastern Mine is a point-and-click adventure game from 1994, created by the one and only Osamu Sato, the man who made LSD Dream Emulator. This game follows the main character, named Rin, whose soul has been taken hostage by some strange island. Rin travels to the island in order to save his soul, all while fulfilling the lives of nine creatures. As the game is made by Osamu Sato, you can probably take a guess at how trippy this game is. While I had no idea what was happening in the game, just like LSD Dream Emulator, this game has some pretty wacky visuals. At times, they can get a bit uncanny, I guess you could say, but when it gets really creative, it's pretty cool to experience. From the name of this entry, I thought this was going to be an EXE game, but I guess I was wrong. Drowned God is a 1996 science fiction adventure game developed by Epic Multimedia Group. The game is based around the conspiracy theory that all of human history is a lie and that all of the achievements we've made were the result of extraterrestrial aid. This game is basically what would happen if the History Channel made a point and click adventure game. From the insane premise and the late 90s CGI, you can see why it's so far down on the iceberg. Oh boy, I knew I would have to talk about this game at some point. This game has an incredibly depressing and intense story behind it that could warrant its own video. You probably already know, but there used to be a cult in Japan called Om Shinrikyo. They're most well known for being the group behind the 1995 Tokyo subway attack, where members of the cult sprayed toxic substances on several Tokyo metro lines, killing 13 people and injuring about 50. After this attack, they would go on to commit more and more until the cult finally dissipated in 1996. This entry refers to the parody game made about the cult. Why you would make a game about a real-world cult, I'm, uh, 
I'm, I'm not too sure. This game was made by Happy Soft, the same company behind Hong Kong 97. So uh, yeah, there's that. There's a lot of misconception on the internet that the game was propaganda made by the cult, when in reality the game was made to mock the cult and the attacks. The game is uh, very eerie and surreal, using real life footage and images from the cult. The players take the role of the cult's leader and manages the cult operations, collecting resources and recruiting new members, with the end goal of carrying out the 1995 subway attacks. The game has two different endings, one where the player succeeds and carries out the attack, and one where the world ends. <laughs> Sluggish Moors is, uh, well, I I'm not really sure what it is. I don't think you're meant to know what the game is. According to this wiki, Sluggish Moors is a collection of sci-fi games made by this guy named Jake Clover. The series apparently involves space travel, predicting the future, and aliens. These games are very, very disturbing, and gross, and weird, and gross. They just, they, they hurt to look at. <laughs> This entry refers to the large amount of games made by Kanaguti Soft. Kanaguti is this website that contains some art, music, and also some games. Some of these games are pretty cool and fun to mess around with, while others are this. These games seem to be a showcase of the creator's art and music that's also on the website. And some of their stuff is actually not bad, but yeah, most of it is uh, nightmare fuel. <laughs> Radbad.sys is a surreal vaporwave exe game. Based on my channel, you might think I would be pumped to play a game like this. And while at first I was, my excitement quickly faded. As you see, this game is uh, is colorful, a bit, a bit too colorful. The gameplay is pretty simple. You just read shit and click shit to read more shit and repeat. The story behind the game is not different from other EXE games. Some reddit user mysteriously finds a USB and decides to see what's on it. They go home and <laughs> no way, it contains a haunted game. That's crazy. While some of the visuals are pretty good, the majority of the game consists of flashing lights and VHS static that gave me a, uh, a migraine. If you're epileptic, don't even bother playing it. In fact, don't play any of the games on this iceberg. There's there's a 90% chance you're gonna die. This entry refers to the itch.io user, Yames, that makes some pretty unique and well-made horror games. I played two of the seven games, and I gotta say, I'm quite impressed. While very surreal and comedic at times, the games still manage to be rather eerie and atmospheric. While they're pretty short, Yames games clearly have a ton of thought and effort put into them, and are very unique and interesting. For example, take the game Growing My Grandpa, a point-and-click horror game where you grow your grandpa. Amazing. Critters for Sale is a compilation of five short stories, all of which occur in different eras and locations, with each one touching on a certain theme, such as time travel and black magic. The game plays as sort of a mix between a point-and-click adventure game and a visual novel. And as you see from this gameplay, the art style is pretty, pretty cool looking. Although the stories are largely self-contained, each one hints at an overarching story about some devil men and a group called the the Paradise Architects. This game is relatively known within the community and has been received pretty well, having overwhelmingly positive reviews on Steam. Also, uh, Death Grips. This game is definitely inspired by Death Grips. <laughs> Last Armageddon is a 1988 post-apocalyptic role-playing video game released for the PC-88. Described to be the antithesis of the Dragon Quest series, the story revolves around what life is like after all humans and animals have been wiped out by a mysterious force. The game is quite well known in both Japan and the rest of the world due to its really well-made music. While this game is talked about a lot for its music, it's not really well known for its visuals, which is a bit of a shame. The game has some really cool looking art. A Solemus is a very creepy and disturbing point-and-click claymation game from 2020. This game showcases some really cool looking claymation as you click and interact with different stuff to progress. From what I can tell, there's different endings, and there's probably some sort of artistic message behind it all, but that's not really what I cared about. I really enjoy claymation, and this game definitely does it well. I wanted to keep playing it to unlock new paths just so I could see all the animations. They just look, look so cool. 
Lilith Zone is an indie developer that makes, you guessed it, surreal games. They're the person who made the game Crypt Worlds back in tier 3. They're also known for the game On Air Gardens, a game where you traverse a group of liminal and surreal spaces. Oh, and they, they also made the game Elf Bowling RPG, episode 5, if you meet the Santa on the road roast him over an open fire. I am a tree, you are not, ha ha, is an RPG maker game from 2017. In the game, you play as a piss worm that has risen from the sea of piss. You walk around the land, dying and getting revived into different things, such as a bladder and a turtle and this thing. I didn't beat the game because I got stuck trying to get past this uh, pool of blood and I couldn't listen to that annoying guitar rift any longer. I'm not sure about the name of the game. Maybe you eventually meet a tree or something. I don't know. Bizarroware is a collection of short, bizarre micro games. If you think that WarioWare is surreal, play, play this game and, and then get back to me. The game has a really cool art style and some great music, but as for the actual mini games in the collection, I'm kind of on the fence. It might be because I wasn't using a controller, but the mini games seem to be kind of kind of broken and unplayable. Yeah, I probably should have used a controller. Apart from the awful keyboard controls, I really, I really like the game. It's just like experiencing WarioWare for the first time as a kid. It's just really bizarre and overwhelming. Sidonisus is a masterpiece. Sidonisus is a game where Satan sends you to hell and you have to wander around drinking, smoking, and gambling until you eventually find Satan and beat the shit out of him. This game has some of the best dialogue I have ever seen. Like you go into some guy's house and he says, what's up motherfucker? Just hanging out in my sweet ass house. Check it out. It's real great. Or like when you go on a computer and get an ad saying, buy free, get two free dick pills on sale. Dick pills, get dick pills on sale now. Or even this random guy in a hotel that says, Fuck you, I, I fucking hate you. Ah, uh, yeah, I couldn't get this game to work. From the uh, from the title and this description I found, it seems to be a collection of 12 mini games made by 12 different developers. It sounds pretty cool, but yeah, can't can't play it though. The Deep Sleep Trilogy is a set of three point-and-click adventure browser games made from 2012 to 2014. The games revolve around the concept of lucid dreaming and becoming trapped within your dreams. They play like a standard point-and-click adventure game in which you explore your eerie nightmares and search for a way out by solving various puzzles. I really like the art style of the games, they have some really good visuals. The three games seem to have an overarching plot about these shadow people and the actions in your dreams having an effect on the real world, but I didn't, I didn't get that far. The La La Land series is a set of five game maker games made in 2006. Each game in the series is short, abstract, and quite surreal. They're very uh, thrown together, I guess you could say. From what I found, the low effort that can be seen in these games is deliberate. Apparently the games are meant to force players to break through the surface level aspects of a game such as visuals and audio to find a deeper and thought provoking story. Either that or, you know, the, the, the developer just didn't want to put effort into it. Welcome to Heaven is a game from 2017 where you are let into heaven and given the title Boy of Wonders. Nice. We get tasked with the holy duty of judging the souls trapped in purgatory. We get to decide whether they should go to heaven or hell, because I obviously believe in forgiveness and all that. I decide to let everyone into heaven. Even this guy in a monkey suit holding a child in a cage. He says that if I don't let him into heaven, he will kill the child. I guess I... I have no option. After letting in a corporate shark, internet troll, a bully, and a, a monkey, this guy says that I have failed my duty and he abandons heaven in order to make a new one. Oh well, my, my bad, I guess. 
Soft and Cuddly is a horror adventure game released for the ZX Spectrum in 1987. In Soft and Cuddly, you take control of the son of an android queen. The android queen has imprisoned her husband in a refrigerator, but also the queen got dismembered in an accident, leaving her husband in danger of being attacked by evil spirits. The goal of the game is to collect the eight pieces of the android queen's body, then stitch them back together to save your dad that's trapped in a fridge. What a Womb World is a horror game made in 2020 by Yames, the developer that was just mentioned in the iceberg. Like his other games, What a Womb World is super impressive and has a really well made atmosphere with a meaningful and vivid story. In the game, you crawl around the ocean floor, catching fish, finding different objects, with the main goal of finding Eden. It really gives off a 70s dark fantasy vibe with its visuals, and I really like it. My only issue is its length. It was really good, I just, I wish it was a bit longer. Classic Game is an ASCII adventure game from 2017, created by the developer, Horses Music Dogs. What a name. The game revolves around the player character, the Hermit, returning to a land that has been overrun by curses. The game has a pretty unique and interesting combat system, but the main draw of the gameplay is the hidden events that you can find. In Classic Game, there are over 50 unique hidden events that you can find, with each one being interesting and worthwhile. Despite the amount of stuff to do in the game, I still have no idea what was happening. Something about uh, eating human souls and like defeating curses or, or, or something. Home Game, as you can guess from the name, is another game created by Horses Music Dogs. Home Game is the exact same as Classic Game, except now you explore a town instead of some random hill location. Cool. The Tomb Batula is a walking simulator from 2020 made by Bryce Butcher. The game is another PS1 inspired walking simulator where you, uh, you, you walk. The plot revolves around waking up in a room known as the Plant Room. The player progresses through the world until they meet a weird looking monster that tells them that the world is in a state of limbo due to the water around this thing called the, the Fate Birch. The player is tasked with filling up these three test tubes and removing the water and saving the world. Weird story, but the, the graphics are cool. I think that describes fucking half of these games. Dead Dreams is a 2D psychological horror game that focuses on puzzle solving and a complex and detailed non-linear story. This game is really not bad. It's like if Silent Hill 2 was remade in RPG Maker. It has a lot of effort put into it. The story revolves around this school club and the death of one of their members. This mysterious entity called V forces the remaining members to relive traumatic memories and see a bunch of spooky stuff. Very, very spooky. Ah. Glorious train wrecks is, uh, I'm honestly not too sure. According to their website, Glorious Train Wrecks is about bringing back the spirit of postcard wear circa 1993. It's about throwing a bunch of random stuff into your game and keeping whatever sticks. About bringing back a time when you didn't care so much about production values as much as you did ripping sound samples from your favorite television shows to use in your game, or animating pictures of yourself making goofy faces on your webcam, where every ridiculous idea you had, you would just sit down and code when you would make a company name to legitimize dorking around on the computer with your friends. From their website, it seems like they run game jams that are themed around what I just read. Their last jam, from what I can see, was in April of 2022, so I'm not too sure if they're still running or not. The games made for this game jam are pretty, pretty incredible. This site is a gold mine for surreal games, such as uh, Kicked Out of Elf School, or the game Grandpa Orb. Excuse me? What the fuck is this game called? Baby's Dream of Dead Worlds is a flash game made in 2010. I, uh, I downloaded the game and my Windows antivirus told me it was not a good idea to run it, so I didn't. Honestly, just look at these screenshots and the name of the game. I don't think I'm missing much. I want to die. 
Planet DOB is an actual video game, unlike the last two entries, that was made by Microvision and published by Hudson Soft, the same guys behind Mario Party, in 1999 for the PlayStation. The game was produced by a Japanese band titled Date of Birth, hence its name, and the game apparently includes songs from their album of the same name. The playstyle varies throughout the game, but the main goal is to collect as many bits as possible. What a bit is, I'm not too sure, but they sound important. At the beginning of each level, the only background music is a drum beat. Whenever the player obtains a bit, it adds a new instrument to the background music. For example, if the player collects a bit, it may add a piano or a guitar loop. I really like this idea, and it sounds like a super fun mechanic. I wish more games did stuff like that. According to the Itch.io page, Electric Highways is a game that's all about experience and exploration. Everything in this game, especially visuals and music, has been created for the purpose of giving the players some kind of emotion. Yes, game. That is what visuals and music are meant to do. The game's story is about an engineer that's about to release a product online, but before they do, they want to take a dip into this VR simulation just one more time. The game takes you from level to level while you explore some cool techno environments. Ah, and the, the music is really good. I don't know why, but walking simulators always have really good music. Dopaminium The Heal Journey is an old point-and-click flash game that's equally funny as it is terrifying. The game is split into several different sections, with each one representing a mental illness, such as delusions or phobias. Other than the loose theming of mental illnesses, there's not much meaning I could get from the just bizarre shit that happens in the game. It's pretty cool though, look, look at this alien guy, look at him. Tantibus is uh... I don't know, I couldn't get it to work. According to its RPG Maker page, Tantibus is a surreal, neon-lit, earthbound inspired world filled with nightmare creatures and bizarre situations that exist by the name of Tantibus. You journey from your very normal and totally boring home where nothing weird ever happens to whatever exists past the first boss. The game also features a simplistic RPG battle system inspired by Paper Mario and other games. Don't Trust the Cat is a game where you walk around as this purple guy, collecting different coloured mushrooms, some squares, some cat bones, and some shoes, in order to pay sentient TVs, coffee mugs, and cats to get past toll booths. You know, at, at this point, I'm not even surprised. This game is is a masterpiece. It, it's so good. That's all I have to say. I, I've got I've got nothing. Hi. I released a software package containing 10 games entitled Cynical Software. These are mainly arcade type action games. Check it out and post feedback. Here's a screenshot taken from one of the games, Devil Duck. Oh, oh boy. Oh boy. You remember that uh that all-time classic game, Revenge of the Sunfish, from way way earlier in the iceberg? Well this game is uh it's made by the same person. Just watch uh Watch this footage, I think the game speaks for itself. Unlike the more well-known Revenge of the Sunfish, this game has some surprisingly good visuals and sound design, and it also has gameplay. It's definitely a lot more well-made than whatever the, the, the other game, the other game was. Molly and the Gun Mids is a pretty fun shoot 'em up from 2020. The game has some really good music and the visuals are super unique. I'm not too sure if there's a story or anything, I couldn't really tell. The gameplay consists of flying around this empty space and uh, shooting spaceships. Epic. Molly and the Gun Mids. More like Molly and the... Uh, Molly is mid. <laughs> Alamari is a black comedy surreal horror JRPG inspired by Yume Nikki, Off, Earthbound, and Undertale that has been in development since 2013. This game follows Alamari, a hollow object head who lacks any emotions. He wakes up after a crash landing in an unknown location and is told by a being known as 
Hama, then he must travel through nine worlds created by various human emotions known as the emotion worlds and defeat the emotion holders of the worlds to gain their emotions for himself. The game focuses on dungeon crawl, puzzle solving and turn based combat. While it's not out yet, there is a demo that contains the first half of the first section and from what I played it's not bad. I definitely see the inspiration from off the game in tier 2. This game is uh, it's, it's something, it's uh, you, you, your guess is as good as mine. I've got no idea. It's an RPG maker game where you uh, walk through doors and get teleported to rooms. Whoa, so surreal. <laughs> Whoa. What a, what a great name for a game. Vomit Pizza is a short walking simulator-esque game inspired by old game maker games. In Vomit Pizza, you play as a powerful gamer sent forward by God to help Vomit Villain reinstate Earth to its former glory when it's turned upside down after a satanic cult uses sacrificial pizza to turn the Earth into a surreal nightmare. I, f I love this iceberg so much. The club is a really bizarre MMO created by Crows Crows Crows. You know, the, the people that made Accounting Plus with uh, Justin Roiland from F Rick and Morty. While you can't play it anymore, I did find this article that describes the game. When you enter the club, you're given a silly randomly generated username and an even more silly randomly selected 2D avatar. You can then wander around a weird nightclub that looks like it's been patched together by pieces of 90s internet. You can chat, level up, change your avatar, dance and listen to over 100 surprisingly good 90s style dance tunes. It's a weird and wonderful experience with no real objective other than to just enjoy yourself. Apple Source Apartments is a very weird and very terrifying game where you collect rent from the residents of an apartment building. Apparently some plague or something happened and all the residents are abominations of uh, humanoid apples. The visuals combined with the, uh, the music and the, the in-depth disturbing text about being transformed into an apple make the game really gross and disturbing and icky and gross and, and spooky. Neighbor is a game about the price that comes with finding your dream apartment. Made as a Game Boy ROM, the game revolves around a girl moving into a new apartment only to find that one of her neighbors is up to something. Turns out the neighbor is a zombie or something and you end up shooting it and lighting the building on fire. That's only the first chapter. The game has five. In each chapter, the same girl from the first looks for a new place to live after experiencing some evil shit in the last. It's really well made but is more of a horror game than it is a surreal game. Finally, I've been waiting to see this game on here for so long. Squirrel Stapler is a classic surreal horror game that tells the story of a man who hunts squirrels in a forest, all to staple them to a skinned body of his wife so that he can meet God. Turns out that God is a giant mutilated squirrel head that makes very uh, disturbing noises. Amazing. This game is quite old, but was released to Steam a few months ago, and you've probably seen Markiplier or someone play it. This game is very wacky and uh, surreal, and definitely deserves to be down this far. To Dawn and Back is an art horror game from 2020, where you'll experience more than 20 unique dreams, with each one containing unique and surreal characters. Determining on your actions during each dream, the next dream you experience will be different. I, I, f I found this game to be uh, quite disturbing. The art of the characters combined with the music just had me on edge the whole time. I do plan to revisit it eventually, as it seems to be pretty deep and there's a lot of, lot of things going on. I wasn't too sure if there were different endings that you can get, but seeing your choices play out is really well done and it's fun. The game has a massive amount of content for a free title and you should definitely check it out. Goddamn. The music of this game, it, it brings tears to my eyes. The Night Stepped by Blood River 
is yet another walking simulator with some really cool visuals and a great soundtrack. The main draw to this game is definitely the music. Each addition to the soundtrack is better than the last and it really fits the abstract yet calming world you explore throughout the game. There's not much meaning or anything behind the game as far as I know, just a cool atmosphere. Mayhem Mansion is a 7 level mod for the game Doom 2 made back in 2013. This mod is inspired by the game Exploding Lips, a Doom clone where you walk around and shoot, uh, exploding lips. In Mayhem Mansion, you explore a haunted mansion filled with these giant floating lips, television sets that have legs, and sentient books. It says a lot when you realise that this is one of the less surreal Doom mods out there. Crimson is a rhythm platformer that uses heavy industrial electronic metal music. The graphics of this game really suit the soundtrack well, with the game looking a lot like what a homeless person tripping on acid would see. The game is really cool, and the art is really unique, but holy fuck, it is very hard. If you move in the wrong direction for a millisecond, you will die. It's super rage inducing, but it's, it's definitely addictive enough to make you finish. Mothlight is an RPG maker game made by only two people from 2017. The game revolves around a feline named Enzo, who has been kicked down to a place called the Black Sea, an infinite plane of dark water that turns any flesh it touches into metal. All of the scum of society is thrown down into this black sea so that they can be used as useful metals. Very cool. The majority of the gameplay is based on exploring the disturbing world, fighting hand-drawn sprites while trying to escape and return to the surface. While it still has that classic RPG maker clunk, the game's really unique and well made and is pretty well known. Space Funeral 2 of Rubies and Gold is the unofficial sequel to the game back in Tier 2, Space Funeral. The game was originally made to celebrate the 8th anniversary of Space Funeral being made, and then later received an expansion in the form of a director's cut. This is a fan game, by the way, and was not made by the same person who made the original. The story of this game takes place long before the first, in this place called the Claustrophobic Caverns. In the game, you learn that it takes place in the outskirts of where the original game took place. The plot revolves around this ghoul guy that has an adventure inside the treasure grotto in order to solve his insatiable hunger for gold. While not as good as the original, in my opinion, the game was received rather well by fans of the first one. And since then, a few sequels to this game have been made, as well as a ton of other fan games that take place in the same universe. Copper Odyssey is an RPG maker game created by Cam in 2021. This game is dubbed as the first ever printmaking RPG. The plot of the game revolves around monitoring a printing studio. According to this website I found, the game is loosely based off the developer's time as a printmaker and a printmaking monitor. This game has a really cool art style and it's worth playing just to see it. The storyline itself is also pretty good and really interesting, but I won't spoil much. Just go play it. It's it's good. Aurum Prequenga, that is that is a word, is another RPG maker game created by Isopod Mansa. The game revolves around this knight named Dala that goes out on a mission to defeat a gigantic mass of grease that threatens to block the hole in the sky in an underground world. This game is very similar to the titles I just mentioned, with a really weird plot and a cool hand-drawn style. It's got a really good soundtrack, but but other than that, it's uh it's it's alright. The Wyoming Incident is a game that was created back in 2012 and then remade in 2020. As you can guess from its name, the game is based around the super popular ARG from 2006, The Wyoming Incident. You probably recognize this photo. It's from the ARG. The Wyoming Incident is generally agreed to be the first horror ARG and possibly even the first creepypasta. I won't go into detail, but the ARG basically follows this recording of this signal broadcast interruption that was caught on TV and resulted in mass terror amongst the public due to some infrasonic frequencies that were emitted during the hijacking. Well, in this fan game, you play as one of the witnesses of the broadcast as you experience the direct results of the hijacking. As if the ARG wasn't spooky enough, this game is fucking terrifying. I hate it. I mean, it's, it's a good game, but I hate it. 
The Endless Empty is yet another RPG Maker game from 2018 made by Eric Sheeda Smith. The premise of this game is really interesting. The game's plot takes place solely within the mind of a dying man. The person has just died, but still hasn't accepted it. His brain is trying to come to terms with the death while being disconnected from reality. This game gets really, really deep and existential, and it's a bit much to analyze here. If the premise sounds cool, I really recommend playing it for yourself and making your own opinion on it. Bad Vibes is a homage to early Golden Age shooters, created by the developer P-Fail. The gameplay is a lot like Wolfenstein, but with jumping, and the gameplay consists of you wandering around this dungeon, casting spells and destroying the bad vibes that are in the form of black and white monsters. There's not a lot to it, it's pretty fun and has good, good music. Coochie is uh, not really a game, it's more of a playable art exhibit. Created in 2021, Cucci acts as a playable archive for the work of the Italian painter Enzo Cucci. Cucci is well known for working with several different techniques and materials. Honestly, his paintings are perfect for a game inspiration. He paints some really surreal and diverse landscapes that would translate perfectly into a 3D space, and this game does it really well. Unholy Eyeballs is a horror game made for a game jam in 2021. The premise of the game is to explore the concept of eyeballs and the different ways they are used within horror games, and it does it in a pretty cool way. It experiments with different game modes in a bunch of really clever and unique ways that I've never seen before. While it's not super scary or anything, it does get very surreal and quite meta. Escape from Jig is a first person point and click adventure game from 2014 where you escape from uh, Jig, whatever that is. It's a standard point and click flash game where you are trapped in a mysterious room and have to click on different objects to make stuff happen. The art is pretty detailed and it's clear that a lot of effort was put into it, but it's still a little lackluster compared to the other escape games on the iceberg. The Sunday Museum is a first person walking simulator made in 2021 by Sunshine Horror. In this game, you walk around exploring this small museum called the Sunday Museum. Like every other walking simulator on this iceberg, you can interact with different objects in the environment to be transported and see some surreal stuff happen. That's what the game is on the surface though, there's a bit more to it than that. I'm not smart enough to explain what I mean, so I'm gonna read you a review of the game from an art critic. The Sunday Museum is a game that socializes self-ironic assembles from various pregnant and megalomaniac outputs. What the fuck does that mean, dude? The counterbalance of sequences, comments, the surrogate dialogue towards an uncomfortably participated plotline. It marginalizes long term and descriptive cycles from various launched landscapes. Ah, uh, yeah, what, what, what he said. Respite 2.0 is another game from Modus Interactive, the developer behind the game Squirrel Stapler. Respite 2.0 is a very liminal yet relaxing walking simulator with some really good music and a lot of stuff to see. While there's not much to it, it's really good for a walking simulator. Misery is a Yume Nikki fan game created by the developer Owl in 2011. The lack of effects in this game set it apart from other traditional fan games, as the author's main intention is to stress the importance of exploration as the primary mode of gameplay. While the game is very linear, its unique aesthetic makes it feel very alive. While I only played it for about 10 minutes or so, I really enjoyed it. It's quite high quality for a fan game. Life Gallery is a horror puzzle game from 2020 made by 751 Games. The game follows the life of a cyclops as he grows up and becomes a person. This cyclops has a pretty rough life and the game gets quite intense and disturbing during certain parts. It really, it really comes out of nowhere when it does. While it has the classic jank and feel of a mobile game, it's definitely well made and has a ton of effort put into it. Age of Deliverance is an RPG maker game from 2014 created by Extra Value Menu. 
The game is a short adventure game with some pretty snazzy MS Paint graphics and a good soundtrack. The story of the game takes place two years after God has destroyed humanity. You play as a guy named John that managed to survive by locking himself into his house in the woods. After running low on supplies, John is forced to leave and explore the surreal apocalyptic world. This game has a great premise and the story gets really interesting as it progresses. With only 600 downloads on its website, it's, it's pretty underrated. Here it is, we made it. This is the single most defining point of the iceberg. This game, this is the last game in the iceberg that I have heard of prior to researching for this video. After this, I will be going in completely blind to all of the remaining entries. So uh, buckle up. Bad Milk is an insanely surreal puzzle game from the year 2000, created by Ted and Mick Skolnick. The game starts with a first person FMV, where the protagonist drinks some bad milk and collapses onto the table. This sets forward the events of the game, where the player must complete mini games in order to get out of this mundane predicament. The FMV elements of this game, combined with the constant reversed audio and weird sound effects, really make this game a trip. Go watch, uh, go watch Brutal Moose's video on it. Not that he, uh, not that he needs it, but, uh, sh shout out to, shout out to Brutal Moose. Darkest Corners is a horror visual novel from 2021 created by the developer Spookle MacBoogle. I loved, uh, I loved looking at the itch.io page for the game and being creeped out by all the images and the gameplay. And then I find out that the guy who made it is called Spookle MacBoogle. It instantly got rid of any horror I was feeling. The game is very weird and I didn't really understand any of it. I think the story is about these ancient gods and uh, cr creation and stuff. I'm not I'm not sure. The main focus of the game is its visuals. They're pretty eerie and uh, I guess you could say surreal. Nails is a really cool looking browser game that you can no longer play because Flash Player shut down. All I could find was this gameplay and a description of the game. Nails is a browser based experience where you interact with 27 surreal animated scenes, often experimenting with movement of the human body. More of an interactive experience than a game, Nails is an art project created by Han Hoogerbruge, which combines high quality animation, surreal art, and a touch of body horror. From the gameplay, it looks pretty similar to plug and play and other games in the genre. I'm really, I'm really bummed that I couldn't play it. Bry Guy Studios is a relatively unknown game developer with just four games under their belt. From what I can gather, all of their games are first person, with surreal exploration based gameplay. I played a bit of their most recent title, Blood Pit, and uh, it's okay. The visuals are quite insane, and I love them, but other than that, there's not much to talk about. It's not very well made, and the main mechanics are borderline frustrating in how janky they are. I was kind of bummed. The visuals and atmosphere are really good, but the gameplay definitely held it back quite a bit. Ham Ham is a very, very weird game that led me down a rabbit hole involving a Japanese game developer and some very, very weird 3D models. This person honestly warrants their own video, so I'm just going to talk about their game Ham Ham for now. What is Ham Ham? Uh, take a look. Yeah, that's, that's about it. That was Ham Ham. Thank you for listening. You should really check out this guy's YouTube channel. I'll, uh, I'll throw it in the description. It's quite, quite wacky. I'm 70% sure that it made me develop a brain tumor, but honestly, I'm too faded to tell. Remember Bubsy? No? Fair enough, honestly. I fucking hate the orange cunt. I, I get so pissed off every time I see him. It's like that that girl that gets mad when, when she sees minions. I get mad when I see this deformed cat person. 
Bubsy Visits the James Turrell Retrospective is a Bubsy 3D fan game where Bubsy explores a real-life tribute to the postmodern artist James Turrell. Why the fuck would anyone make a fan game of this abomination? And even stranger, why is it an educational game? This game should not exist. It goes against everything I stand for. Its mere existence offends me. Disgusting. Yucky. Helios is a game made by this interesting character named Sean M. Puckett, although it's a bit unclear whether he made it or not, as Sean swears up and down that he didn't make it himself. It was made by aliens. Sean says that he was visited by a UFO at his home in Florida on a stormy night in May of 1993. A column of green light appeared outside his house, and an alien stepped out who looked exactly like him. Sean fainted in shock, and after waking up, he saw that the game had mysteriously appeared on his computer. This is the point in the iceberg where we are at. I am now playing and reviewing games that are made by aliens. You know, I, I really hope you appreciate what I'm putting myself through here. Helios is a pretty standard maze game, where it gets more complex as you continue. The game purposely underexplains itself and doesn't tell you what to do in order to feel as alien as possible. The true goal of the game is to learn all of the glyphs that make up an alien password, which would be fairly simple if the password was made up of letters, but it's not. It's made up of uh, alien symbols. Epic. You can imagine what the plain, non-alien version of Helios would be like, and it's entirely possible that it started out that way, and then he made this insane story about an alien. Garage is a very insane and very nightmarish Japanese point-and-click adventure game from 1999. The game is heavily inspired by the works and findings of Carl Jung, a German psychoanalyst. This game has quite the interesting backstory. Apparently it was considered lost media for quite a long time until 4chan managed to pull a few strings together and find it. What was once a piece of lost media is now available on Steam for anyone to play, which is really cool. That needs to happen more often. Garage is set inside the mind of a man named Yang. Yang finds himself inside a therapy machine known as Garage, which creates within the user's mind a dystopian world similar to the Kowloon walled city in China. The city is inhabited by biochemical entities trapped on a web of tracks, repeating their days in a dark capitalist society. What stands out to me is this game's visuals. It's got the classic early 2000s. 2000 CGI. Early 2000 CGI is already terrifying when it's not trying to be, so a, uh, a horror game made in the same style is uh, pretty nightmarish. While very unsettling and uncomfortable to look at, the game gets pretty deep into psychological concepts and is very well made. The Dark Eye is a first person psychological horror adventure game developed by Inscape in 1995, just like the last entry. This game makes use of early CGI, and it's very gross and uh, disturbing. It also makes use of FMV, which is lovely, because the CGI wasn't horror-inducing enough by itself. The game is a point-and-click adventure game, fueled by the macabre stories of Edgar Allan Poe. The player can experience three of his stories, from the perspectives of both murderer and victim often being dubbed as one of the most obscure horror games ever made. The Dark Eye is a really solid title. Ghost Suburb is a surreal RPG Maker series created in 2003 by Carry On Blue. The games tell the story of a nurse named OK as she works in the Midland Research Hospital Center. Apparently she hasn't slept in three months. Accompanying her on her journey is a floating eye named Gertrude who claims to not be a floating eye. As the hospital begins to break down both physically and metaphysically, OK and Gertrude explore it, searching for sleep as someone who has Insomnia. Uh, this game is pretty accurate. 
Agony of a Dying MMO is a narrative horror game from 2021 made by the developer Salem Hughes. This game has a really great concept. The entirety of the game takes place during the final hours of an MMO before the servers shut down. The MMO once had a large fan base and is reaching the end of its life. There are still a few players remaining that you can stumble across, with each one belonging to a certain group of the internet. As someone who has been there for the closure of a few MMOs, I can say that this game encapsulates the feeling very well. The loneliness and eerie feeling you get when exploring an abandoned server that once hosted thousands of players is terrifying. It's comparable to swimming around at the bottom of the ocean. The game is still in development, and is just a playable demo at the moment. I really hope it gets finished one day. Panic! Exclamation mark is a puzzle point and click adventure game made by Sega in 1993. The game's plot revolves around a virus that has infected every computer system in the world. This kid named Slap and his dog named Stick must carry an antidote to the central computer in order to end the virus. This game is uh, rather insane and brain dead, with each environment you explore being more surreal than the last. While the gameplay is very basic and simple, its environments have that classic wacky Japanese touch. It's less of a game and more of a collection of goofy animations that are held together by a loose story. 99 Rooms is another point-and-click adventure game made in 2004. The game uses pictures of the abandoned East Berlin industrial sector, overlaid with some art made by the developers. The gameplay consists of exploring, you guessed it, 99 rooms. Each room you visit has a task that you need to complete to progress to the next. Similar to a point and click escape game, while not scary, the areas in this game are very weird and do get disturbing at times. David Lynch, the filmmaker and musician, has never made a video game. He certainly did not make this video game. If he were to make one, however, maybe it would be something like this. Ghost Dance is a very weird David Lynch-inspired walking sim made by a Scream catalogue and Caveware Digital in 2018. In the game, you traverse a series of horror scenes directly taken from David Lynch films and artworks, cobbled together in an incoherent fever dream. In this world, David Lynch is struggling to rebuild his creative world, and he needs your help. From this description, you can probably tell that this game gets wacky. It was honestly a lot more spooky than I thought it would be. There's a bunch of really loud jump scares, and I uh, may have poo poo doo dooed myself more than once. Starting this fifth tier, we have Cosmology of Kyoto. Cosmology of Kyoto is an adventure game made by Soft Edge for the PC in 1995. The game is a first person exploration game where you explore the ancient city of Kyoto during 10th century Japan. Like most good exploration games, it doesn't really have a goal and is non-linear, allowing the players to explore in their own way. The game is quite a full basket, exploring themes such as horror and religion, all while managing to stay educational and teach players about ancient Japan. The art in this game is just terrifying. It's really well made, but it's really disturbing. You can see why it's down so far. The Meteorite Motel is a very, very, very surreal RPG Maker game made for the Giza Gus franchise. The game follows Giza Gus, an old man and grandson as they investigate a meteor crash site known as the Meteorite Motel. Throughout the game, you find out that a suspicious colony lives nearby and they harness the power of the meteor. The visual style for this game is indescribable. There's no words for it. This game is whack. This entry refers to a game seen in a video made by some ordinary gamers. The video is titled, A Weird Russian Game I Found. And in the video, he plays and explores a mod made for the game Serious Sam. The game appears to be very basic, offering no gameplay other than getting from point A to point B. The areas in which he explores are very large and empty, and the lack of audio provides a sense of eeriness. Close to the end of the game, it starts to get a little more disturbing, with things such as limbs appearing in certain areas, and cryptic messages written in Russian appearing on the walls. 
Eventually, after exploring down this deep hole, he gets murdered by a funny looking lady and the game crashes and his wallpaper gets changed and his virtual machine shuts down. Epic. Fucker in the Woods is a very strange looking visual novel from 2017 where a group of teens venture into a forest in order to investigate a disappearance of one of their friends. This game is uh, it's fucking terrifying. I, I fuck, I hate, I hate how it looks so much. The way the characters faces are, th the way they move around like fluids, I, f I hate it. It's so gross. It's a pretty well made game, but I, I hate, I hate how it looks. Fucker in the Gulag is the long-awaited sequel to Fucker in the Woods, made in 2019. I'm not playing another fucker game, so I'll read you the description of it. It's a nice sunny day at Syringe Beach, and roided up beef star Ryukaze and his wise old friend Orc Master Jones are soaking up the rays and oogling at the babes. Their life of luxury is soon interrupted, however, when an old acquaintance burst into their lives with an offer they simply can't refuse. But if something sounds too good to be true, it rarely is. The group soon find themselves hopelessly lost in the clutches of a vast conspiracy that could threaten all of mankind. Only one question remains. Who is the f***er in the gulag? This iceberg has made me mentally ill. League of Piss Yes, that is the name of the game, is a game made from 2018 for the website Glorious Trainwrecks, an entry that was in the last tier. The game is a perfect example for what kind of games can be seen on the website. League of Piss is a mixture of a visual novel, as well as a ton of different other genres. It has some pretty thrown together visuals and audio, as well as a very loose story. In the description for the game, the developer says he made the game while his brain was fucked up. And uh, yeah, that's that's pretty pretty clear. I hope I hope he's better now. Crime Zone is another game from the creative genius, the Catamites, the person behind a ton of other games on the iceberg, such as Goblet Grotto, Of the Killer Games, Space Funeral, Murder Dog, the Captain Skull series, and 50 short games. This one developer is single-handedly carrying this iceberg. Crime Zone is one of their lesser known games, where you walk around this hand-drawn place called the Crime Zone. You play as a cop, questioning citizens and solving crimes. There's also an overarching plot about this hotel that keeps attracting people to it. While definitely not the best game from the Catamites, it's still pretty good, and I can't wait to see what else they make. Every single game they make is a banger. Nobita's Biohazard is an RPG maker game from 2009. The full name of the game is Doraemon Nobita's Biohazard, or in English you might know it as Nobita's Resident Evil. The game was one of the biggest RPG maker horror games of its time, being in the ranks of Ao Oni and Yume Nikki. The game is a parody slash crossover of the first Resident Evil game, which reenacts Raccoon City's mansion incident in the context of the famous Japanese slice of life manga Doraemon, starring the cast from the manga as the protagonist. The game is very well known for its darker interpretation of the light-hearted Doraemon series, as well as its solid gameplay among the Japanese RPG maker community, and also the fans of Doraemon. Antumbra is a very odd and surreal point-and-click horror game made by Vilehead in 2015. While I've never heard of it before now, some of you might have, as Markiplier and a few other YouTubers played it back in the day, showing their reactions to the insane shit that happens in this game. In Antumbra, you make your way around a terrifying brown landscape, talking to different creatures and making your way past them. This game is littered with jump scares, with one happening whenever you say or do something wrong. You may recognize some of the art in the game. A lot of the creatures in the game are made from popular creepypastas and other disturbing imagery that can be found on the internet. Also, Jesus is in the game. Jesus Christ himself. A Legal Crime Game is an amazing RPG maker title from 2015, where you play as a guy named Crime in the city of crime, committing crimes and getting money by committing crimes. This game ended up being a lot longer than I thought it would be. It contains quite a large variety of crimes to commit, something I would hope for from a game called the Illegal Crime Game. Such, such a good game. 
Thream is an amazing first person shooter game made by a guy called Leon in 2016. The game is described by the developer himself to be a horrible first person shooter, made with love but with no shame. I reckon that describes the game perfectly. In Thream, you play as a camera with a champagne bottle attached to it, and when you click, you shoot, um, I, I think, I hope, I hope it's champagne. You explore this one level with a ton of strangely positioned stolen 3D assets, while a bunch of very misplaced stolen audio from games and TV shows play. Also, this image is plastered everywhere for some reason. Prosperity Path is a batshit insane website that hosts a collection of games called Orbs. According to the site, each orb is designed to coach you through a mindful training process that will cleanse your karma and attend to a multitude of life problems. These karma cleansing games are a very simple way to be happier. This website hosts quite a large number of games, with each one looking the exact same but with a different title. And better yet, each game cost six dollars each. I'm sorry, but I, I don't get paid enough to buy and play any of these. Also, I'm banned from PayPal, so I couldn't buy them if I wanted to. PayPal banned me for buying a miniature toilet on eBay. So if you want to see someone play it, go go watch my boy Vinny from Vine Source. Also, you can apparently pay six dollars to do a seance with Elvis Presley himself. The site says, sure, he's got a lot of fan mail to wade through every day, but what the heck, you might catch him. I really can't tell if this site is a joke or not. Gobbo Goes Adventure is another title from the developer Roman, the guy that made Funny Pizza Land 1 and 2, both games that were featured earlier in the iceberg. The game features the disturbing and gross 3D look that his other entries are known for. In Gobbo Goes Adventures, you play as a gross looking little man named Gobbo as he saves the world from climate change. It's an isometric puzzle game where you control Gobbo, moving him in four directions while clicking and dragging objects to solve puzzles. According to its itch.io page, Gobbo takes place in the funny pizza land universe and occurs between both games. I gotta say, the game does do a good job at depicting a world ravaged by climate change. There is no way in f I would want to live in this world. This game, this game made me turn my air conditioner off. My Hole is a Mouth of Dirt is a strange horror game from 2020. It's an RPG where you play as a guy named Simon who has built a chapel underground under the command of the saint after being told that the world is ending. Simon is left underground for an unknown length of time until emergency sirens are heard as the ground starts to shake. The same voice from before tells him to head deeper underground. The majority of the gameplay features Simon venturing down four different layers, with the first one containing abandoned mines, the second one containing an underground garden, the third one containing a mix of machinery and religious references, and the fifth one being a gross hole made of flesh. Simon encounters this area after awakening back into layer one and escaping the mouth, even after he escapes the flesh hole. It's never really clear if Simon truly escapes, since the flesh hole is known as the bottom layer, likely being outside of the mouth. To me, this game clearly seems to be some sort of commentary on religion and hearing messages from God. It could be making fun of doomsday preppers and the people that prepare for the biblical end of earth. Either that or the main character is just a guy that works 4chan all day and hears voices. He just like me for real. Screamy Bingus and the Krungy Spingus is a fictional game created by Tumblr user Uten Tajen in 2014. The game was first posted as a joke image with a fake Amazon page, but after it gained a ton of popularity, Uten Tajen made an animation and two albums based off it. The creator originally imagined the game to be a haunted point and click adventure game, but it never got made. Since then, a wiki has been made detailing the quote fake lore behind the non-existent game, and god damn, is there a ton of lore. The name of this entry, Scrimmy Bingus and the Krungy Spingus Family Edition, refers to the real game made in 2015 by Newgrounds user Krogus Interactive. I'm not sure if it was something to do with the Newgrounds player, but the game didn't load for me. I sat at my computer 
and watched the screen for like 10 minutes straight. The gameplay I'm showing is from Vine Source Vinny, and from the footage it appears that it contains an actual game. The gameplay seems to revolve around finding the Bingus before Lord Zordog takes over. Epic. Bugger World is a really good and really underrated RPG maker game made by Sebastian in 2019. In Bugger World, you play as a rabid diseased dog that lives a happy life in his tunnel made from blood. That is until one day when the dog's home is invaded by clowns. The game follows the adventures of the rabid dog as he makes his way through different areas of Bugger World, meeting strange characters such as a sentient bullet. As you explore, you undercover the clown's plot to take over the rabid dog's reality Towards the end of the game, you learn the person behind this invasion is a powerful wizard by the name of Funny Man. He wishes to take over the dog's reality in order to test out his powers. However, the rabid dog, fueled by a religious hatred towards clowns and love for his reality, comes out on top and defeats Funny Man. I really, really like this game. It's definitely one of the best games on the iceberg. While it's not original, the game has a really good soundtrack. I found myself head bobbing during each battle. I wanted to learn more about the creator of the game, so I had a look at their Twitter page and, uh, oh god. Bole, bole. Chu Tang is a point and click adventure game made by the godfather of surreal games himself, Osamu Sato. This game is also the sequel to the game Eastern Mind, The Lost Souls of Tong Nao, a similar game that was on the last tier. The game takes place an unknown amount of time after the first one, in which the player meets a character named Nan Shu from the first game. Nan Shu explains to the character that he was sent to guard the island of Chu Tang, but the dark entity named Chu broke him into pieces. The game revolves around Rin, the same character from the first game, finding the different pieces of Nanshu. Initially, the game was in Japanese only. However, on November 11th, 2020, seven years after the game's rediscovery, a full fan translation was created for the game, meaning non-Japanese players could experience the story for the first time. This game has the classic crude drawings and 3D models found in the first one. Strawberry Cubes is an unorthodox platformer made in 2015 by Lauren Schmidt. The game lacks a conventional control scheme and players are encouraged to try pressing other keys on the keyboard, which have effects that include warping the player across the screen or changing the visual presentation of the game. Without a user interface, the player is required to use context clues from the simulated glitches and bugs in the game to progress. There is no end to the game and it's left for the player to explore explore the spaces in the game to uncover its features. One of these features includes the addition of hidden messages and images in the game and its files. Not sure why it's down this far on the iceberg to be honest. While I haven't heard of it before, there's heaps of coverage of the game on the internet, unlike most of the other games in this tier. Soup 0.9 is an indie exploration game from 2007 that's heavily inspired by LSD Dream Emulator. In Soup version 0.9, the player explores a linear set of dreamlike locations in a 3D environment, some of which may contain interactable NPCs and other objects of interest. Each individual room may be explored for as much or as little time as desired. The player may move on to the next location simply by touching a wall. The game spans across five different days, but what's weird is that once you finish one of the days, the game closes. The game doesn't even tell you. You're just meant to know to reopen the game to play the next day. Now, nah, now that's what I call player agency. Exodus Guitar, I don't know how to say that word, is a survival horror game made for MS-DOS in 1994 by Andrew Spencer. In Ectastica, you play as either a male or a female and explore a town collecting items and attacking demons. Just take a minute to look at this cover art. Now, uh, back to the gameplay. What, what the fuck happened? Despite the graphics, this game is pretty solid from what I've seen online. It's actually ranked 69th in the top 100 games of all time on a list made in 1996. Not sure if that's meant to be a joke or not. 
The World Has Been Sad Since Tuesday is a very short ASCII game based off a story of a very old man with enormous wings. In the game, you and a couple find an old man with angel wings washed up on the beach. After the couple decide to take the old man into town, you sneak into their truck and follow them. When in the town, you find that the angel is now sitting outside a church, being swarmed by a herd of people asking the old man to perform miracles and cure their ailments. When you finally get to talk to the old man, the feathers that you have collected throughout the game leave your hand and attach themselves to the old man's wings. After this, the player and the angel become one, and a text box appears saying the world has been sad since Tuesday. A quote from the original story. What this is meant to mean, I'm not sure. I haven't heard of this story until now. Apparently the story is about the contrast of a beautiful angel and a gross old man and how humanity reacts to it. That's what I could find by looking on Spark Notes. Also, the music in this game is really atmospheric and I had goosebumps the whole time while playing. While it's only about five minutes long, it's a very moving game and it's one that I'm gonna remember. Paranoia Escape is a PS1 horror game made in 1998 by none other than Screaming Mad George. Screaming Mad George is a special effects artist known for his work with my all-time favorite director, Brian Neusner. His work in the movies Reanimator and Society will remain in my brain for the rest of my life. This guy is a, is a genius. He's the Danny Elfman of practical effects. He's behind some of the most surreal imagery that has ever been created. How this guy creates the stuff he does, I have no idea. His game Paranoia Escape is often considered to be one of, if not the most disturbing PS1 game. The game is a first person pinball game and is quite possibly one of the best looking pieces of art I have ever seen. It looks so good. This game takes place in hell, actual hell, and the environments are created with random body parts, organs, flesh, eyes, mouths, all that yucky, gross stuff. It's really hard to put this game into words. You have to see it for yourself. Increpare.com I don't know if I said that right, is a mysterious website that hosts a large collection of surreal micro games made by what I presume is one person. This website is essentially the WarioWare level select screen, but somehow the games are even more crude and at times a bit offensive. Surrealidade, or Surreality in English, is a terrifying Portuguese point-and-click adventure game made by Demita Kozam in 2020. This game has some really great 3D imagery, and every single screen you see is equally surreal and disturbing. I wasn't sure what the game was about, as you might guess. Despite not knowing what was going on the whole time, the visuals still managed to keep me playing. Makamaka is a very obscure and surreal RPG made for the Super Famicom by Sigma Enterprises in 1992. There is a company called Sigma Enterprises. I get to play this game. I get to play this game. The game takes place on an earth where aliens, giant cannibalistic alien princesses, and evil, faceless ant-men are completely normal, and the main character is the reincarnated form of an alien prince who defeated an evil demon king millennia ago. Now, completely resurrected and at full power again, said demon king wants revenge organizing the Maka Maka Society to conquer Earth. The gameplay consists of seeing insane shit happen and fighting aliens that you come across while exploring. Fins of the Father is another amazing top tier game where you play as a fish named Salmantha as they compete in the big race, all while copyrighted music plays. After racing for a while, Salmantha's car catches on fire and eventually explodes, killing them. We are then sent to Fish Valhalla, where we must ride with and protect Salamantha's dad on a motorbike by shooting marlins. Eventually, you kill the mother fish, and then the credit screen wishes a happy anniversary to one of Kanye West's songs. If that's not surreal, then I don't know what is. Weird and Unfortunate Things Are Happening is an RPG Maker game made in 2020 by Unity RPG. The game follows a girl named Alicia, who just so happens to be a psychic, and sees monsters every now and then. I don't know about you, but where I'm from, we call that being schizophrenic. 
not psychic, but hey, a tomato tomato. The game is a mix of a JRPG and survival horror game, using common mechanics found in both genres. For example, unlike a lot of RPG maker games, items are very limited and the player is forced to ration them out. The rest of the game's plot gets very wacky and surreal, stuff to do with interdimensional travel and aliens. I don't know, I, I didn't get that far into it. Uwa, is that, is that how I say it, is an exploration game made by the developer Uwa in 2020. In Uwa, you walk around several eerie abandoned places at night, picking up items and interacting with stuff in the environment. This game has a great atmosphere and is super creepy. When you play it, it makes you feel like someone behind you is watching. I'm not sure about the story, there might be one but I was probably too dumb to notice it. You have like this building that serves as sort of a hub area that you can teleport to when you get lost. There's no real objective from what I saw, just exploration. The game is still in beta and has been in development for two years. According to a post on the itch.io page in May of two years ago, version three was meant to be released, but I guess it never was. I really hope the developer comes back to it. It's a really good game. He Death is a strange exploration game where you walk around this desert place to pick up black powder that I presume you put into a rocket. I wasn't able to get very far. My game would crash every time I picked up the fourth piece of powder. The game's art is certainly uh, blinding, you could say, and the atmospheric music is uh, rather spooky. Neftaliya is an RPG maker game made by a Japanese man named 14. Yes, his actual name is 14. This game is about a white stick man that is also featured in 14's other games. You play as the stick man as he explores the land of Neftaliya. The goal of the game is to find 14. Damn, this fucking developer thinks he's funny or some shit. 14 movies upon which the game is won. The game is less about looking for the movies and more about just exploring. While not overly surreal, the game is still quite eerie and uncanny. While it certainly doesn't look like much, this game definitely fits in with the other good RPG Maker games in this iceberg. Painted Tomb is a bizarre story of companionship, love, betrayal, revenge. In Painted Tomb, you play as a mushroom guy as he rides a horse and watches TV and goes to bed and then burns himself and his son alive. This game is very colourful and painful to look at. <laughs> you get it? You, you play as a mushroom guy and, and the game looks like you're tripping. <laughs> funny. Drugs funny. Help Me is a game made by the one and only Wallace Lovecraft, the developer behind No Love, a really good RPG maker game from ages ago in the iceberg. Help Me is a decision making game where you play as a person living in a surreal nightmare hellscape. In order to ensure their survival, you have to make a ton of life saving decisions or be killed in one of many very, very brutal ways, of which I cannot show on YouTube. I love Wallace Lovecraft's art so much. It reminds me of the regular show and Adventure Time. It's just, it's very nostalgic looking. This entry refers to the games created by the Japanese artist, Bill Bimo. This person has their own website where they showcase their surreal animations as well as their games. They're rather simple arcade-like games with not much to them, but goddamn, do they look insane. Just watch this gameplay, Jesus, Jesus Christ. Masterbus Snoopy is a browser-based text adventure game with one of the best premises I have ever heard. Within the game, a shape-shifting alien has found a Peanuts comic and interprets it as the protocol for human interaction. The alien then proceeds to consume the entire Milky Way and the surrounding galaxies, replacing them with its own body. The universe is then mutilated into a nightmarish Peanuts themed landscape, as the Peanuts is the only thing the alien understands. Throughout the story, you take control of Wood Snoopy 799, just one of the billions of entities living in a pointless existence in this alien's slowly dying body. The story revolves around Wood Snoopy getting excommunicated from his home and setting out to explore the bizarre and disturbing world. 
Subway Midnight is a creepy psychological horror game made by Bubby Darkstar in 2021. The game revolves around a young girl that boards a mysterious train late at night. On this train, she encounters several wacky characters and tries to befriend them all while avoiding the main villain of the game and find a way off the train. This game has some really good visuals with a mix of 2D and 3D. This mix is done really well and gives the game an eerie kind of liminal atmosphere. The game has a few endings, some of which are good and some bad. The way the game tells the story is really cool. Left Way is a horror adventure game made by Tong Soon in 2017. This game follows a lady named Nam Pong as she gets transported to a surreal and empty world and must find a way out. Much like the last game, Left Way has quite a bit of puzzle solving and can lead to numerous endings. The game has some really good art and the world that you explore feels so well crafted. Even the areas that contain people feel empty and abandoned. There's so much detail put into each environment, and the hand-drawn aesthetic pairs really well with the setting. There's not much else to talk about without spoiling the story. Also, this game is confusing as fuck to play. Some of the translations just don't make sense, and the game does not tell you what to do at all. No subtle hints through dialogue or the environment. Just figure it out yourself, you fucking dunderhead. Hotel Souls is a banger of an adventure game made in 2019 by Studio Soft. The game follows a pharmacologist that has bought a mysterious gem after going on a long and hard journey. He then decides to take a rest at the Hotel Souls, but overnight, the stone gets stolen. The game revolves around exploring the hotel and the surrounding area to find the stone that was taken. This game is a prime example that a game doesn't need to have a ton of disturbing visuals in order to make a terrifying story. This game's art is super cute, but the game somehow manages to remain terrifying. This game is well worth its price, with it containing a ton of content to explore and a ton of endings to find. I was really shocked when I found out the game was made by just two people. Really, really good shit. Ca Tre, meaning catfish in Vietnamese, is a Vietnamese PS1-like horror game where you, um, I, I don't really know. The game has you walk to a waterfall and stare at a catfish on a rock for a while until a horde of catfish start to dance around you. They make you float into the air and then you turn into a catfish. Yeah, that's, that's about it. There could be some deep philosophical meaning behind the game or just a <laughs> f funny catfish. Why the fuck did you people make me play this? Deity Driving is an adventure game made in 2018 by Graceless Games. The game revolves around driving a JPEG car around a bizarre and surreal landscape. You make your way through several bizarre collections of images that make up environments where you talk to more JPEGs with text-to-speech voices that say some wacky and quirky stuff. This game apparently won an award in 2018. Yeah, well deserved. Very well deserved. Urban Dream Bog is a surreal walking simulator where you stroll around empty buildings, petting blue dogs, punching shadow people, and collecting floating goat heads. Something that you could catch me doing on an average Wednesday afternoon. There really ain't much to this game, as far as I can tell. But it does have some really good music and sound design, so there's that, I guess. Sunken Heads is a very underrated adventure game, made by Horsehead Interactive in 2020. In Sunken Heads, you play as a random guy that has picked up a package behind a dumpster, only to be transported to an eerie and surreal dream world. Throughout the game, you explore the world by sailing to different areas, finding coordinate disks so you can get to the next area. Each area is host to dozens of characters with some pretty, pretty quirky dialogue that are only exemplified by their amazing sprites that stare into your soul. This game is quite long, with six unique endings, containing an insane amount of content for being a free game. It should be a crime how unknown this game is. I have no idea why it doesn't cost money and why no one talks about it. I cannot recommend it enough.
Sluggish Moors Pattern Circus is the 2021 entry in the Sluggish Moors series, a series of games that had its own entry earlier in the iceberg. Like the other games in the series, Pattern Circus is a claymation narrative game with a very complicated and hard to understand story. Something about temporal phenomena and space and aliens, I think. Some big science-y event happened and you play through the experiences of eight different characters and discover the effects it had on them. The game's art is really good, making use of a combination of Scott Cawthon looking CGI and claymation. It's definitely the highlight of the game. The story and the dialogue is not too bad when you can actually understand it, but that's not too common. Maybe I'm just brain damaged or something, that could be why. Mummy Sandbox is a surreal adventure game made in 2021 that was inspired by Minecraft. In the game, you play as a mummy as you explore through abandoned sandboxes, rebuilding your mummy body, exhuming corpses, and becoming the best mummy possible. The game was made as a part of the haunted PS1 demo disc in 2021, and later got its own standalone release on Steam later in the year. While it's a bit short, the game is really good for what it is, and ended up being quite deep. It really made me question the meaning of life. Also, grave digging is epic. Storms is a short RPG maker game from 2015, created by the developer Milk Cyclops. In Storms, you play as a white blob man that needs to find the correct key in order to escape before the storm comes and takes away his chances of getting a victory royale. All the keys you collect are fake and disintegrate upon touching them, and the storm ends up killing you. After that, uh, you walk around some more. The game probably has some deeper meaning about the consequences of the industrial revolution or something, but I had to stop playing. The music was assaulting my ears and I couldn't handle it. Muldullah Malum is a game made by the creative genius Mason Lindroth, the man behind one of my favorite games, Hilux 2. <clears throat> Go, go watch my video on it, it's really good. This game is a claymation metroidvania made with Mason's usual visual style for the Ludum Dare 40 in 2017. The game features a cool blue guy who I assume is uh, Mal Dalla Malom as he roams a surreal claymation world. This gameplay as well as the environments are what inspired the mini game segments in Hilux 2 and you can definitely see the comparison. It even shares the exact same sound effects. It's a really pretty game, and definitely worth checking out just for the visuals. Blood Eye is a 2D puzzle game made in 2016 by Australian developer Simon Webber about floating eyeballs. In Blood Eye, you simultaneously control a group of eyeballs to solve puzzles and get to the next area. There's not much to it. It's a short and sweet, well-made puzzle game with some really good visuals. From what I can put together, the game is meant to take place inside a person's mind, and the player is just an observer, but I could be wrong. Skulls is a lengthy surreal adventure game made by Pizza Makes Games in 2014. The game follows a skeleton that has mysteriously woken up on a cliff. The skeleton then finds a talking skull by the name of Yendor, and the two go on a surreal journey to uh, walk around and do stuff. The game has some good visuals and sound design, and the dialogue between the main characters is quite epic. The game also has a sequel called Skulls and Skeletons that was made the year after and is equally as good as the first. Liminal Space Visual Novel is exactly what it sounds like. It's a visual novel that takes place in liminal space. The story follows the player eating some suspicious yogurt they find in their fridge, participating in some even more suspicious lab tests, and being transported into several liminal spaces. While the dialogue and story of the game are not really the best, making me feel like I'm playing an old creepypasta game, it's the areas you explore that are the highlight. Even though they're just common liminal space photos ripped from Google Images, they're used quite effectively. They make the player feel safe one moment and in danger the next. The game really uses the eerie feeling you get from these images to its full potential. Nehru is a short space funeral fan game made by Meat Baby in 2016. In Nehru, you play as a guy named Garrett who is a worthless piece of human trash and a disappointment to his family and loved ones. As you would, Garrett decides to go on a journey in order to make his life worth something. The game is a bit bland. You quite literally just walk from area to area. That's, a, that's about it. 
Color Out of Space is a very weird arcade game made by Rani Baker in 2016 for the Tarot Card Game Jam. In the game, you play on a biblical looking arcade cabinet as a hand in a cloud flying around space zaps stuff with lightning, revealing symbols and stuff. I have no idea what this game is or what I'm meant to do in it. I'm not at all versed in the occult or tarot cards, so I don't know what any of it means. Oh, and uh, for some reason, your coordinates are displayed in the top of the screen. Cool. I have no idea why this game is so far down. I did not make this iceberg, please don't bully me. This game is a classic PC game from 1999. What I know this game for is being one of the inspirations behind the art in Hilux 1 and 2, with both games sharing the digital dithering technique found in Cosmic Osmo. Cosmic Osmo is a point and click adventure game where you control a guy in space named Osmo, exploring planets and completing puzzles. This game has a really cool and unique mechanic allowing the player to switch to a microscopic view in order to find hidden shortcuts and it looks really good with the art style. The game eventually got a sequel in 2007 which was completely different from the first game and also gave me the realization that Osmo is a green alien. All this time I thought it was just a human spaceman. This entry refers to the series of point-and-click adventure games made by the developer Squinkafar Productions. These games are very quirky stop-motion detective games that follow the character Dominique Pamplemouse as he solves crimes and randomly bursts into song. There's currently two games in the series. These games are very crude and I honestly can't tell if it was made by a child or not. The voice actor is either a young child or a woman with a child's voice. There's just no way to know. Blue Sunday is a short narrative RPG made in 2021 by a group of three developers. In Blue Sunday, you play as a man named Shell, who has awoken in a strange and very bright place, with no memory of who he is or how they got there. After talking with several characters, you find out that you are in fact dead and are in the afterlife. The gameplay consists of digging up graves of your loved ones and regaining your memory. I love how this game is about regaining your memory and all the puzzles are memory puzzles. It's a really cool detail. I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure the main character has died while drunk driving and the game is his life flashing before his eyes as he fades in and out of consciousness. After talking to all of your loved ones, you can speak to the embalmer that allows you to finally die. As you die once and for all, you relive the scene of you talking to your wife with the wreckage of the car in the background and the screen slowly fades to black. This game is very well made and very depressing. It's definitely one of the saddest games I've played and is definitely gonna stick with me. Kirstum is a demo for a game that was made by Glamow but I don't know when. This game was deleted, but I was able to find a re-upload in some Reddit thread, so I was able to play it, and I'm really glad that I did. Kirstum is unlike anything I've played before. Yes, it's surreal, of course. It's in the surreal game Iceberg, but it's more than that. The atmosphere is just so well made. It's like a fever dream, but it's still grounded enough to keep you immersed. Kirstum is a dungeon crawler where you walk around a dungeon, interacting with wacky characters. Each time you talk to a character, you can decide to either talk to them or attack them, which I really like. You can see everything the game has to offer without getting into any fights. There's not much of a story, or there might be one and I didn't understand it. It's a shame this game was deleted, and from what I can see the developer has completely disappeared and has stopped uploading on social media. I don't know, maybe they died or something. God fucking damn it, dude. I thought I was done with this bullshit. Fucker in the Ashes is the third game in the fucker series, with the other two being at the start of this tier. I'm sorry, but after subjecting myself to the first two, I refuse to buy and play this game. So instead, once again, I'm just gonna read the synopsis. It's a brisk day in the green zone, and Ryu Kaze and his cast of pals reflect upon their misadventures of recent memory, discover the origins of Ryukaze, get lost in the infinite back alleys, and relive classic moments in HD graphics. Can you handle all the plot twists and gamer fills? Or will you collapse in a heap 
and cry for no reason at all. Deeper in the ashes is the Alpha and the Omega, the first and the last, the beginning and the end. These games fucking suck, P please stop making them. Will You Ever Return is an RPG maker game made in 2015 by Jack Spinoza. The game follows a man who gets shot in a mugging after a romantic date. The man is then sent to hell and the player must guide him through the different layers, being guarded by a Virgil, much like in Dante's Inferno. The game makes use of claymation as well as stock images and looks really, really bad. This game might be funny to some people, but to me it was a bit cringe. It's not too bad or anything, it's just a bit, bit doo-doo, bit poo-poo. Magnus Amargo is a hidden object adventure game made by Sons of Welder in 2022. I played this game for quite a bit and uh, get ready, say it with me now, I had no idea what was going on. The name Magnus Amargo can be translated into Great Transformation, and it, I guess it kind of suits the game. There's a few sequences in the game that feel like you're undergoing some sort of change. The gameplay consists of clicking on arrows to go to different areas where you find hidden objects and complete puzzles. I did not really like the game, to be honest. It left me feeling very lost and unsatisfied. It seems like it's a bit unfocused and doesn't know what it wants to be. Apparently this game is a sequel to another game, Magnus Failure, that has similar gameplay but is presented in a top down view, rather than in first person. Me not playing the first game could easily be why I had no idea what was happening, but even then it really shouldn't be. Liminal Exploration is a PS1 style exploration game made by Te Develop in 2020. In the game, you play as a frogman as he explores several liminal spaces. No fucking way, that's crazy. Getting to the elevator in each area to get to the next one. The game has some pretty cool movement mechanics, allowing the player to shoot a rope and swing on it. Too bad you can't jump though, so unless you fall off a ledge, you can't really swing. There's also these black orb things that you can shoot. They don't do much. They just emanate an ominous um while they push you around. There's also a physical camera that the character can pick up and take photos, which I really like. The game has some very photo worthy environments. It's just a shame the game was a bit buggy. I wasn't even able to get past the first level. There could be some mechanic I'm missing, but I wasn't able to get to the elevator of the first level. Room Explorer 2010 is a game from 2020. This game was made by Squoom for the website Glorious Trainwrecks. This game fucking rocks. Definitely the best game in this tier by a mile. It's a short point and click game that follows a man who wants to explore rooms. The player starts by entering their room. After fiddling around with a potted plant and a hat rack, the player pulls out his new Kellogg's brand phone. However, he can't log into it because he's not pressing the thumb scanner hard enough. After pressing the button with the power of 10,000 suns, the player snaps their finger in half. It's now when the mascot of the game and tutorial guy shows up. He missed his flight and he was late. He was too late though. He wasn't able to warn the player about the danger of the new Kellogg phone. We are then transported to a hospital where a doctor tells us to fill out a survey. After entering our brutally honest answers, the doctor tells us that we will get the results to the survey in a few days and then the game ends. 10 out of 10. Game of the year. Super Bogus World 2 is a mini game collection made from 2014 to 2020 by the developer Hooball. In Super Bogus World 2, you play as a cat named Borgus as he drives around a surreal landscape completing various loosely connected mini games in order to progress. I don't know if it was my fault or not, but the game was very, very, very laggy. This game makes you download some sketchy looking installer in order to download the game. This game was really good, but I'm sure it would have been a lot better if it wasn't running at like 10 frames. Also, I found a really weird coincidence. The last game I talked about, Room Explorer 2010, it uses music from this game. That's, that's pretty cool. 
Reaping Sow is a Yume Nikki fan game inspired by Harvest Moon, made in 2013 by the developer Owl. I'm not sure why it's down this far. This game is pretty well known. Most people know this game from the evil farming game mystery. A few years ago, some Reddit user fell asleep while watching a Vine Source livestream where a joke was told about an evil farming game and the user remembered it the next day as a game that he actually played. The game was meant to be a farming sim like Harvest Moon where the player must manage a farm all while hiding the murder of his wife. Many people suspected this game to be Reap and Sow, and for good reason. In Reap and Sow, you take care of a farm during the day, and at night, you explore your dream world. The dream world is a huge world, with everything from factories with robots to magic forests. The dream world will eventually tie into the real world, and you can use some crops that you grow on your farm to affect the dream world. While not quite the same thing as hiding the corpse of your dead wife, it's easy to see how someone would label it as the evil farming game. Taiwan 2001 is a lost game made in Taiwan as a parody of the game Hong Kong 97. I actually made a video about this game about a year ago, but it got taken down because the outro had a two second clip of a monkey smoking, even though the clip I used was from a YouTube video with millions of views. Very epic YouTube. After I made the video, I actually got an email from some guy who sent me the game. So uh, yeah, it's uh, it's not lost media anymore. I can send it to someone if you want to give it to the lost media wiki or something. I honestly have no idea how to go about it. I don't know if the game works either, because when I go to play it, it says I'm missing some file. I think it's because the game was made for Windows XP and my computer is Windows 10. So if someone knows how to fix it, uh, let me know. Oh uh, yeah, never, never mind. The the game was found. I'm actually stupid. Worm is another game made by Michael Riftshire in 2019. Unlike his other game, I Solemus, a game that was in the last tier, Worm is just an exploration game, not a horror game. This game is really good, and you need to just experience it for yourself. It's free to play on Steam, so go, go play it. It's a claymation game, as you can probably tell, where you click stuff and watch animations play, and goddamn, are the animations good. At points it feels like you're watching a music video and you forget you're playing a game. You literally feel like you're dreaming when you play it. The game makes use of the mouse cursor in really cool ways, letting it interact with the environment and change shape. It's so relaxing and satisfying, seeing the different pieces of clay mold together and transform. Go wishlist this guy's next game. It looks like he's making another horror game like Asolomus, and he's also making another exploration game like this one. I can't wait to play them. Nemuru Mayu is an obscure Japanese PlayStation 1 game made in 1991 by the developer Asmic Ace. The game tells the story of a demonic tome that hides itself in Tuscany, Italy. The tome has entrapped the souls of four knights. In the game, you control a random human that has been sucked into the tome and given the title, The Accursed One. The player must explore the dungeons within the tome that are associated with each of the four knights so that all souls in the tome can be freed from the demon's influence. The game is a first person dungeon crawler where you make your way through a bizarre world, fighting strange enemies and progressing through different dungeons. Unfortunately, this game does not have an English translation and I wasn't able to play it. It definitely looks like it's worth a go though. Mario 19 refers to a spooky video that was uploaded on YouTube titled Mario 19, Martin and Mario's Wonderful Adventures in 2022. The channel it was uploaded by, Vibing Leaf, looks to be a creepypasta channel, posting fake gameplay of fake EXE games, and this video is just some of his regular content. The video shows someone playing Mario on an NES emulator that appears to be haunted. The game plays normally until the player meets a strange entity that has been transported into a strange world. The strange world is essentially a surreal Mario Maker level that was made to be impossible to beat. Throughout the world, the player meets the entity a few more times until Mario dies or something. I don't know, I, I can't read Japanese. I did it. I did the unthinkable. I'm talking about a game that's not in the iceberg. I know, right? C crazy. This game was actually made by one of you, one of the brothers. The game was made by Starion Invictus, and I was asked to play it quite a while ago, but um, I kind of forgot about it. But don't worry, I, I always, always deliver. 
eventually. Fleshless is a puzzle exploration game where you control a skeleton as they explore a liminal, surreal world. One day, the skeleton decides to wake up from his grave to uh, explore. I don't know, he might be in the afterlife or, or something. The game has a few hidden areas and secrets, and the overall gameplay is not too long. I really appreciate the effort that was put into the game. It has a great atmosphere, and the level design is really well done. Good work, my brother. I am very proud of you. That was it for the fifth tier, and we are now onto tier six, my friend. From here on out, the amount of entries per tier will dwindle, as it would with any other iceberg. That doesn't mean there's less content to cover, however. It's very much a addition by subtraction. The games in these next tiers get very nutty. 7864 is a game that I think was made by a Japanese person. I don't know, just read the synopsis for the game. Frying pan, Duggo beaches, in car trouble, repeating. Make sure to fix problem, not again. Time Lord, help your quest attempt to make world fun place. What the fuck does any of that mean? I managed to find a download for the game on the developer's website and also hosts a large number of equally strange games that I will probably come back to one day. The game follows a frying pan named Doug that crashes his convertible while outrunning some bill collectors. Doug crashes the car and fucking dies, but is given another chance at life by a genie. Doug then walks around the city getting money and talking to people. I don't really know because I skipped all the dialogue. Who and why someone would make this game, I don't really know. Dilemma of the Drill-Faced Goddess is an RPG maker game from 2018 made by Hexatona. This game is a visual novel heavily inspired by H.P. Lovecraft, a guy that has a cat with a very funny name. Like with a lot of RPG Maker games, I couldn't really get this one to work, but the RPG Maker page has quite a long outline of the story. The game revolves around the exploration of an otherworldly place, inspired by Lovecraft's nameless city where the player makes choices that affect the outcome of the game. It has a really cool and unique art style. I really wish I could get it working without downloading a bunch of RPG Maker files. Find Me A Good One is a short platformer made by Haytham Anaza and Andy Wallace in 2015 for their design and technology thesis. In the game, you play as a girl as she jumps around and does stuff. I wasn't really sure what she was doing. I think your brother or someone is sleeping and you gotta go into their dream and uh, send these fly things over to them. The flies might represent dreams or nightmares or something but I'm not not sure. While very short it's quite good for what it is. Where They Cremate the Roadkill is a game made by the Gunseed Collab and John Clowder, the same guy that made both Gingiva and Middens, two games that were featured on this iceberg. This game is surrealism personified, just fucking look at this. It plays like an RPG, where you play as a weird worm guy in a suit named Cooley as he explores a surreal world. The game describes him as a jobless pleb who has recently stopped taking their pills. Uh oh. The first time we see him, he game ends himself, only to be sent back to Earth by God. Cooley then goes on a journey to bury the remains of his roommate. On his journey, he meets M, who is the wielder of the Devil Tarot card. M convinces Cooley that it's a good idea to go commit mass genocide in order to exact revenge on people that have wronged him in his past lives. It's later revealed that Cooley had previously lived two lives, and we get to experience them in flashbacks throughout the game. The game has a really good story that is only exemplified by its great audio, music, and visuals. This game is about 10 hours long, and was made using RPG Maker, a very limiting engine. It's so high quality for an RPG Maker game, and there's so much content. This game is a masterpiece of graphic design and needs a lot more attention. 
Ghost 94 is a stealth exploration game made in 2014 by a person with a name I really don't want to say. It's a 3D stealth game that takes place in a massive dystopian Japanese city that's patrolled by ninja-like soldiers and heavily armed robots. There's a lot that's fairly unique about the game, with the most obvious being its look. It looks really good, with a late 90s inspired combination of 2D sprites walking around low poly 3D worlds, but it's used in a way that wouldn't have been possible on the PlayStation or the Saturn, creating some gigantic areas and creating a real sense of scale. Void Pyramid is an RPG made by Willy Electrics in 2016. This game has a really cool setting, which is an Egyptian empire in space. It takes place far in the future, where a giant mechanical pharaoh currently rules the wastelands of Earth, and those that oppose him are exiled to the Void Pyramid, an outer space prison populated by criminals and mutants. The main goal of the game is to escape this space prison, a task that has never been done before. The atmosphere in this game is really well put together, and the unique setting is put into place perfectly. The real appeal of the game is its quirky flavour found in the text of item descriptions, object interactions, and dialogue. Every bit of text in this game is goofy and wacky. <laughs> Disillusion is a first-person dungeon crawling RPG made by Disillusion Dev in 2021. The best way to describe this game is, what if LSD emulator was a dungeon crawler with combat? In the game, you wake up with no memories in a strange tower filled with odd creatures. All you have is an urge to climb it. The gameplay revolves around climbing up the tower, fighting and interacting with characters, all while trying to find out why you're there and what the purpose of the tower is. Aesthetically, the developer really achieved what he was going for. The visuals and atmosphere in the game are easily on par with LSD Dream Emulator. Frog Days is a first-person point-and-click exploration game that has been in development since 2017. All I could find on this game was a short gameplay video, which you're seeing now, and a description of the game online. The year is 1995. Computer technology is advancing at a rapid pace, and the demand for personal computers has never been higher. Leading computers into the living spaces of millions is Flaming OS, the latest version of the number one graphical user interface that both business and home users choose as their computer's operating system. Even your computer is running Flaming OS. However, your computer is special. Mysterious functionality allows you to explore virtual worlds hidden within the operating system and within each world you find. Every new piece of data you discover, there lies clues to one of the best kept secrets of humankind. That's right, an ancient alien conspiracy. February 2003 is an RPG Maker game collection made by five different developers in 2003. The game revolves around a ghost that receives a mysterious calendar in the mail. The calendar is for the month of February in 2015. After hanging it on the wall, the ghost gets sucked into the calendar. The calendar is a collection of games made by five different developers in the month of February 2015. For this month, the five developers had to make a new game every single day based on a prompt. In the calendar, you can visit each day of the month and play each game made by the different developers on that day. The game also contains a museum that you can visit. After completing a game, it gets added to the museum where you can look at it. I ended up playing this game for quite a bit. It's quite the masterpiece and I'm pretty glad that I found it. I've only really played about half of the games in the collection. I do see myself coming back to play the others. The Uncle Who Works For Nintendo is an online visual novel created by Michael Lutz in 2014. The game is based around that thing that happened when you were a kid, and you would have that one friend who would say that my dad or my uncle works for Nintendo and I can get a Wii before it even comes out. I saw this quite a lot as a kid. The game is set in the 90s and follows a child and their best friend who has a mysterious uncle said to be an employee of Nintendo. Yeah, fucking right. The child sleeps over at the friend's house to play some N64, only to find out that there's something off about his friend's uncle. After completing the five different endings and working out the story, it turns out the uncle is some sort of eldritch being, and your friend lures kids into his house for the uncle to feed on them. I completely forgot about this game until right now. I remember watching YouTubers play it back in the day. I, uh, I honestly thought this game was some sort of dream I had as a kid. 
Vidiot game is another game made by the same people behind that weird frying pan game from before. I got a warning when downloading this game that it may cause brain damage. I'd say that a good 70% of the games on this iceberg have already damaged the functionality of my brain, so I don't think I'm too afraid of this warning. The game follows the same frying pan guy from the other game. Apparently his name is Doug Beach. You play as Doug as he talks to random people and completes very short mini games tied together with a very loose story. Also the genie guy is in this game. This game is a lot better than the other one and I really do like the art style. Them thick outlines be looking, looking good. Oh yeah, and uh, the warning. The warning was right. This game did add to the damaging of my cerebrum. Death of the Agnob is another game made by Jake Clover. In The Death of Agnob, you play as a janitor guy with a massive nose on an alien planet. He leaves his job of cleaning up piss in a bar bathroom to go pick up a shotgun and go on a killing spree. I wasn't able to get to the Agnob though. I fucking sucked at this game. The game has such good art and the ambience and horrific death sounds make the atmosphere really eerie and mysterious. I swear I swear that Jake Clover is the Leonardo da Vinci of our time. Dungeon Exit is a really short game made by Adam Dickinson with help from the Catamites, a developer that has shown up so many times. This game was made for Illudum Dare, where the theme was Escape. The game follows a knight at the end of his journey in a dungeon. The game tells you to escape the dungeon by pressing Z to jump, but when you press Z, you get teleported through the floor, and pressing Z only sends you deeper into it. After spamming the Z button for a few minutes, the game ends and you get jump scared by some skeletons. Yeah, that's, uh, that's about it. Hair Razor is a game made in 1984 from the UK that was made by Hairsoft and was released in two separate parts, a prelude and a finale. When the game came out, the players that managed to solve the prelude would then have to buy the finale, where they could then enter a competition to locate the prize, a bejeweled 18 carat golden hair pendant that was also featured on the cover of the game. The prize was worth around £30,000 and would be given to the player that could find the hidden location in the real world. The gameplay of the game is quite simple, the only interaction is pressing the cursor key to follow the hair, which moves across the screen and disappears to one side, riveting. Survive the Desert is another game made by Adam Dickinson for Illudum Dare in 2011. The game is, um, I don't know, I couldn't play it, it's, it's a flash game. The Midnight Station is a surreal RPG made in 2014 by Studio Ajin. The game is a bizarre mess of oddities that were made with the visual aesthetics of the ZX Spectrum PC as an inspiration. This game is surprisingly big and has a ton of content and a ton of lore to discover. The story of the game takes place after the nuclear apocalypse leading to the extinction of mankind. After the nuke, some sort of god guy collected a few human souls to add into his collection. This collection is a bizarre nightmare of surreal landscapes and is referred to as the Midnight Station. The main plot of the game involves exploring said station and finding a way to escape. A Surreal Climb is a short game made by Leon Tanlum in 2020. The game follows a guy that is stuck in a hole and decides to climb a ladder in order to escape. As you climb higher up the ladder, the background starts to get goofy and surreal. What happens when you get to the top? Well, I, I don't know. When you get to the second ladder, you get sent back to the beginning of the game, so we will never know. Top Banana is a platformer game made by Studio Hex for the Amiga back in 1992. The game is quite a simple platformer where the player has the goal of reaching the top of the level, traversing psychedelic and trippy looking levels. I wasn't able to play the game, but I don't think I was missing too much. It looks a bit poo poo. Even the iceberg creator said that they made the entry as a joke, and yeah, that is exactly what this game is. Also, the game's opening almost gave me an epileptic seizure. Do not look it up. 
Maze Brew is an old Japanese Macintosh adventure game made in 1993 by Maze Box Inc. I honestly could not find much information on it other than a download link for the game. It's a pretty standard first person point and click game where you click on different paths to discover new areas and interact with characters. Other than that eerie feeling produced by the empty landscapes, the game is not that surreal. It's just old. Big Bang is another game for the Archimedes PC, created sometime in the 90s. Like the last one, I could not really find much info on it. Judging by the gameplay alone, Big Bang seems to be some sort of platformer where you control a yellow clown as he walks around collecting decapitated rainbow teddy bear heads while smiling threateningly into the camera. As the game progresses, the stages get even more surreal and eerie looking, and the music switches to an ominous hum. Also, uh, just listen to the death sound. Jesus Christ. I have no idea what this game is. Is it a kid's game? Is it a horror game? Is it a shit post? It's really hard to tell. Beauty Within Its Flaws is a game about being ugly, weird, and bizarre with its visuals, controls, abilities, and possibilities. It's a top-down exploration game made by Rosden Shadow in 2017. This game is a complete mess. The controls are inverted, there's text on the screen that is completely indecipherable. Beauty Within Its Flaws is what I would call an anti-game. It really does not give a fuck. It's just doing its own thing, being whoever it wants to be. I guess you could say, uh, <laughs> this game has quite a lot of beauty to be found with within its flaws. I'm going to paint my bedroom walls with my brain. Ruda is an exploration game made in 2019 by Extinguisher Girl and is all about tripping way too hard at a party. You play as a girl as she goes to a party and plans to get home early to sleep. When offered a drink, she gulps it down. Big mistake. She had too many of the perk 30s. She participated in narcotics too much. She drank too much of the purple drink and now she tweaking as is standard for these sort of games. She walks around a bit and sees some tricks and surreal imagery. I love that what is meant to be trippy and insane in this game is pretty tame looking compared to the standard entry in this iceberg. I guess you and I have both become desensitized to this shit. Head is an experimental side scroller made by the developer Jars in 2016. In Fuckhead, you play as a man that has his head exploded as he wanders around surreal black and white areas in search for some anxiety medication, all while trying to find some moments of clarity. According to the creator, this game is meant to represent sexual frustration and boredom within a world burdened by the pounding weight of anxiety. Whatever it means, I wasn't able to play the game. I got stuck on the main menu. I pressed every button on my keyboard and clicked every inch of the screen, but I couldn't get it to start. Either the game is glitched out or these games are starting to get to me. Occludia is a short narrative game made by Dukebot in 2021. In Occludia, you play as a floating guy in a robe that sort of looks like a Grim Reaper as he completes deliveries for a local pharmacy. The player takes the requested medication to a different customer each day. Obviously, these uh, medications aren't doing very well, as when we visit the customer the next day, they're not doing so good. For example, they made this one guy hallucinate his dead mother. Also, they made this one guy uh, murder and store a body in his apartment. This game has some great music and a good atmosphere. And the town of mentally ill people you explore feels really empty and melancholy. The game is most likely a criticism on the overabundance of medication in society, with people being prescribed stuff they don't need. Before YouTube uh, deletes my channel, I'm not saying medications bad. I am not a doctor. This is not medical advice. Do not listen to me. Boring in Paradise is an unorthodox, endless runner made by Timothy Usikov in 2021. This game has two different parts, anti-pain and anti-trolley. In anti-pain, you play as a sketch of a guy running on the moon while dodging the word pain. In anti-trolley, you play as a car in a maze made up of TV static as you try and get to the end without running over pedestrians. That's 
all there is to the game. I don't think there's any hidden meanings or anything. It's just a very simple entry. Black Room is a browser-based adventure game that follows an insomniac that is trying to fall asleep using a self-guided meditation technique while aiming to visualize an entirely dark space, thereby lulling herself to sleep. She becomes lost in thought, allowing fantasy and memory to intrude into her mind. The game is meant to be a commentary on the issues of gender within gaming culture, and the developer has described the game as a feminist dungeon crawler. Although all of the sprites in the game are lifted from other games, the game manages to combine all these different assets in a way that looks pretty good, which is really hard to do. Dujana is a top-down adventure game made by a Scottish developer, Jack King Spooner, in 2017. The game follows the character Dujana, a Muslim woman in a fictional country that is under the occupation of foreign powers in a stylized, magical, yet realistic world as she tries to find out what happened to her husband and daughter. The game touches upon themes of death and explores them through the stories and people you meet as you play the game. Heroica Voodoo is a Japanese escape room adventure game from 2017 that has supposedly been in development since 1993. This is yet another anti-game with really bad controls and gameplay that does not make any sense and also insane person logic. The story follows the player as they enter into a haunted mansion in order to save a family that were in a plane crash that crash landed into the mansion and have become stuck. Yeah, see what I mean? Insane person logic. The gameplay involves solving completely brain dead puzzles in order to escape the mansion. I'm sorry, but there's there's no way this game took 24 years to make. What the fuck was the developer doing the whole time? Oh yeah, and uh, apparently all of the art in the game was drawn with a mouse. It looks beautiful. I have no idea how I meant to say this word. I usually suck it up and try my best, but this time I'm actually lost. Tism Tuzum is a short horror game made by four developers in 2021. The game has you explore an empty and rather scary office building. It starts off as a simple adventure game, trying to find keys to get to the next area. That is, until you get to a floor that is pitch black, and the game forces you to walk around like a scared little bitch with a flashlight. After reaching the end of the room, spoilers, you find a human worm thing. Spooky. This game was surprisingly polished and very well made. I know I say this a hundred times in every video, I am aware, but this game has a really cool art style and atmosphere. Also, apparently the name of the game is an actual Hebrew word. That means the removal of God in the universe at the moment of creation, I think. Not sure how it relates to the game. I wasn't really paying that much attention. Infinity is a really psychedelic puzzle game made by Barnacue in 2020. I'm really sorry, but I'm gonna say it for the 100th and second time. This game has a really cool art style. I really do apologize. I can't come up with any other words. How about very epic visuals? Truly amazing illustrations. While I have no idea about the meaning or plot of the game, its visuals, audio, and gameplay are truly unique and unlike anything else. It's a pretty simple puzzle game until more and more mechanics get added and genuine skill and attention becomes required. This game is a breath of fresh air. Most games in this iceberg will have great visuals, but the gameplay was made by a four-year-old, but this game is actually peak quality, 10 out of 10. Rupture is a fan-made spin-off of the game Off. See, see what I did there? A game that was featured long, long ago in the iceberg. The game takes place after the events of Off, where you play as a guy with boxing gloves instead of a baseball bat, as he goes on a mission to destroy a tower. The plot in this game is actually really cool. After the events of Off, the world is completely destroyed and there is nothing left, but in this game, all that stands is a tower in a void of nothingness. I don't know why, but this plot is really cool to me. This entry refers to the games made by the developer John Candy that were pretty well known back in their day, up until John deleted their Game Jolt page for some unknown reason. His games were thought to be lost for quite a while, 
but apparently the creator of this iceberg got given a folder containing all of their games. Not many people know this, however, as I found a few comments in gameplay videos and on Reddit of people saying that all of the games have been wiped off the face of the earth. Hopefully, this lets some people know that they've been found. Gala Gala is another game made by Jake Clover in 2013. The game is a platformer where you play as a little alien guy doing I, I, I don't fucking know. Uh, you do you do this. In the words of Jake Clover, sometimes I feel like a video of a game is more interesting than a game itself. So I wanted to try and make a game that is like a video of unfinished games. Yeah, that sounds about right. The stage is another project made by the developer Jack King Spooner in 2015. The game is episodic, and in each part, you play as a little clay guy on a stage. In each episode, something different and horrific will be on the stage for both you and the little clay guy to experience. This project is really cool, and some of the later episodes are made with the help of some familiar faces from the iceberg, like Kitty Horror Show and John Clowder. It all comes full circle. This project is like a surreal game cinematic universe. It's insane. This game really inspires me as a game developer. How cool would it be to do a collab with some of these developers and make a game that features all of these surreal characters and worlds that we've seen? That would be the best thing to ever happen. Just imagine it. It would be like Smash Bros, but with horrific abominations and surreal looking claymation figures. Satan's Pepper is a horror visual novel made by Ghost Wolf in 2023. In the game, you go grocery shopping, picking up some milk, chocolate, and a censored pile of something. After shopping, you take the only route back to your house through a cursed forest where you are kidnapped by a shadow figure and his dog. After awakening in the demon's realm, he forces you to eat a pepper that he has been making. Supposedly, it contains the purest form of spice. After eating the pepper, your body fills the wrath of 1000 fires. You go to drink the milk that you bought, but it's too late and you die. At least that's the ending that I got. I don't know if there's a way to live or not. I played it twice and died both times. Epic. El Sueno del La Razón. I don't know if I said that right, is a demo for an RPG maker game inspired by Yume Nikki, made in 2015. The game follows a girl named Anne that has locked herself within her room, all because she's become obsessed by her inner demons that are slowly corrupting her mind. In order to defeat these creatures, Anne meets them face to face in the world of her dreams. All Our Asians is a 3D platformer made by one of the co-creators of Anodyne in 2018. In the game, you explore the mind of your dying father and explore his life experiences and his secrets. The game is a walking simulator with really good PS1 graphics, and the environments are very surreal, yet they're designed like actual levels from a game, and the music complements all of it. According to some reviews I read for the game, its story is a bit flawed and dumb, like apparently the message of the game is that feeling empathy is wrong and it's bad to be inspired by your family's history. It's uh, it's very based. Kang Fu is a platformer made for the Amiga in 1996 and is the first and only title from Studio Great Effects development that does not surprise me in the slightest. Kang Fu is a platformer where you play as a funny animal from a funny country, a kangaroo named Klont. Klont is tasked with collecting other kangaroos, defeating enemies and collecting other shit while finding the exit to the next level. The game has quite a bit of depth, with the player being able to use weapons such as egg bombs, boomerangs, boxing gloves, and guns to defeat enemies. This game is Kangaroo Jack if it was good. Auto Cannibalism is a short game made in 2010 by Tistag where, you guessed it, you eat yourself. You play as a tribesman that is tasked with finding some food to eat in a cave. After going in the cave, you eat a snake and you die from its toxins. You then respawn at the start and go back into the cave and find your body. After approaching your body, the player devours it like the hungry boy that he is and returns to the village. The village thanks you for becoming fat and then they eat you. After eating you, all of the villagers die for some reason. 
Oh, and also your death noise is the sound of monkeys screaming in pain. Dawn Dusk Dream Sewer is a short narrative game made in 2019 by two Brazilian developers. In the game, you play as what is apparently a meat sack that has a soul attached to it, as it descends deeper and deeper into a sewer system that is filled with pilgrims and individuals that sing the praises of the system, whatever that is supposed to mean. I'm not sure if this game has any meaning to it, but if it does, I, I don't know what it is. Ace Phallic is a first person horror game made by Death or Gone in 2020. The game has you explore the collapsing mind of a person that is attempting to escape from reality. The game is split into three different parts, education, contamination, and reincarnation, and lets the player explore quite the variety of surreal landscapes as you make your way through each section. The game has a ton of very effective imagery and audio, and truly encapsulates what a mental breakdown looks and feels like perfectly. Carpo Bomb is a really cool arcade game made for a Ludum Dare in 2022 by Disorder. In the game, you take control of this little drone that moves side to side. The goal is to pick up eggs, put them in a tube, for them to hatch into people, and then bounce the people back into the tube so that this creepy guy at the top can eat them. Gee, I, I wonder I wonder why this game is on the iceberg. That's that's crazy. ASA Pistol Show is an RPG Maker adventure game made in 2008 by Perun, the same person that made Rekindle, an entry from early in the iceberg. The game follows a gay hitman named Hart that is betrayed by his ex-lover, and in order to get revenge, Hart and his trustful companion, Pistol, abandon the hitman organization, with three of the best assassins following in their footsteps. The game was made with a strong influence of Japanese art house movies, as well as kabuki theatre. Aside from the game's exploration, it also features few puzzles and some boss battles. The game was only translated to English last year, and since then has gained a bit of an audience online, and rightfully so. This game is really good. Boy do I love downloading suspicious exe files from such trusted websites such as Mediafire and opening them up despite the warning from Windows Antivirus or for the sake of this video. I couldn't find any info on this game, all I got was the download link on the iceberg. In Botulism, you play as a fat black guy running around shooting other black guys and jumping over gaps in order to get to the end of each level. Also the music sounds like my butthole. What a, what a fantastic entry to finish off this tier. Starting off the second last tier, we have Mangia, a game made for the Atari 2600 by Spectravision in 1983. In Mangia, the player controls a kid who must eat plates of pasta that is placed in front of him by his mother, who will keep on feeding him until his stomach f***ing explodes. What the fuck? This mother is insane. To prevent the player's brutal death, the player can throw the plate of pasta to a cat that occasionally pops up at the window, or to a dog that randomly walks by. If the mother sees that the kid is giving the pasta away, she will bring three times as much pasta the next time she returns. Just fuck it, just imagine that. Your kid is so full from pasta that he's resorting to feeding it to animals. So what do you do? Give him three times as much pasta. This mother needs to be needs to be taken away she needs to be locked up this is one of those games that is accidentally surreal just because of how insane the premise is punishment is a game maker game made in 2005 by mark essen the game is a platformer with the goal of being as frustrating as possible to complete the gameplay involves climbing a set of screens in tower fashion while indirect hindrances try to prevent you from doing so some of the hindrances include the screen rotating either through the level design or through hitting eyeballs seen on the certain levels and icons which reverse the left and right movement keys instead of being killed, the risk comes from falling downwards. Particularly in higher up levels, you could end up dropping several screens with just one mistake. This game's developer, Mark Essen, is also the guy behind Nidhogg, which is pretty insane. 
Gideon Towards God is an indie game made by Paul Stan Studio. I couldn't find a download link to the game at all, just a few videos of gameplay. It looks to be an artsy black and white point and click game with some sort of deep spiritual meaning. Not gonna lie, the, the art kind of looks like a 13 year old made it. Geosite is a Newgrounds platformer game made by the user Amon26. This game has some really nice retro graphics with a very deep and surreal story. The game revolves around these two gods of Earth. One of them becomes mad at humans for making war and pollution and all that stuff and kills everyone. The other god gets mad and puts the other god in prison and then the god that put the other god in prison gets lonely and then creates this guy to go and save the other god from prison. Yeah, uh, very, very deep. A Day in the Future is another entry from the developer Blomko, my favourite developer of all time. I didn't even know that he made this game. I just downloaded it and played it and I immediately knew that he made it, much like their other games. In A Day in the Future, you walk around a surreal place, completing wacky and goofy minigames with some amazing MS Paint graphics. All in the far future of 2020, 10 out of 10, best, best game developer of all time. Why and I is an insane sandbox game made by the developer Froofy in 2019. This game is essentially like one of those mobile Minecraft clones you played as a kid because your mum wouldn't let you buy the, the real deal. I honestly had no idea what any of the shit on the screen meant. It was all just nonsense. The only thing you can do in the game is break blocks, pick them up and place them. Also the game runs at like 10 frames per second. Good good shit. Fuck. Be beautiful game. Glog Willet is another batshit crazy game made by Jake Clover in 2016. This guy sure is appearing quite a bit in these lower tiers and honestly it's very deserving. The game is another side scroller where you control a weird alien guy, explore a wacky and goofy world, and slaughter hordes of people. The game is split into two different parts, each not really containing a story, just some very loose direction. Just like the last two games on the iceberg made by the same dude. This game has a super off-putting and eerie atmosphere with some loud industrial sound effects and music. Chamber of Stars is an adventure rhythm game made by Eric in 2021. It's the sequel to a game from earlier in the iceberg called The Endless Empty. In Chamber of Stars, you play as a guitarist and songwriter named Star as they receive an invitation to perform at a show as a guest of honor. As of now, the game isn't actually out yet, but there is a demo available for the first section of the game. Just like The Endless Empty, the game's art is composed of mashed together imagery and is just as surreal. The game is definitely a lot more upbeat than The Endless Empty, containing a bit of dry humour and more cheerful music. I guess any game is more upbeat than The Endless Empty. That game was about a guy dying. Pre postmodernistic post ironic daddyism dating simulator. Don't fucking ask me what that title means. Is a dating sim that takes place in space. You play as a guy in a spaceship with what I presume is space tinder. The game makes you play smash or pass with randomly generated alien creatures. After you've selected your dream alien partners, you are shown what your new baby looks like. What an epic game. Why the fuck is Sans here? Mementos Mori is a very confusing game made by Marik Kapolka in 2015. It's a browser based game where you click and view four different disturbing paintings. Each painting contains a packet of Mentos that when clicked will give you a fun Halloween fact. That's literally it. Apparently the Mentos in the game are from a promotion in 1999 called Mementos Mori. The promotion consisted of a limited edition flavour of Mentos. Printed on the inside of each wrapper of the roll of Mentos was a depressing tidbit meant to chill the very soul of the reader, just as the peppermint candy chills their taste buds. I think I get it now. It kind of makes sense. This game is great. Good, good work. Piranic Parasite is a unique walking simulator made by Mohamed Kamez in 2017. I don't really know what was happening when playing the game, 
So take my re-account with a grain of salt. Piranic Parasite is a walking simulator where you partake in the good kush and alcohol and get transported into the body of a cybernetic human. The game has you journey through the different parts of the body in order to reach enlightenment. The game has a really cool mechanic where you have to throw up some chakra signs by pressing certain keys at the same time, but so do you. Like, your hands actually end up making the sign when pressing the keys. I thought that was really cool. Lisa the Is Sane is a joke fan game made for the Lisa series that is in development by quote, a loser. That's what the Lisa wiki says. I'm not calling the guy a loser. Also, the wiki calls the game Lisa the Insane when the iceberg calls it Lisa the Is Sane. The link of the iceberg directs you to some original music from the game, and in the titles and description, the game is called Lisa the Is Sane. I'm not sure if it's a misspelling and the wiki is just correcting it, or if the game is actually called Lisa the Is Sane, and the wiki I found has nothing to do with the entry. From what I found, Lisa the Insane has a gameplay trailer and is actually real, and Lisa the Is Sane just has some original music on YouTube. I can't find a download link for either game. This entry has me so f confused. Heart of a Sephilimon is a Japanese horror game made in 1991 for the Japanese home computer, the Sharp X6 8000. According to the Iceberg creator, this game isn't lost media, but despite that I could find f all information about the game. Apparently it's a sequel to another horror game, Horror of Cridwell which is just as, if not more, obscure. According to some guy on Reddit that is working on a translation for the game, the game starts with the main character waking up in a hospital after having a dream where a woman decomposes after a ritual and sees a girl floating outside a third floor window before disappearing. Apparently the rest of the game is about a cult and explores Lovecraftian ideas. Also the game is meant to be really gory and disturbing and offensive, so there's that. I think this translates to Taradiddle, but I might be wrong. Taradiddle is a very bare bones RPG maker game made by a super awesome Eric in 2015. In the game, you play as a guy wearing cat pajamas as he walks around. Either this game has like two minutes of gameplay, or this iceberg has made me too brain dead to progress any further. When I said this game was bare bones, I meant it. No combat. No dialogue, nothing, just walk. Left up, down right, just walking. I've got no idea what this game is meant to be. Garfield's Armageddon Prophecy is a first person RPG maker game where you play as who I think is John as he's trapped and tormented by his fat, lazy, funny orange cat Garfield. The game has you walk around an eerie and strange maze of dungeons picking up Garfield comic panels and solving puzzles to escape. Also, Odie is there. After exploring for a bit, you put your comic panels into a statue and you get released from the maze, I think. I wasn't too sure what was happening. Garfield kept talking like a philosophy professor. Ugetsu Kitan is another obscure Japanese horror game that was made for the PS1 in 1996. The game seems to be a point and click adventure game where according to a description I found, a young girl guides the player from a busy street to a tent containing a labyrinth occupied by Japanese mythical creatures in which the player experiences several stories based on the Ugetsu Monogatari with vignettes from the original scenario in between. The game apparently follows an old book called Agetsu Monogatari, a collection of nine supernatural tales by the Japanese author Ueda Akanadi. Due to its age and the hardware it was made for, some of the visuals in the game are a lot more disturbing than they should be. Better Dead Ratification is a super obscure Japanese adventure game made for Windows in 1995 by Art Sector 1. The game is a first-person point-and-click adventure game 
that utilizes early 90s CGI and FMV. The game has the player situated in a bar where they can click on different objects in order to chat with characters. The player is able to converse back, being able to select from several dialogue options. What these options are, I do not know. I do not speak anime. Depending on what options you select, you end up fucking dying, so you, you, you gotta be careful. Super Spray and Slay 3D is a first person dungeon crawler shooter made by developers Eric and Allen in 2020. In the game, you play as a hotel maid that has been sent to the room 666 to clean up some germs. Turns out that these germs are actually demons from hell. After killing, I mean cleaning a few of them, you get sent to the hell that they came from. The game has you make your way through six different levels, taking out all of the germs in each, finding keys to progress. After completing these levels, you find a final boss, a giant eyeball germ thing that may or may not be the devil himself. After obliterating him with your cleaning spray, you get sent back to earth. What a, what a banger of a game. Tetric the Tetris clone, as you can probably guess, made for MS-DOS in 2020 by Fadri. It's described as an MS-DOS basic Tetris game whose special appeal is that the pieces are made of the screaming flesh of damned souls. I couldn't get the game to work in my browser, but the game sounded so cool that I taught myself how to use DOSBox so that I could play it. Was it worth it? No. I was expecting the Tetris pieces to be screaming in agony and writhing around in pain as you place them, but no. It's just a reskin of Tetris. Cringe. Word Image Sound Play is a Japanese PS2 game from 2004, and I use the term game very loosely. It's more of an interactive music video. The game is split into several different sections, with each one containing, well, words, images, and sounds but not any play. I have no fucking idea what this game is or why it was made. It reminds me of those toddler sensory activation videos on YouTube, but Japanese and live action. Zoku Sagadi Ijidi is a Japanese PS2 puzzle game released in 2002 by Enix Corporation. Enix, not Square Enix. This game perfectly represents Japanese comedy. The game, the game is fucking insane. It's completely nuts. It's absolutely bonkers. In Zoku, you play as a CGI guy with an arrow on his head as he walks around a surreal Japanese hellscape littered with insane characters and piles of low polygon feces. Do not ask me to elaborate on that. I don't think that I have the brain capacity to. We did it. We actually did it. We made it to the last tier. Finally. Good god, man. It's only, it's only taken me a year to do. I honestly did not think I would make it this far. And to be fair, I have no idea why I have. Some of these games have been amazing. This iceberg contains some of my favorite games of all time, and some have affected my capability of thinking. I have actually gained a decrease in mental capacity from explaining some of these entries. The games in this last tier, as you can probably guess, will fall into the latter category. These some goofy games, man. Auto-generated bitsies refers to the collection of games that have been created using a Python program by Adam Ledox. The program is called Bitsy and is designed to generate a retro-style narrative game. Essentially, what this program does is automatically generate surreal RPG Maker games. Obviously, I had to make one of these. I downloaded the tool and put in a few keywords like Kappa Dance, Surreal, Internet, Toilet. I uploaded the text files and uh yeah it, it pretty much looks like any other game on the iceberg it's like if an rpg maker game had procedural generation and the dialogue was created with mad libs there's not much to it just some random rooms and dialogue but it's still pretty cool Produce is another obscure Japanese horror game that was made in 1987 for the PC 8800 by DBSoft. The game is a disturbing dungeon crawler that follows four psychic teenagers, Gilbert, Toshio, Tina, and Sayaka. The story follows the teenagers on vacation, and it turns out that Toshio has a crush on Sayaka, but Sayaka instead has a thing for Gilbert. 
He's unable to deal with this hatred and jealousy when an unusual opportunity presents itself. An abandoned house calls out to Toshio and requests that he deliver his friends to the top floor of the building. Upon completing this task, the eldritch being within will eliminate Gilbert so Toshio can have Sayaka all to himself. In the game, you control Toshio, using his psychic powers to strike fear into his friends by making illusions of monsters appear. This is all done in a way to get the teens to go upstairs and prevent them from getting to the exit. The gameplay is equally interesting as the story is. It's more of a strategy game than it is a dungeon crawler, allowing you to strategically place eldritch monsters in the way of your friends from a top-down view. Oh, and the, the game has some pretty gross body horror. Also, the game has nudity. That's right, a game featuring teenagers has nudity. Oh, Japan, you're, you're so silly and wacky. Psyche E is another entry from the developer Jars, the same guy behind the game, Head. It's another point and click adventure game made in 2014 with some pretty cool hand drawn art. In Psyche E, you play as a guy with neither a cock or balls as he explores a bizarre and surreal world with his ego following him. The game has you go from character to character, interacting and talking to them. I didn't get the meaning behind the game. I mean, there's a lot of stuff about the body. For example, at one, one point, you go inside of a woman's pee pee hole and also the player's inventory is a ball sack, like he, he just opens up his ball sack and stores his items in there. This iceberg never ceases to amaze me. Uzumaki is a strange Japanese RPG maker game from 2015 with very little information on it available online. The download that I got for the game was linked on the iceberg and was a bit broken. I think the game had a few missing assets and there was no text. But then again, the game is in Japanese, so I don't think the addition of text would have helped me much. The game follows a young girl as she's awoken during the night. After leaving her room to investigate, a door in the hallway appears that transports her into a strange world with a lizard guy. The world is littered with traffic signs and these little guys that run around. The game is really confusing so i didn't get too far whenever you run into an enemy they trap you in a prison of traffic signs and the only way to get out is to reopen the game and start from the beginning same thing with this bus i got hit by a bus and was trapped in this spooky bedroom maybe the girl's parents were killed in a car accident or something and the whole thing is just a nightmare i have no clue this entry refers to the many insane games made by the developer Jansky. Most of the games that they make are side-scrollers that are made with a ton of stolen assets. Their games bring up a few questions on fair use and copyright. The developer compares the theft of game art and characters with how MF Doom uses samples in his music, which is honestly a kind of fair comparison. Despite the issues of fair use, you really have to commend them on making solid games with such a large amount of clashing assets. There's been a few games on the iceberg that do the same, but none of them feel complete as their own game. It's a really impressive thing to do, and their games are definitely worth checking out. This game gave me a brain tumor. The Jingol is an RPG maker game from 2020 about some guy that kind of reminds me of Wayne in Hilux 1. He's got a similar walk cycle. You know when you get those black floating circle things in your eyes and you look around and they sort of lag about? That's what this game reminds me of. I couldn't really get that far into it as the first combat encounter crashes my game, but from what I did see, I don't think I'm missing out on much. This entry refers to the Tumblr blog made in 2015 called KLM or Kameda Love Mail. It's run by a large consistently shifting number of mods that all go by the name Nagato Kameda and they all live together in a house that they call Two Bed Two Bath. Originating as a positivity blog to send love mail to people, it has long since evolved into something else completely, being a place for mods to post about any variety of things, including random thoughts, day-to-day -day happenings, stories, and art. 
As you may guess, some of this art is in the form of surreal games. The one that was linked on this iceberg was Clown Cafe, so that's what I played. It's a visual novel where you play as Mod Commander 1862. It's really short and has a ton of in-depth lore about the Tumblr blog and the house that all the mods live in, but it really didn't make much sense to me. This entry refers to the lost unfinished game that was going to be made for a five-part multimedia art movie, Cream Master Cycle. The Cream Master Cycle is a super strange and artsy five-part movie that was made from 1994 to 2002 by Matthew Barney. The cycle includes the films as well as photographs, drawings, sculptures, and installations in conjunction with each episode. The whole art project is based around the male cream master muscle, a muscle in the ball sack that makes them shrink and grow in response to the temperature. I'm sorry, but why and how the f do you make a seven hour long movie about a muscle in the ball sack? The only evidence of this game existing is a really short promo on YouTube uploaded in 2017 that shows a few seconds of gameplay. I have to play this game. I need to know how you make a game from a movie that's about a ball sack muscle. Also, no matter what you do, please do not find this promo and go to the uploader's channel. Just don't trust me, you, you're gonna be mentally scarred. We... we did it. We actually did it. Finally, <laughs> we made it to the last entry in the iceberg. We've come very, very far. Unless, you know, you just skipped ahead. But anyway, we're, we're finally here. The last entry on the iceberg is Space Spy. Space Spy is a very obscure and surreal game made by Fasili Zatov in 2009. This game is quite special. It's easily the worst game I have ever played and definitely takes the title of the most surreal game of all time. As of writing this script, it's currently summer here in Australia and it's about 38 degrees in my dorm right now. I am dripping with sweat and dying of heat stroke. I have no fan, no air conditioning. You have no idea how much willpower it took for me to beat this game from start to finish. Space by I think is a puzzle game that's split up into six different levels. They follow a mentally ill man that crawls out of the sewers in order to sneak into a red carpet event that he's not invited to. After getting caught sneaking into the event, he gets sent to an insane asylum. After escaping the asylum, he then hijacks a plane and missile strikes the apartment building of the judge that sentenced him to the asylum. At least, that's what I think happens in the game. The majority of the story is shown through the text dumps that appear at the start of each level. Along with these text dumps, the game gives you step-by-step -step instructions on how to beat each level, and trust me, reading the instructions are very necessary. The puzzles in this game make no fucking sense at all. For example, in the mission where you sneak into the red carpet event, you think you would have to, I don't know, sneak past some cameras and guards or something? No, you have to interact with this telescope that calls down an alien bug from outer space that gives you the power of hypnosis. You then have to hypnotize the policeman so that you can get past them. Once past him, you then have to push a ramp over to a police booth, which is when you unlock the keys to a bulldozer. Then you need to drive the bulldozer up the ramp, destroying the police booth and killing whoever is inside. Then you must collect the police suit from the guard's corpse, and only then can you enter the red carpet event. This was one of the easier levels. I really cannot tell if this game is a joke or not. The walls of text read like they were written by an insane man. Looking at the developer's Twitter, this theory holds up. All of their other projects are very similar in nature to this one. Maybe it's just an art thing. It's just the way he expresses himself. I don't know what it is, but it's pretty epic. No fucking way. You actually did it. You just watched five hours of a mentally insane person talking about games. You, uh, you deserve a medal. If you actually made it to the end and didn't skip to this part, I want to personally thank you from the bottom of my heart. It means a lot. There is no way in hell that I would have finished this series without all the support from you guys. It really means so much to me. 
thank you. Also, an additional thank you to my Patreon members. I have no idea why you do it, but thank you so much for supporting me. Thank you, Mrs. Mayo, Gage Mendon, Too Funny Too Cool, and Bunny Walk. Love you. Hey, uh, you know what's cooler than a 400 entry iceberg? A 5,000 entry iceberg. That's right, I'm gonna be covering the entire internet iceberg. I want to die.